Chapter 23 Barbarossa The Turn of Russia While Hitler was busy that summer of 1940 directing the conquest of the West, Stalin was taking advantage of the Fuhrer's preoccupations by moving into the Baltic states and reaching down into the Balkans. On the surface all was friendly between the two great dictatorships. Molotov, acting for Stalin, lost no opportunity to praise and flatter the Germans on every occasion of a new act of aggression or a fresh conquest. When Germany invaded Norway and Denmark on April 9, 1940, the Soviet foreign commissar hastened to tell Ambassador von der Schulenburg in Moscow that very morning that the Soviet government understood the measures which were forced on Germany. We wish Germany, said Molotov, complete success in her defensive measures. A month later, when the German ambassador called on Molotov to inform him officially of the Wehrmacht's attack in the West, which Ribbentrop had instructed his envoy to explain, was forced upon Germany by the impending Anglo-French push on the Ruhr by way of Belgium and Holland, the Soviet statesman again expressed his pleasure. Molotov received the communication in an understanding spirit, Schulenberg wired Berlin, and added that he realized that Germany must protect herself against Anglo-French attack. He had no doubt of our success. On June 17th, the day France asked for an armistice, Molotov summoned Schulenberg to his office and expressed the warmest congratulations of the Soviet government on the splendid success of the German Wehrmacht. The foreign commissar had something else to say, and this did not sound quite so pleasant in German ears. He informed the German envoy, as the latter wired Berlin most urgent, of the Soviet action against the Baltic states, adding, and one can almost see the gleam in Molotov's eyes, that it had become necessary to put an end to all the intrigues by which England and France had tried to sow discord and mistrust between Germany and the Soviet Union in the Baltic states. To put an end to such discord, the Soviet government, Molotov added, had dispatched special emissaries to the three Baltic countries. They were, in fact, three of Stalin's best hatchet men. Dekanazov, who was sent to Lithuania, Vyshinsky to Latvia, Zhdanov to Estonia. They carried out their assignments with the thoroughness which one would expect from this trio, especially the latter two individuals. Already on June 14th, the day German troops entered Paris, the Soviet government had sent a nine-hour ultimatum to Lithuania demanding the resignation of its government, the arrest of some of its key officials, and the right to send in as many Red Army troops as it pleased. Though the Lithuanian government accepted the ultimatum, Moscow deemed its acceptance unsatisfactory. And the next day, June 15th, Soviet troops occupied the country, the only one of the Baltic states to border on Germany. During the next couple of days, similar Soviet ultimatums were dispatched to Latvia and Estonia, after which they were similarly overrun by the Red Army. Stalin could be as crude and as ruthless in these matters as Hitler, and even more cynical. The press having been suppressed, the political leaders arrested and all parties but the Communists declared illegal, elections were staged by the Russians in all three countries on July 14th, and after the respective parliaments thus elected had voted for the incorporation of their lands into the Soviet Union, the Supreme Soviet Parliament of Russia admitted them into the motherland, Lithuania on August 3rd, Latvia on August 5th, Estonia on August 6th. Adolf Hitler was humiliated, but, busy as he was trying to organize the invasion of Britain, could do nothing about it. The letters from the envoys of the three Baltic states in Berlin protesting Russian aggression were returned to them by order of Ribbentrop. To further humble the Germans, Molotov brusquely told them on August 11th to liquidate their legations in Kaunas, Riga, and Tallinn within a fortnight, and close down their Baltic consulates by September 1st. The seizure of the Baltic states did not satisfy Stalin's appetite. The surprisingly quick collapse of the Anglo-French armies spurred him on to get as much as he could while the getting was good. He obviously thought there was little time to lose. On June 23rd, the day after the French formally capitulated and signed the armistice at Compiègne, Molotov again called in the Nazi ambassador in Moscow and told him that the solution of the Bessarabian question brooked no further delay. The Soviet government was determined to use force should the Romanian government decline a peaceful agreement. It expected Germany, Molotov added, not to hinder but to support the Soviets in their action. Moreover, 
The Soviet claim likewise extended to Bukovina. Bessarabia had been taken by Romania from Russia at the end of the First World War, but Bukovina had never belonged to it, having been under Austria until Romania grabbed it in 1919. At the negotiations in Moscow for the Nazi-Soviet pact, Ribbentrop, as he now reminded Hitler, who had questioned him about it, had been forced to give Bessarabia to the Russian sphere of interest, but he had never given away Bukovina. There was some alarm in Berlin, which spread to OKW headquarters in the West. The Wehrmacht was desperately dependent on Romanian oil, and Germany needed the foodstuffs and fodder it also got from this Balkan country. These would be lost if the Red Army occupied Romania. Some time back, on May 23rd, at the height of the Battle of France, the Romanian general staff had sent an SOS to OKW, informing it that Soviet troops were concentrating on the border. Yodel summed up the reaction at Hitler's headquarters in his diary the next day. Situation in East becomes threatening because of Russian concentration of force against Bessarabia. On the night of June 26th, Russia delivered an ultimatum to Romania demanding the ceding to it of Bessarabia and northern Bukovina, and insisting on a reply the next day. Ribbentrop, in panic, dashed off instructions from his special train to his minister in Bucharest, telling him to advise the Romanian government to yield, which it did on June 27th. Soviet troops marched into the newly acquired territories the next day, and Berlin breathed a sigh of relief that at least the rich sources of oil and food had not been cut off by Russia's grabbing the whole of Romania. It is clear from his acts and from the secret German papers that though Stalin was out to get all he could in Eastern Europe while the Germans were tied down in the West, he did not wish or contemplate a break with Hitler. Toward the end of June, Churchill had tried to warn Stalin in a personal letter of the danger of the German conquests to Russia as well as to Britain. The Soviet dictator did not bother to answer. Probably, like almost everyone else, he thought Britain was finished. So he tattled to the Germans what the British government was up to. Sir Stafford Cripps, a left-wing Labour Party leader whom the Prime Minister had rushed to Moscow as the new British ambassador in the hope of striking a more responsive chord among the Bolsheviks, a forlorn hope, as he later ruefully admitted, was received by Stalin early in July in an interview that Churchill described as formal and frigid. On July 13th, Molotov, on Stalin's instructions, handed the German ambassador a written memorandum of this confidential conversation. It is an interesting document. It reveals, as no other source does, the severe limitations of the Soviet dictator in his cold calculations of foreign affairs. Schulenberg sped it to Berlin most urgent, and of course secret, and Ribbentrop was so grateful for its contents that he told the Soviet government he greatly appreciated this information. Cripps had pressed Stalin, the memorandum said, for his attitude on this principal question, among others. The British government was convinced that Germany was striving for hegemony in Europe. This was dangerous to the Soviet Union as well as England. Therefore, both countries ought to agree on a common policy of self-protection against Germany and on the re-establishment of the European balance of power. Stalin's answers are given as follows. He did not see any danger of the hegemony of any one country in Europe, and still less any danger that Europe might be engulfed by Germany. Stalin observed the policy of Germany and knew several leading German statesmen well. He had not discovered any desire on their part to engulf European countries. Stalin was not of the opinion that German military successes menaced the Soviet Union and her friendly relations with Germany. Such staggering smugness, such abysmal ignorance, leave one breathless. The Russian tyrant did not know, of course, the secrets of Hitler's turgid mind, but the Fuhrer's past behavior, his known ambitions, and the unexpectedly rapid Nazi conquests ought to have been enough to warn him of the dire danger the Soviet Union was now in but incomprehensibly they were not enough. From the captured Nazi documents and from the testimony of many leading German figures in the great drama that was being played over the vast expanse of Western Europe that year, it is plain that at the very moment of Stalin's monumental complacency, Hitler had in fact been mulling over in his mind the idea of turning on the Soviet Union and destroying her. The basic idea went back much further, at least fifteen years, to Mein Kampf. And so we National Socialists, Hitler wrote, take up where we broke off six hundred years ago, 
we stop the endless German movement toward the south and west of Europe and turn our gaze toward the lands of the east. When we speak of new territory in Europe today, we must think principally of Russia and her border vassal states. Destiny itself seems to wish to point out the way to us here. This colossal empire in the east is ripe for dissolution, and the end of the Jewish domination in Russia will also be the end of Russia as a state. This idea lay like bedrock in Hitler's mind, and his pact with Stalin had not changed it at all, but merely postponed acting on it. And, but briefly, in fact, less than two months after the deal was signed and had been utilized to destroy Poland, the Fuhrer instructed the army that the conquered Polish territory was to be regarded as an assembly area for future German operations. The date was October 18, 1939, and Halder recorded it that day in his diary. Five weeks later, on November 23rd, when he harangued his reluctant generals about attacking in the West, Russia was by no means out of his mind. We can oppose Russia, he declared, only when we are free in the West. At that time, the two-front war, the nightmare of German generals for a century, was very much on Hitler's mind, and he spoke of it at length on this occasion. He would not repeat the mistake of former German rulers. He would continue to see to it that the army had one front at a time. It was only natural, then, that with the fall of France, the chasing of the British army across the Channel, and the prospects of Britain's imminent collapse, Hitler's thoughts should turn once again to Russia. For he now supposed himself to be free in the West, and thereby to have achieved the one condition he had laid down in order to be in a position to oppose Russia. The rapidity with which Stalin seized the Baltic states and the two Romanian provinces in June spurred Hitler to a decision. The moment of its making can now be traced. Yodel says that the fundamental decision was taken as far back as during the Western Campaign. Colonel Walter Varlamont, Yodel's deputy at OKW, remembers that on July 29th Yodel announced at a meeting of operations staff officers that Hitler intended to attack the USSR in the spring of 1941. Sometime previous to this meeting, Yodel related, Hitler had told Keitel that he intended to launch the attack against the USSR during the fall of 1940. But this was too much even for Keitel, and he had argued Hitler out of it by contending that not only the bad weather in the autumn, but the difficulties of transferring the bulk of the army from the west to the east made it impossible. By the time of this conference on July 29th, Varlamont relates, the date for the intended attack against Russia had been moved back to the spring of 1941. Only a week before, we know from Halder's diary, the Fuhrer had still held to a possible campaign in Russia for the autumn, if Britain were not invaded. At a military conference in Berlin on July 21st, he told Brauchitsch to get busy on the preparations for it that the army commander-in-chief and his general staff already had given the problem some thought, but not enough thought, is evident from his response to Hitler. Braukic told the leader that the campaign would last four to six weeks, and that the aim would be to defeat the Russian army, or at least to occupy enough Russian territory, so that Soviet bombers could not reach Berlin or the Silesian industrial area, while, on the other hand, the Luftwaffe bombers could reach all important objectives in the Soviet Union. Braukic thought that from 80 to 100 German divisions could do the job. He assessed Russian strength as 50 to 75 good divisions. Holder's notes on what Braukic told him of the meeting show that Hitler had been stung by Stalin's grabs in the East, that he thought the Soviet dictator was coquetting with England in order to encourage her to hold out, but that he had seen no signs that Russia was preparing to enter the war against Germany. At a further conference at the Berghof, on the last day of July 1940, the receding prospects of an invasion of Britain prompted Hitler to announce for the first time to his army chiefs his decision on Russia. Halder was personally present this time and jotted down his shorthand notes of exactly what the warlord said. They reveal not only that Hitler had made a definite decision to attack Russia in the following spring, but that he had already worked out in his mind the major strategic aims. Britain's hope, Hitler said, lies in Russia and America. If that hope in Russia is destroyed, then it will be destroyed for America too, because elimination of Russia will enormously increase Japan's power in the Far East. The more he thought of it, the more convinced he was, Hitler said, that Britain's stubborn determination to continue the war was due to its counting on the Soviet Union. 
Something strange, he explained, has happened in Britain. The British were already completely down. Alder uses the English word down here in the German text. Now they are back on their feet, intercepted conversations, Russia unpleasantly disturbed by the swift developments in Western Europe. Russia needs only to hint to England that she does not wish to see Germany too strong, and the English, like a drowning man, will regain hope that the situation in six to eight months will have completely changed. But if Russia is smashed, Britain's last hope will be shattered. Then Germany will be master of Europe and the Balkans. Decision. In view of these considerations, Russia must be liquidated. Spring 1941. The sooner Russia is smashed, the better. The Nazi warlord then elaborated on his strategic plans, which it was obvious to the generals had been ripening in his mind for some time, despite all his preoccupations with the fighting in the West. The operation, he said, would be worth carrying out only if its aim was to shatter the Soviet nation in one great blow. Conquering a lot of Russian territory would not be enough. Wiping out of the very power to exist of Russia, that is the goal, Hitler emphasized. There would be two initial drives, one in the south to Kiev and the Dnieper River, the second in the north up through the Baltic states and then toward Moscow. There the two armies would make a junction. After that, a special operation if necessary to secure the Baku oil fields. The very thought of such new conquests excited Hitler. He already had in mind what he would do with them. He would annex outright, he said, the Ukraine, White Russia, and the Baltic states, and extend Finland's territory to the White Sea. For the whole operation, he would allot 120 divisions, keeping 60 divisions for the defense of the West and Scandinavia. The attack, he laid it down, would begin in May 1941 and would take five months to carry through. It would be finished by winter. He would have preferred, he said, to do it this year, but this had not proved possible. The next day, August 1st, Halder went to work on the plans with his general staff. Though he would later claim to have opposed the whole idea of an attack on Russia as insane, his diary entry for this day discloses him full of enthusiasm as he applied himself to the challenging new task. Planning now went ahead with typical German thoroughness on three levels, that of the Army General Staff, of Varlamont's Operations Staff at OKW, of General Tomas's Economic and Armaments Branch of OKW. Thomas was instructed on August 14th by Goering that Hitler desired deliveries of ordered goods to the Russians only till spring of 1941. In his report on this, Thomas stresses how punctual Soviet deliveries of goods to Germany were at this time. In fact, he says, they continued to be right up to the start of the attack, and observes, not without amusement, that even during the last few days, shipments of India rubber from the Far East were completed— by the Russians, over express transit trains, presumably over the Trans-Siberian Railway. In the meantime, his office was to make a detailed survey of Soviet industry, transportation, and oil centers, both as a guide to targets and later on as an aid for administering Russia. A few days before, on August 9th, Varlamont had got out his first directive for preparing the deployment areas in the east for the jump-off against the Russians. The code name for this was Aufbau Ost, Build Up East. On August 26th, Hitler ordered ten infantry and two armored divisions to be sent from the west to Poland. The panzer units, he stipulated, were to be concentrated in southeastern Poland so that they could intervene to protect the Romanian oil fields. The transfer of large bodies of troops to the east could not be done without exciting Stalin's easily aroused suspicions if he learned of it, and the Germans went to great lengths to see that he didn't. The Germans had kept only seven divisions in Poland, two of which were transferred to the west during the spring campaign. The troops there, Halder cracked, were scarcely enough to maintain the customs service. If Stalin had attacked Germany in June 1940, the Red Army probably could have got to Berlin before any serious resistance was organized. Since some movements were bound to be detected, General Ernst Kerstring, the German military attaché in Moscow was instructed to inform the Soviet general staff that it was merely a question of replacing older men, who were being released to industry, by younger men. On September 6th, Yodel got out a directive outlining in considerable detail the means of camouflage and deception. These regroupings, he laid it down, must not create the impression in Russia that we are preparing an offensive in the East. 
so that the armed services should not rest on their laurels after the great victories of the summer, Hitler issued on November 12, 1940, a comprehensive top-secret directive outlining new military tasks all over Europe and beyond. We shall come back to some of them. What concerns us here is that portion dealing with the Soviet Union. Political discussions have been initiated with the aim of clarifying Russia's attitude for the time being. Irrespective of the results of these discussions, all preparations for the East, which have already been verbally ordered, will be continued. Instructions on this will follow as soon as the general outline of the Army's operational plans have been submitted to and approved by me. As a matter of fact, on that very day, November 12th, Molotov arrived in Berlin to continue with Hitler himself those political discussions. Molotov in Berlin Relations between Berlin and Moscow had for some months been souring. It was one thing for Stalin and Hitler to double-cross third parties, but quite another when they began to double-cross each other. Hitler had been helpless to prevent the Russians from grabbing the Baltic states and the two Romanian provinces of Bessarabia and northern Bukovina, and his frustration only added to his growing resentment. The Russian drive westward would have to be stopped, and first of all in Romania, whose oil resources were of vital importance to a Germany which, because of the British blockade, could no longer import petroleum by sea. To complicate Hitler's problem, Hungary and Bulgaria too demanded slices of Romanian territory. Hungary, in fact, as the summer of 1940 approached its end, prepared to go to war in order to win back Transylvania, which Romania had taken from her after the First World War. Such a war, Hitler realized, would cut off Germany from her main source of crude oil, and probably bring the Russians in to occupy all of Romania and rob the Reich permanently of Romanian oil. By August 28th, the situation had become so threatening that Hitler ordered five panzer and three motorized divisions, plus parachute and airborne troops, to make ready to seize the Romanian oil fields on September 1st. That same day, he conferred with Ribbentrop and Chano at the Berghof, and then dispatched them to Vienna, where they were to lay down the law to the foreign ministers of Hungary and Romania, and make them accept Axis arbitration. This mission was accomplished without much trouble after Ribbentrop had browbeaten both sides. On August 30th, at the Belvedere Palace in Vienna, the Hungarians and Romanians accepted the Axis settlement. When Mihai Manuelescu, the Romanian foreign minister, saw the map stipulating that about one half of Transylvania should go to Hungary, he fainted, falling across the table at which the signing of the agreement was taking place, and regaining consciousness only after physicians had worked over him with camphor. It cost King Karl his throne. On September 6th he abdicated in favor of his eighteen-year-old son, Mikhail, and fled with his red-haired mistress, Magda Lupescu, in a ten-car special train filled with what might be described as loot across Yugoslavia to Switzerland. General Ian Antonescu, chief of the fascist Iron Guard and a friend of Hitler, became dictator. Ostensibly for her reasonableness, but really to give Hitler a legal excuse for his further plans, Romania received from Germany and Italy a guarantee of what was left of her territory, minus southern Dobrudja, which Romania was forced to cede to Bulgaria. Light on the Fuhrer's further plans came to his intimates three weeks later. On September 20th, in a top-secret directive, Hitler ordered the sending of military missions to Romania. To the world, their tasks will be to guide friendly Romania in organizing and instructing her forces. The real tasks, which must not become apparent either to the Romanians or to our own troops, will be to protect the oil district, to prepare for deployment from Romanian bases of German and Romanian forces in case a war with Soviet Russia is forced upon us. That would take care of the southern flank of a new front he was beginning to picture in his mind. The Vienna Award, and especially the German guarantee of Romania's remaining territory, went down badly in Moscow, which had not been consulted. When Schulenberg called on Molotov on September 1st to present a windy memorandum from Ribbentrop attempting to explain and justify what had taken place in Vienna, the foreign commissar, the ambassador reported, was reserved in contrast to his usual manner. He was not too reserved, however, to lodge a strong verbal protest. 
he accused the German government of violating Article 3 of the Nazi-Soviet Pact, which called for consultation and of presenting Russia with accomplished facts, which conflicted with German assurances about questions of common interests. The thieves, as is almost inevitable in such cases, had begun to quarrel over the spoils. Recriminations became more heated in the following days. On September 3rd, Ribbentrop telegraphed a long memorandum to Moscow, denying that Germany had violated the Moscow Pact and accusing Russia of having done just that by gobbling up the Baltic states and two Romanian provinces without consulting Berlin. The memorandum was couched in strong language, and the Russians replied to it on September 21st with equally stern words. By this time, both sides were putting their cases in writing. The Soviet answer reiterated that Germany had broken the pact, warned that Russia still had many interests in Romania, and concluded with a sarcastic proposal that if the article calling for consultation involved certain inconveniences and restrictions for the Reich, the Soviet government was ready to amend or delete this clause of the treaty. The Kremlin's suspicions of Hitler were further aroused by two events in September. On the 16th, Ribbentrop wired Schulenberg to call on Molotov and casually inform him that German reinforcements for northern Norway were going to be sent by way of Finland. A few days later, on September 25th, the Nazi foreign minister got off another telegram to the embassy in Moscow, this time addressed to the Charge, Schulenberg having returned to Germany on leave. It was a most confidential message, being marked strictly secret, state secret, and directing that its instructions were to be carried out only if on the next day the Charge received from Berlin by wire or telephone a special code word. He was to inform Molotov that in the next few days Japan, Italy, and Germany were going to sign in Berlin a military alliance. It was not to be directed against Russia. A specific article would say that. This alliance, Ribbentrop stated, is directed exclusively against American warmongers. To be sure, this is, as usual, not expressly stated in the treaty, but can be unmistakably inferred from its terms. Its exclusive purpose is to bring the elements pressing for America's entry into the war to their senses by conclusively demonstrating to them that if they enter the present struggle, they will automatically have to deal with the three great powers as adversaries. The chilly Soviet foreign commissar, whose suspicions of the Germans were now growing like flowers in June, was highly skeptical when Werner von Tippelskirk, the charge, brought him this news on the evening of September 26th. He said immediately, with that pedantic attention to detail which so annoyed all with whom he negotiated, friend or foe, that according to Article 4 of the Moscow Pact, the Soviet government was entitled to see the text of this tripartite military alliance before it was signed, including, he added, the text of any secret protocols. Molotov also wanted to know more about the German agreement with Finland for the transport of troops through that country, which he had heard of mostly through the press, he said, including a United Press dispatch from Berlin. During the last three days, Molotov added, Moscow had received reports of the landing of German forces in at least three Finnish ports, without having been informed thereof by Germany. The Soviet government, Molotov continued, wished to receive the text of the agreement on the passage of troops through Finland, including its secret portions, and to be informed as to the object of the agreement, against whom it was directed, and the purposes that were being served thereby. The Russians had to be mollified, even the obtuse Ribbentrop could see that, and on October 2nd he telegraphed to Moscow what he said was the text of the agreement with Finland. He also reiterated that the tripartite pact, which in the meantime had been signed, was not directed against the Soviet Union, and solemnly declared that there were no secret protocols nor any other secret agreements. It was signed in Berlin on September 27th, 1940, in a comic opera setting and ceremony which I have described elsewhere, Berlin Diary, pages 532 to 537. In Articles 1 and 2, respectively, Japan recognized the leadership of Germany and Italy in the establishment of a new order in Europe, and the two countries recognized Japan's leadership for the same in Greater East Asia. Article 3 provided for mutual assistance should any one of the powers be attacked by the United States, though America was not specifically mentioned, only defined. 
To me, as I wrote in my diary that day in Berlin, the most significant thing about the pact was that it meant that Hitler was now reconciled to a long war. Chano, who signed the pact for Italy, came to the same conclusion. Chano Diaries, page 296. Also, despite the disclaimer, the pact was, and was meant to be, a warning to the Soviet Union. After instructing Tippelskirk on October 7th to inform Molotov, incidentally, that a German military mission was being sent to Romania, and after receiving Molotov's skeptical reaction to this further news, how many troops are you sending to Romania, the foreign commissar had demanded to know. Ribbentrop on October 13th got off a long letter to Stalin in an attempt to quiet Soviet uneasiness about Germany. It is, as might be expected, a fatuous and at the same time arrogant epistle, abounding in nonsense and lies and subterfuge. England is blamed for the war and all its aftermaths thus far, but one thing is sure. The war as such has been won by us. It is only a question of how long it will be before England admits to collapse. The German moves against Russia in Finland and Romania, as well as the tripartite pact, are explained as really a boon to Russia. In the meantime, British diplomacy and British secret agents are trying to stir up trouble between Russia and Germany. To frustrate them, why not send Molotov to Berlin, Ribbentrop asked Stalin, so that the Fuhrer could explain personally his views regarding the future molding of relations between our two countries. Ribbentrop gave a sly hint what those views were. Nothing less than dividing up the world among the four totalitarian powers. It appears to be the mission of the four powers, he said, the Soviet Union, Italy, Japan, and Germany, to adopt a long-range policy by delimitation of their interests on a worldwide scale. There was some delay in the German embassy in Moscow in getting this letter to its destination, which made Ribbentrop livid with rage and inspired an angry telegram from him to Schulenberg demanding to know why his letter had not been delivered until the 17th, and why, in keeping with the importance of its contents, it was not delivered to Stalin personally. Schulenberg had handed it to Molotov. Stalin replied on October 22nd in a remarkably cordial tone. Molotov admits, he wrote, that he is under obligation to pay you a visit in Berlin. He hereby accepts your invitation. Stalin's geniality must have been only a mask. Schulenberg wired Berlin a few days later that the Russians were protesting the refusal of Germany to deliver war material, while at the same time shipping arms to Finland. This is the first time, Schulenberg advised Berlin, that our deliveries of arms to Finland have been mentioned by the Soviets. A dark, drizzling day, and Molotov arrived, his reception being extremely stiff and formal. Driving up the Linden to the Soviet embassy, he looked to me like a plugging provincial schoolmaster. But to have survived in the cutthroat competition of the Kremlin, he must have something. The Germans talked glibly of letting Moscow have that old Russian dream, the Bosporus and the Dardanelles, while they will take the rest of the Balkans, Romania, Yugoslavia, and Bulgaria. Thus began my diary entry in Berlin on November 12, 1940. The glib talk of the Germans was accurate enough as far as it went. Today we know much more about this strange and, as it turned out, fateful meeting, thanks to the capture of the Foreign Office documents, in which one finds the confidential German minutes of the two-day sessions, all but one of them kept by the ubiquitous Dr. Schmidt. Their accuracy on this occasion was later confirmed by Stalin, though not intentionally. Churchill says he received an account of Molotov's talks in Berlin from Stalin in August 1942, which in no essential differs from the German record, though it was more pithy. Churchill, Their Finest Hour, pages 585 to 586. At the first meeting between the two foreign ministers during the forenoon of November 12th, Ribbentrop was in one of his most vapid and arrogant moods, but Molotov quickly saw through him and sized up what the German game was. England, Ribbentrop began, is beaten, and it is only a question of time when she will finally admit her defeat. The beginning of the end has now arrived for the British Empire. The British, it was true, were hoping for aid from America, but the entry of the United States into the war is of no consequence at all for Germany. Germany and Italy will never again allow an Anglo-Saxon to land on the European continent. This is no military problem at all. The Axis powers are therefore not considering how they can win the war, 
but rather how rapidly they can end the war which is already won. This being so, Ribbentrop explained, the time had come for the four powers, Russia, Germany, Italy, and Japan, to define their spheres of interest. The Fuhrer, he said, had concluded that all four countries would naturally expand in a southerly direction. Japan had already turned south, as had Italy, while Germany, after the establishment of the new order in Western Europe, would find her additional Lebensraum in, of all places, Central Africa. Ribbentrop said he wondered if Russia would also not turn to the south for the natural outlet to the open sea which was so important for her. Which sea? Molotov interjected icily. This was an awkward but crucial question, as the Germans would learn during the next thirty-six hours of ceaseless conversations with this stubborn, prosaic, precise Bolshevik. The interruption floored Ribbentrop for a moment, and he could not think of an answer. Instead, he rambled on about the great changes that would take place all over the world after the war, and gabbled that the important thing was that both partners to the German-Russian pact had together done some good business, and would continue to do some business. But when Molotov insisted on an answer to his simple question, Ribbentrop finally replied by suggesting that, in the long run, the most advantageous access to the sea for Russia could be found in the direction of the Persian Gulf and the Arabian Sea. Molotov sat there, says Dr. Schmidt, who was present taking notes, with an impenetrable expression. He said very little, except a comment at the end that precision and vigilance were necessary in delimiting spheres of interest, particularly between Germany and Russia. The wily Soviet negotiator was saving his ammunition for Hitler, whom he saw in the afternoon. For the all-powerful Nazi warlord, it turned out to be quite a surprising, nerve-wracking, frustrating, and even unique experience. Hitler was just as vague as his foreign minister, and even more grandiose. As soon as the weather improved, he began by saying, Germany would strike the final blow against England. There was, to be sure, the problem of America. But the United States could not endanger the freedom of other nations before 1970 or 1980. It had no business either in Europe, in Africa, or in Asia, an assertion which Molotov broke in to say he was in agreement with. But he was not in agreement with much else that Hitler said. After the Nazi leader had finished a lengthy exposition of pleasant generalities, stressing that there were no fundamental differences between the two countries in the pursuit of their respective aspirations and in their common drive toward access to the ocean, Molotov replied that the statements of the Fuhrer had been of a general nature. He would now, he said, set forth the ideas of Stalin, who on his departure from Moscow had given him exact instructions. Whereupon he hurled the book at the German dictator, who, as the minutes make clear, was scarcely prepared for it. The questions hailed down upon Hitler, Schmidt afterward recalled. No foreign visitor had ever spoken to him in this way in my presence. What was Germany up to in Finland? Molotov wanted to know. What was the meaning of the new order in Europe and in Asia? And what role would the USSR be given in it? What was the significance of the tripartite pact? Moreover, he continued, there are issues to be clarified regarding Russia's Balkan and Black Sea interests with respect to Bulgaria, Romania, and Turkey. He would like, he said, to hear some answers and explanations. Hitler, perhaps for the first time in his life, was too taken aback to answer. He proposed that they adjourn in view of a possible air raid alarm, promising to go into a detailed discussion the next day. A showdown had been postponed, but not prevented, and the next morning when Hitler and Molotov resumed their talks, the Russian commissar was relentless. To begin with, about Finland, over which the two men soon became embroiled in a bitter and caustic dispute, Molotov demanded that Germany get its troops out of Finland. Hitler denied that Finland was occupied by German troops. They were merely being sent through Finland to Norway but he wanted to know whether Russia intended to go to war against Finland. According to the German minutes, Molotov answered this question somewhat evasively, and Hitler was not satisfied. There must be no war in the Baltic, Hitler insisted. It would put a heavy strain on German-Russian relations, a threat which he added to a moment later by saying that such a strain might bring unforeseeable consequences. What more did the Soviet Union want in Finland, anyway? Hitler wanted to know. 
and his visitor answered that it wanted a settlement on the same scale as in Bessarabia, which meant outright annexation. Hitler's reaction to this must have perturbed even the imperturbable Russian, who hastened to ask the Fuhrer's opinion on that. The dictator in turn was somewhat evasive, replying that he could only repeat that there must be no war with Finland, because such a conflict might have far-reaching repercussions. A new factor has been introduced into the discussion by this position, Molotov retorted. So heated had the dispute become that Ribbentrop, who must have become thoroughly frightened by this time, broke in to say, according to the German minutes, that there was actually no reason at all for making an issue of the Finnish question. Perhaps it was merely a misunderstanding. Hitler took advantage of this timely intervention to quickly change the subject. Could not the Russians be tempted by the unlimited plunder soon to be available with the collapse of the British Empire? Let us turn to more important problems, he said. After the conquest of England, he declared, the British Empire would be apportioned as a gigantic worldwide estate in bankruptcy of forty million square kilometers. In this bankrupt estate there would be for Russia access to the ice-free and really open ocean. Thus far, a minority of forty-five million Englishmen had ruled six hundred million inhabitants of the British Empire. He was about to crush this minority. Under these circumstances there arose worldwide perspectives. All the countries which could possibly be interested in the bankrupt estate would have to stop all controversies among themselves and concern themselves exclusively with the partition of the British Empire. This applied to Germany, France, Italy, Russia, and Japan. The chilly, impassive Russian guest did not appear to be moved by such glittering, worldwide perspectives, nor was he as convinced as the Germans, a point he later rubbed in, that the British Empire would soon be there for the taking. He wanted, he said, to discuss problems closer to Europe, Turkey, for instance, and Bulgaria and Romania. The Soviet government, he said, is of the opinion that the German guarantee of Romania is aimed against the interests of Soviet Russia, if one may express oneself so bluntly. He had been expressing himself bluntly all day to the growing annoyance of his hosts, and now he pressed on. He demanded that Germany revoke this guarantee. Hitler declined. All right, Molotov persisted. In view of Moscow's interest in the Straits, what would Germany say if Russia gave Bulgaria a guarantee under exactly the same conditions as Germany and Italy had given one to Romania? One can almost see Hitler's dark frown. He inquired whether Bulgaria had asked for such a guarantee as had Romania. He, the Fuhrer, the German memorandum quotes him as adding, did not know of any request by Bulgaria. At any rate, he would first have to consult Mussolini before giving the Russians a more definite answer to their question. And he added ominously that if Germany were perchance looking for sources of friction with Russia, she would not need the straits for that. But the Fuhrer, usually so talkative, had no more stomach for talk with this impossible Russian. At this point in the conversation, say the German minutes, the Fuhrer called attention to the late hour and stated that in view of the possibility of English air attacks, it would be better to break off the talk now, since the main issues had probably been sufficiently discussed. That night Molotov gave a gala banquet to his hosts at the Russian embassy on Unter den Linden. Hitler, apparently exhausted and still irritated by the afternoon's ordeal, did not put in an appearance. The British did. I had wondered why their bombers had not appeared over Berlin, as they had almost every recent night, to remind the Soviet commissar on his first evening in the capital that, whatever the Germans told him, Britain was still in the war and kicking. Some of us, I confess, had waited hopefully for the planes, but they had not come. Officials in the Wilhelmstrasse, who had feared the worst, were visibly relieved, but not for long. On the evening of November 13th, the British came over early. Churchill says the air raid was timed for this occasion. We had heard of the conference beforehand, he later wrote, and though not invited to join in the discussion, did not wish to be entirely left out of the proceedings. Churchill, Their Finest Hour, page 584. It gets dark in Berlin about 4 p.m. at this time of year, and shortly after 9 o'clock the air raid sirens began to whine, and then you could hear the thunder of the flak guns, and in between the hum of the bombers overhead. 
According to Dr. Schmidt, who was at the banquet in the Soviet embassy, Molotov had just proposed a friendly toast, and Ribbentrop had risen to his feet to reply when the air raid warning was sounded and the guests scattered to shelter. I remember the hurrying and scurrying down the Linden and around the corner at the Wilhelmstrasse, as Germans and Russians made for the underground shelter of the foreign ministry. Some of the officials, Dr. Schmidt among them, ducked into the Adlon Hotel, from in front of which some of us were watching, and were unable to get to the impromptu meeting which the two foreign ministers now held in the underground depths of the foreign office. The minutes of this meeting were therefore taken, in the enforced absence of Dr. Schmidt, by Gustav Hilger, counselor of the German embassy in Moscow, who had acted as one of the interpreters during the conference. While the British bombers cruised overhead in the night and the anti-aircraft guns fired away ineffectively at them, the slippery Nazi foreign minister tried one last time to take the Russians in. Out of his pocket he pulled a draft of an agreement which, in substance, transformed the tripartite pact into a four-power pact, with Russia as the fourth member. Molotov listened patiently while Ribbentrop read it through. Article 2 was the core. In it, Germany, Italy, Japan, and the Soviet Union undertook to respect each other's natural spheres of influence. Any disputes concerning them would be settled in an amicable way. The two fascist countries and Japan agreed to recognize the present extent of the possessions of the Soviet Union and will respect it. All four countries in Article 3 agreed not to join or support any combination directed against one of the four powers. The agreement itself, Ribbentrop proposed, would be made public, but not, of course, its secret protocols, which he next proceeded to read. The most important one defined each country's territorial aspirations. Russia's was to center south of the national territory of the Soviet Union in the direction of the Indian Ocean. Molotov did not rise to the bait. The proposed treaty was obviously an attempt to divert Russia from its historic pressure westward, down the Baltic into the Balkans and through the Straits to the Mediterranean, where inevitably it would clash with the greedy designs of Germany and Italy. The USSR was not, at least at the moment, interested in the Indian Ocean, which lay far away. What it was interested in at the moment, Molotov replied, was Europe and the Turkish Straits. Consequently, he added, paper agreements will not suffice for the Soviet Union. She would have to insist on effective guarantees of her security. The questions which interested the Soviet Union, he elaborated, concerned not only Turkey but Bulgaria. But the fate of Romania and Hungary was also of interest to the USSR, and could not be immaterial to her under any circumstances. It would further interest the Soviet government to learn what the Axis contemplated with regard to Yugoslavia and Greece, and likewise what Germany intended with regard to Poland. The Soviet government was also interested in the question of Swedish neutrality. Besides, there existed the question of the passages out of the Baltic Sea. The untiring, poker-faced Soviet foreign commissar left nothing out, and Ribbentrop, who felt himself being buried under the avalanche of questions, for at this point Molotov said he would appreciate it if his guest made answer to them, protested that he was being interrogated too closely. He could only repeat again and again, he replied weakly, that the decisive question was whether the Soviet Union was prepared and in a position to cooperate with us in the great liquidation of the British Empire. Molotov was ready with a cutting retort. Hilger duly noted it in the minutes. In his reply, Molotov stated that the Germans were assuming that the war against England had already actually been won. If, therefore, as Hitler had maintained, Germany was waging a life-and-death struggle against England, he could only construe this as meaning that Germany was fighting for life and England for death. This sarcasm may have gone over the head of Ribbentrop, a man of monumental denseness but Molotov took no chances. To the Germans' constant reiteration that Britain was finished, the commissar finally replied, If that is so, why are we in this shelter, and whose are these bombs which fall? Molotov's parting shot is given by Churchill, to whom it was related by Stalin later in the war. Churchill, Their Finest Hour, page 586. From this wearing experience with Moscow's tough bargainer, and from further evidence that came a fortnight later of Stalin's increasingly rapacious appetite, Hitler drew his final conclusions. 
It must be set down here that the Soviet dictator, his subsequent claims to the contrary notwithstanding, now accepted Hitler's offer to join the fascist camp, though at a stiffer price than had been offered in Berlin. On November 26th, scarcely two weeks after Molotov had returned from Germany, he informed the German ambassador in Moscow that Russia was prepared to join the Four Power Pact, subject to the following conditions. 1. The German troops are immediately withdrawn from Finland, which belongs to the Soviet Union's sphere of influence. 2. That within the next few months, the security of the Soviet Union in the Straits is assured by the conclusion of a mutual assistance pact between the USSR and Bulgaria, and by the establishment of a base for land and naval forces by the Soviet Union within range of the Bosporus and the Dardanelles by means of a long-term lease. 3. That the area south of Batum and Baku in the general direction of the Persian Gulf is recognized as the center of the aspirations of the Soviet Union. 4. That Japan renounce her rights to concessions for coal and oil in northern Sakhalin. In all, Stalin asked for five instead of two secret protocols embodying his new proposals, and for good measure, asked that should Turkey prove difficult about Russian bases controlling the straits, the four powers take military measures against her. The proposals constituted a price higher than Hitler was willing even to consider. He had tried to keep Russia out of Europe, but now Stalin was demanding Finland, Bulgaria, control of the straits, and, in effect, the Arabian and Persian oil fields, which normally supplied Europe with most of its oil. The Russians did not even mention the Indian Ocean, which the Fuhrer had tried to fob off as the center of aspirations for the USSR. Stalin is clever and cunning, Hitler told his top military chiefs. He demands more and more. He's a cold-blooded blackmailer. A German victory has become unbearable for Russia. Therefore, she must be brought to her knees as soon as possible. The great cold-blooded Nazi blackmailer had met his match, and the realization infuriated him. At the beginning of December, he told Halder to bring him the Army General Staff's plan for the onslaught on the Soviet Union. On December 5th, Halder and Braukic dutifully brought it to him, and at the end of a four-hour conference, he approved it. Both the captured OKW war diary and Halder's own confidential journal contain a report on this crucial meeting. The Nazi warlord stressed that the Red Army must be broken through both north and south of the Propet marshes, surrounded and annihilated, as in Poland. Moscow, he told Halder, was not important. The important thing was to destroy the life force of Russia. Romania and Finland were to join in the attack, but not Hungary. General Dietl's mountain division at Narvik was to be transported across northern Sweden to Finland for an attack on the Soviet Arctic region. Sweden, which had refused transit to the Allies during the Russo-Finnish War, permitted this fully armed division to pass through. Hungary, of course, later joined in the war against Russia. Altogether, some 120 to 130 divisions were allotted for the big campaign. In its report on this conference, as in previous references to the plan to attack Russia, General Halder's diary employs the code name Otto. Less than a fortnight later, on December 18, 1940, the code name by which it will go down in history was substituted. On this day, Hitler crossed the Rubicon. He issued Directive Number 21. It was headed Operation Barbarossa. It began, Top Secret, the Führer's Headquarters, December 18, 1940. The German armed forces must be prepared to crush Soviet Russia in a quick campaign before the end of the war against England. For this purpose, the army will have to employ all available units with the reservation that the occupied territories will have to be safeguarded against surprise attacks. Preparations are to be completed by May 15, 1941. Great caution has to be exercised that the intention of an attack will not be recognized. So the target date was mid-May of the following spring. The general purpose of Operation Barbarossa Hitler laid down as follows. The mass of the Russian army in western Russia is to be destroyed in daring operations by driving forward deep armored wedges, and the retreat of intact battle-ready troops into the wide spaces of Russia is to be prevented. The ultimate objective of the operation is to establish a defense line against Asiatic Russia from a line running from the Volga River to Archangel. Hitler's directive then went into considerable detail about the main lines of attack. 
A good many historians have contended that Hitler in this first Barbarossa directive did not go into detail, a misunderstanding due probably to the extremely abbreviated version given in English translation in the NCA volumes. But the complete German text given in Trial of the Major War Criminals, volume 26, pages 47 to 52, discloses the full details, thus revealing how far advanced the German military plans were at this early date. The roles of Romania and Finland were defined. They were to provide the jumping-off areas for attacks on the extreme north and south flanks, as well as troops to aid the German forces in these operations. Finland's position was especially important. Various Finnish German armies were to advance on Leningrad and the Lake Lodega area, cut the Murmansk rail line, secure the Petsamo nickel mines, and occupy the Russian ice-free ports on the Arctic Ocean. Much depended, Hitler admitted, on whether Sweden would permit the transit of German troops from Norway, but he correctly predicted that the Swedes would be accommodating in this. The main operations were to be divided, Hitler explained, by the Pripet marshes. The major blow would be delivered north of the swamps with two whole army groups. One would advance up the Baltic states to Leningrad. The other, farther south, would drive through White Russia and then swing north to join the first group thus trapping what was left of the Soviet forces trying to retreat from the Baltic. Only then, Hitler laid it down, must an offensive against Moscow be undertaken. The Russian capital, which a fortnight before had seemed unimportant to Hitler, now assumed more significance. The capture of this city, he wrote, means a decisive political and economic victory, beyond the fall of the country's most important railroad junction and he pointed out that Moscow was not only the main communications center of Russia, but its principal producer of armaments. A third army group would drive south of the marshes through the Ukraine toward Kiev, its principal objective being to roll up and destroy the Soviet forces there west of the Dnieper River. Farther south, German-Romanian troops would protect the flank of the main operation and advance toward Odessa and thence along the Black Sea. Thereafter, the Donetsk Basin, where 60% of Soviet industry was concentrated, would be taken. Such was Hitler's grandiose plan, completed just before the Christmas holidays of 1940, and so well prepared that no essential changes would be made in it. In order to secure secrecy, only nine copies of the directive were made, one for each of the three armed services and the rest to be guarded at OKW headquarters. Even the top field commanders, the directive makes clear, were to be told that the plan was merely for precaution, in case Russia should change her previous attitude toward us. And Hitler instructed that the number of officers in the secret be kept as small as possible, otherwise the danger exists that our preparations will become known, and the gravest political and military disadvantages result. There is no evidence that the generals in the army's high command objected to Hitler's decision to turn on the Soviet Union whose loyal fulfillment of the pact with Germany had made possible their victories in Poland and the West. Later, Halder would write derisively of Hitler's Russian adventure, and claim the army leaders were against it from the beginning. But there is not a word in his voluminous diary entries for December 1940 which supports him in this. Indeed, he gives the impression of being full of genuine enthusiasm for the adventure, which he himself, as chief of the general staff, had the main responsibility for planning. At any rate, for Hitler, the die was cast, and though he did not know it, his ultimate fate sealed by this decision of December 18, 1940. Relieved to have made up his mind at last, as he later revealed, he went off to celebrate the Christmas holidays with the troops and flyers along the English Channel, as far as it was possible for him to get from Russia. Out of his mind, too, as far as possible, must have been any thoughts of Charles XII of Sweden and of Napoleon Bonaparte who, after so many glorious conquests not unlike his own, had met disaster in the vast depths of the Russian steppes. How could they be much in his mind? By now, as the record shortly will show, the one-time Vienna waif regarded himself as the greatest conqueror the world had ever seen. Egomania, that fatal disease of all conquerors, was taking hold. Six Months of Frustration and yet, after all the tumultuous victories of the spring and early summer of 1940, there had been a frustrating six months for the Nazi conqueror. 
Not only the final triumph over Britain eluded him, but opportunities to deal her a mortal blow in the Mediterranean had been thrown away. Two days after Christmas, Grand Admiral Raider saw Hitler in Berlin, but he had little yuletide cheer to offer. The threat to Britain in the entire eastern Mediterranean, the Near East, and in North Africa, he told the Fuhrer, has been eliminated. The decisive action in the Mediterranean for which we had hoped, therefore, is no longer possible. Adolf Hitler, balked by a shifty Franco, by the ineptitude of Mussolini, and even by the senility of Marshal Pétain, had really missed the bus in the Mediterranean. Disaster had struck the Italian ally in the Egyptian desert, and now in December confronted it in the snowy mountains of Albania. These untoward happenings were also turning points in the war and in the course of history of the Third Reich. They had come about not only because of the weakness of Germany's friends and allies, but in part because of the Nazi warlord's incapacity to grasp the larger intercontinental strategy that was called for and that Raider and even Goering had urged upon him. Twice in September 1940, on the 6th and the 26th, the Grand Admiral attempted to open up new vistas in the Fuhrer's mind, now that the direct attack on England seemed out of the question. For the second conference, Raider cornered Hitler alone, and without the Army and Air Force officers to muddle the conversation, gave his chief a lengthy lecture on naval strategy and the importance of getting at Britain in other places than over the English Channel. The British, Raider said, have always considered the Mediterranean the pivot of their world empire. Italy, surrounded by British power, is fast becoming the main target of attack. The Italians have not yet realized the danger when they refuse our help. Germany, however, must wage war against Great Britain with all the means at her disposal and without delay, before the United States is able to intervene effectively. For this reason, the Mediterranean question must be cleared up during the winter months. Cleared up how? The Admiral then got down to brass tacks. Gibraltar must be taken. The Canary Islands must be secured by the Air Force. The Suez Canal must be taken. After Suez, Raider painted a rosy picture of what then would logically ensue. An advance from Suez through Palestine and Syria as far as Turkey is necessary. If we reach that point, Turkey will be in our power. The Russian problem will then appear in a different light. It is doubtful whether an advance against Russia from the north will be necessary. Having in his mind driven the British out of the Mediterranean and put Turkey and Russia in Germany's power, Raider went on to complete the picture. Correctly predicting that Britain, supported by the USA and the Gaullist forces, eventually would try to get a foothold on northwest Africa as a basis for subsequent war against the Axis, the Admiral urged that Germany and Vichy France forestall this by securing this strategically important region themselves. According to Raider, Hitler agreed with his general trend of thought, but added that he would have to talk matters over first with Mussolini, Franco, and Pétain. This he proceeded to do, though only after much time was lost. He arranged to see the Spanish dictator on October 23rd, Pétain, who was now the head of a collaborationist government at Vichy the next day, and the Duce a few days thereafter. Franco, who owed his triumph in the Spanish Civil War to the massive military aid of Italy and Germany, had, like all his fellow dictators, an inordinate appetite for spoils, especially if they could be gained cheaply. In June, at the moment of France's fall, he had hastily informed Hitler that Spain would enter the war in return for being given most of the vast French African Empire, including Morocco and western Algeria, and provided that Germany supplied Spain liberally with arms, gasoline, and foodstuffs. It was to give Franco the opportunity to redeem this promise that the Fuhrer arrived in his special train at the Franco-Spanish border town of Vendée on October 23rd. But much had happened in the intervening months. Britain had stoutly held out, for one thing, and Hitler was in for an unpleasant surprise. The crafty Spaniard was not impressed by the Fuhrer's boast that England already is decisively beaten, nor was he satisfied with Hitler's promise to give Spain territorial compensation in French North Africa to the extent to which it would be possible to cover France's losses from British colonies. Franco wanted the French African Empire with no strings attached. Hitler's proposal was that Spain enter the war in January 1941, but Franco pointed out the dangers of such precipitate action. Hitler wanted the Spaniards to attack Gibraltar on January 10th, 
with the help of German specialists who had taken the Belgian fort of Ebony Mal from the air. Franco replied with typical Spanish pride that Gibraltar would have to be taken by Spaniards alone, and so the two dictators wrangled for nine hours. According to Dr. Schmidt, who was present here too, Franco spoke on and on in a monotonous sing-song voice, and Hitler became increasingly exasperated, once springing up as he had done with Chamberlain to exclaim that there was no point in continuing the conversations. Rather than go through that again, he later told Mussolini in recounting his ordeal with the Caldillo, I would prefer to have three or four teeth yanked out. After nine hours, with time out for dinner and Hitler's special dining car, the talks broke up late in the evening, without Franco's having definitely committed himself to come into the war. Hitler left Ribbentrop behind that night to continue the parley with Serrano Sunier, the Spanish foreign minister, and to try to get the Spaniards to sign something, at least an agreement to drive the British out of Gibraltar and close to them the western Mediterranean, but to no avail. That ungrateful coward, Ribbentrop cursed to Schmidt about Franco the next morning. He owes us everything and now won't join us. Hitler's meeting with Pétain and Montoir the next day went off better. But this was because the aging defeatist marshal, the hero of Verdun in the First World War and the perpetrator of the French surrender in the Second, agreed to France's collaboration with her conqueror in one last effort to bring Britain, the late ally, to her knees. In fact, he assented to put down in writing this odious deal. The Axis powers in France have an identical interest in seeing the defeat of England accomplished as soon as possible. Consequently, the French government will support, within the limits of its ability, the measures which the Axis powers may take to this end. In return for this treacherous act, France was to be given in the New Europe the place to which she is entitled, and in Africa she was to receive from the fascist dictators compensation from the British Empire for whatever territory she was forced to cede to others. Both parties agreed to keep the pact absolutely secret. Although they did not learn of the contents of the secret accord at Montoir, both Churchill and Roosevelt suspected the worst. The King of England sent through American channels a personal appeal to Pétain, asking him not to take sides against Britain. President Roosevelt's message to the Marshal was stern and toughly worded, and warned him of the dire consequences of Vichy France's betraying Britain. See William L. Langer, Our Vichy Gamble, page 97. To write this book, Professor Langer had access to German documents that eleven years later have not been released by the British and American governments. Despite Pétain's dishonorable but vital concessions, Hitler was not satisfied. According to Dr. Schmidt, he had wanted more, nothing less than France's active participation in the war against Britain. On the long journey back to Munich, the official interpreter found the Fuhrer disappointed and depressed with the results of his trip. He was to become even more so in Florence, where he arrived on the morning of October 28th to see Mussolini. They had conferred but three weeks before, on October 4th, at the Brenner Pass. Hitler, as usual, had done most of the talking, giving one of his dazzling tour d'horizon, in which was not included any mention that he was sending troops to Romania, which Italy also coveted. When the Duce learned of this a few days later, he was indignant. Hitler always faces me with a fait accompli, he fumed to Chano. This time I'm going to pay him back in his own coin. He will find out from the newspapers that I have occupied Greece. In this way the equilibrium will be re-established. The Duce's ambitions in the Balkans were as rabid as Hitler's and cut across them so that as far back as the middle of August the Germans had warned Rome against any adventures in Yugoslavia and Greece. It is a complete order to halt all along the line, Chano noted in his diary on August 17th. Mussolini scrapped, for the moment anyway, his plans for further martial glory in the Balkans, and confirmed this in a humble letter to Hitler of August 27th. But the prospect of a quick, easy conquest of Greece, which would compensate to some extent for his partner's glittering victories, proved too big a temptation for the strutting fascist Caesar to resist, false though the prospect was. On October 22nd, he set the date for a surprise Italian assault on Greece for October 28th, and on the same day wrote Hitler a letter, predated October 19th, 
alluding to his contemplated action but making it vague as to the exact nature and date. He feared, Chano noted that day in his diary, that the Fuhrer might order him to halt. Hitler and Ribbentrop got wind of the Duce's plans while they were returning in their respective special trains from France, and at the Fuhrer's orders the Nazi foreign minister stopped at the first station in Germany to telephone Chano in Rome and urge an immediate meeting of the Axis leaders. Mussolini suggested October 28th at Florence, and, when his German visitor alighted from the train on the morning of that day, greeted him, his chin up and his eyes full of glee. Führer, we are on the march. Victorious Italian troops crossed the Greco-Albanian frontier at dawn today. According to all accounts, Mussolini greatly enjoyed this revenge on his friend for all the previous occasions when the Nazi dictator had marched into a country without previously confiding to his Italian ally. Hitler was furious. This rash act against a sturdy foe at the worst possible time of year threatened to upset the apple cart in the Balkans. The Fuhrer, as he wrote Mussolini a little later, had sped to Florence in the hope of preventing it, but he had arrived too late. According to Schmidt, who was present, the Nazi leader managed to control his rage. Hitler went north that afternoon, Schmidt later wrote, with bitterness in his heart. He had been frustrated three times, at Onde, at Montoire, and now in Italy. In the lengthy winter evenings of the next few years, these long, exacting journeys were a constantly recurring theme of bitter reproaches against ungrateful and unreliable friends, Axis partners, and deceiving Frenchmen. Nevertheless, he had to do something to prosecute the war against the British, now that the invasion of Britain had proved impossible. Hardly had the Fuhrer returned to Berlin before the need to act was further impressed upon him by the fiasco of the Duce's armies in Greece. Within a week, the victorious Italian attack there had been turned into a rout. On November 4th, Hitler called a war conference at the Chancellery in Berlin, to which he summoned Braukitsch and Halder from the army and Keitel and Jodl from OKW. Thanks to Halder's diary and a captured copy of Jodl's report to the Navy on the conference, we know the warlord's decisions, which were embodied in Directive No. 18 issued by Hitler on November 12th, the text of which is among the Nuremberg records. The German Navy's influence on Hitler's strategy became evident, as did the necessity for doing something about the faltering Italian ally. Halder noted the Fuhrer's lack of confidence in Italian leadership. As a result, it was decided not to send any German troops to Libya until Marshal Rodolfo Graziani's army, which in September had advanced sixty miles into Egypt to Sidi Barani, had reached Mirsa Matru, a further seventy-five miles along the coast, which was not expected before Christmas, if then. In the meantime, plans were to be made to send a few dive bombers to Egypt to attack the British fleet in Alexandria and mine the Suez Canal. As for Greece, the Italian attack there, Hitler admitted to his generals, had been a regrettable blunder, and unfortunately had endangered Germany's position in the Balkans. The British, by occupying Crete and Lemnos, had achieved air bases from which they could easily bomb the Romanian oil fields, and by sending troops to the Greek mainland, threatened the whole German position in the Balkans. To counter this danger, Hitler ordered the army to prepare immediately plans to invade Greece through Bulgaria with a force of at least ten divisions, which would be sent first to Romania. It is anticipated, he said, that Russia will remain neutral. But it was in regard to destroying Britain's position in the western Mediterranean that most of the conference of November 4th and most of the ensuing Directive No. 18 was devoted. Gibraltar will be taken, said the Directive, and the Straits closed. The British will be prevented from gaining a foothold at another point of the Iberian Peninsula or the Atlantic Islands. Felix was to be the code name for the taking of Gibraltar and the Spanish Canary Islands and the Portuguese Cape Verde Islands. The Navy was also to study the possibility of occupying Portugal's Madeira and the Azores. Portugal itself might have to be occupied. Operation Isabella would be the cover name for that and three German divisions would be assembled on the Spanish-Portuguese frontier to carry it out. Finally, units of the French fleet and some troops were to be released so that France could defend her possessions in northwest Africa against the British and de Gaulle. From this initial task, Hitler said in his directive, France's participation in the war against England can develop fully. 
Hitler's new plans, as enunciated to the generals on November 4th and laid down in the directive a week later, went into considerable military detail, especially on how Gibraltar was to be taken by a daring German stroke, and apparently they impressed his army chiefs as bold and shrewd. But in reality they were half-measures which could not possibly achieve their objectives, and they were based partly on his deceiving his own generals. He assured them on November 4th, Halder noted, that he had just received Franco's renewed promise to join Germany in the war, but this, as we have seen, was not quite true. The objectives of driving the British out of the Mediterranean were sound, but the forces allotted to the task were quite insufficient, especially in view of Italy's weaknesses. The naval war staff pointed this out in a toughly worded memorandum which Raider gave Hitler on November 14th. The Italian disaster in Greece, Mussolini's troops had now been hurled back into Albania and were still retreating, had not only greatly improved Britain's strategic position in the Mediterranean, the sailors pointed out, but enhanced British prestige throughout the world. As for the Italian attack on Egypt, the Navy told Hitler flatly, Italy will never carry out the Egyptian offensive. The Italian leadership is wretched. They have no understanding of the situation. The Italian armed forces have neither the leadership nor the military efficiency to carry the required operations in the Mediterranean area to a successful conclusion with the necessary speed and decision. Therefore, the Navy concluded this task must be carried out by Germany. The fight for the African area, it warned Hitler, is the foremost strategic objective of German warfare as a whole. It is of decisive importance for the outcome of the war. But the Nazi dictator was not convinced. He had never been able to envisage the war in the Mediterranean and North Africa as anything but secondary to his main objective. As Admiral Raider elaborated to him the Navy's strategic conceptions in their meeting on November 14th, Hitler retorted that he was still inclined toward a demonstration with Russia. In fact, he was more inclined than ever, for Molotov had just departed Berlin that morning after so arousing the Fuhrer's ire. When the Admiral next saw his chief a couple of days after Christmas to report on how the bus had been missed in the Mediterranean, Hitler was not unduly perturbed. To Raider's argument that the victory of Britain over the Italians in Egypt and the increasing material aid which she was receiving from America necessitated the concentration of all German resources to bring the British down, and that Barbarossa ought to be postponed until the overthrow of Britain, Hitler turned an almost deaf ear. By this time, a ramshackle British desert force of one armored division, an Indian infantry division, two infantry brigades, and a royal tank regiment, 31,000 men in all, had driven an Italian force three times as large out of Egypt and captured 38,000 prisoners at a cost of 133 killed, 387 wounded, and eight missing. The British counteroffensive, under the overall command of General Sir Archibald Wavell, had begun on December 7th, and in four days Marshal Graziani's army was routed. What had started as a five-day limited counterattack continued until February 7th by which time the British had pushed clear across Cyrenaica, a distance of five hundred miles, annihilated the entire Italian army of ten divisions in Libya, taken one hundred thirty thousand prisoners, one thousand two hundred forty guns and five hundred tanks, and lost themselves five hundred killed, one thousand three hundred seventy-three wounded and fifty-five missing. To the skeptical British military writer General J. F. Fuller it was one of the most audacious campaigns ever fought. Fuller, The Second World War, page 98. The Italian Navy had also been dealt a lethal blow. On the night of November 11th to 12th, bombers from the British carrier Illustrious, which the Luftwaffe claimed to have sunk, attacked the Italian fleet at anchor at Toronto and put out of action for many months three battleships and two cruisers. A black day, Chano began his diary on November 12th. The British, without warning, have sunk the dreadnought Cavour, and seriously damaged the battleships Littorio and Duilio. In view of present political developments, and especially Russia's interference in Balkan affairs, Hitler said, it is necessary to eliminate at all costs the last enemy remaining on the continent before coming to grips with Britain. From now on to the bitter end, he would stick fanatically to this fundamental strategy. 
As a sop to his naval chief, Hitler promised to try once more to influence Franco so that the attack against Gibraltar could be made and the Mediterranean closed to the British fleet. Actually, he had already dropped the whole idea. On December 11th, he had quietly ordered Operation Felix will not be carried out as the political conditions no longer exist. Nagged by his own navy and by the Italians to keep after Franco, Hitler made one final effort, though it was painful to him. On February 6, 1941, he addressed a long letter to the Spanish dictator. About one thing, Caudillo, there must be clarity. We are fighting a battle of life and death and cannot at this time make any gifts. The battle which Germany and Italy are fighting will determine the destiny of Spain as well. Only in the case of our victory will your present regime continue to exist. Unfortunately for the Axis, the letter reached the Caudillo on the very day that Marshal Graziani's last forces in Cyrenaica had been wiped out by the British south of Benghazi. Little wonder that when Franco got around to replying, on February 26, 1941, though protesting his absolute loyalty to the Axis, he reminded the Nazi leader that recent developments had left the circumstances of October far behind, and that their understanding of that time had become outmoded. For one of the very few times in his stormy life, Adolf Hitler conceded defeat. The long and short of the tedious Spanish rigmarole, he wrote Mussolini, is that Spain does not want to enter the war and will not enter it. This is extremely tiresome, since it means that for the moment the possibility of striking at Britain in the simplest manner, in her Mediterranean possessions, is eliminated. Italy, not Spain, however, was the key to defeating Britain in the Mediterranean, but the Duce's creaky empire was not equal to the task of doing it alone, and Hitler was not wise enough to give her the means, which he had, to accomplish it. The possibility of striking at Britain either directly across the Channel or indirectly across the broader Mediterranean, he now confessed, had been eliminated for the moment. Though this was frustrating, the acknowledgment of it brought Hitler relief. He could now turn to matters nearer his heart and mind. On January 8th to 9th, 1941, he held a council of war at the Berghof above Berchtesgaden, which now lay deep in the winter's snow. The mountain air seems to have cleared his mind, and once more, as the lengthy confidential reports of the meeting by Admiral Raider and General Halder disclose, his thoughts ranged far and wide as he outlined his grand strategy to his military chiefs. His optimism had returned. The Fuhrer, Raider noted, is firmly convinced that the situation in Europe can no longer develop unfavorably for Germany, even if we should lose the whole of North Africa. Our position in Europe is so firmly established that the outcome cannot possibly be to our disadvantage. The British can hope to win the war only by beating us on the continent. The Fuhrer is convinced that this is impossible. It was true, he conceded, that the direct invasion of Britain was not feasible unless she is crippled to a considerable degree, and Germany has complete air superiority. The Navy and Air Force, he said, must concentrate on attacking her shipping lanes and thereby cut off her supplies. Such attacks, he thought, might lead to victory as early as July or August. In the meantime, he said, Germany must make herself so strong on the continent that we can handle a further war against England and America. Parentheses around and America are holders, and their enclosure is significant. This is the first mention in the captured German records that Hitler, at the beginning of 1941, is facing up to the possibility of the entry of the United States into the war against him. The Nazi warlord then took up the various strategic areas and problems and outlined what he intended to do about them. The Fuhrer is of the opinion, Raider wrote, that it is vital for the outcome of the war that Italy does not collapse. He is determined to prevent Italy from losing North Africa. It would mean a great loss of prestige to the Axis powers. He is therefore determined to give them support. At this point he cautioned his military leaders about divulging German plans. He does not wish to inform the Italians of our plans. There is great danger that the royal family is transmitting intelligence to Britain. Support for Italy, Hitler declared, would consist of anti-tank formations and some Luftwaffe squadrons for Libya. More important, he would dispatch an army corps of two and a half divisions to buck up the retreating Italians in Albania, into which the Greeks had now pushed them. In connection with this, Operation Marita would be pushed. 
Operation Merida was promulgated in Directive Number 20 on December 13, 1940. It called for an army of 24 divisions to be assembled in Romania and to descend on Greece through Bulgaria as soon as favorable weather set in. It was signed by Hitler. The transfer of troops from Romania to Bulgaria, he ordered, must begin at once, so that Merita could commence on March 26th. Hitler also spoke at some length of the need to be ready to carry out Operation Attila, the German cover names seem almost endless, which he had outlined in a directive of December 10, 1940. This was a plan to occupy the rest of France and seize the French fleet at Toulon. He thought now it might have to be carried out soon. If France becomes troublesome, he declared, she will have to be crushed completely. This would have been a crude violation of the Compiègne armistice, but no general or admiral, so far as Holder and Raider noted, or at least recorded, raised the question. It was at this war conference that Hitler described Stalin as a cold-blooded blackmailer and informed his commanders that Russia would have to be brought to her knees as soon as possible. If the USA and Russia should enter the war against Germany, Hitler said, and it was the second time he mentioned that possibility for America, the situation would become very complicated. Hence, any possibility for such a threat to develop must be eliminated at the very beginning. If the Russian threat were removed, we could wage war on Britain indefinitely. If Russia collapsed, Japan would be greatly relieved. This, in turn, would mean increased danger to the USA. Such were the thoughts of the German dictator on global strategy as 1941 got underway. Two days after the War Council, on January 11th, he embodied them in Directive Number 22. German reinforcements for Tripoli were to move under Operation Sunflower, those for Albania under Operation Alpine Violets. The World Will Hold Its Breath Mussolini was summoned by Hitler to the Berghof, for January 19th and 20th. Shaken and humiliated by the Italian debacles in Egypt and Greece, he had no stomach for this journey. Chano found him frowning and nervous when he boarded his special train, fearful that Hitler, Ribbentrop, and the German generals would be insultingly condescending. To make matters worse, the Duce took along General Alfredo Guzzoni, assistant chief of staff, whom Chano in his diary described as a mediocre man with a big paunch and a little dyed wig, and whom he thought it would be positively humiliating to present to the Germans. To his surprise and relief, Mussolini found Hitler, who came down to the snow-covered platform of the little station at Puch to greet him, both tactful and cordial, and there were no reproaches for Italy's sorry record on the battlefields. He also found his host, as Chano noted in his diary, in a very anti-Russian mood. For more than two hours on the second day, Hitler lectured his Italian guests and an assembly of generals from both countries, and a secret report on it prepared by General Yodel confirms that while the Fuhrer was anxious to be helpful to the Italians in Albania and Libya, his principal thoughts were on Russia. I don't see great danger coming from America, Hitler said, even if she should enter the war. The much greater danger is the gigantic bloc of Russia. Though we have very favorable political and economic agreements with Russia, I prefer to rely on powerful means at my disposal. Though he hinted at what he intended to do with his powerful means, he did not disclose his plans to his partner. These, however, were sufficiently far along to enable the chief of the army general staff, who was responsible for working out the details, to present them to the supreme commander at a meeting in Berlin a fortnight later. This war conference, attended by the top generals of OKW and of Army High Command, OKH, lasted from noon until 6 p.m. on February 3rd. And though General Halder, who outlined the Army General Staff's plans, contended later in his book that he and Braukic raised doubts about their own assessment of Soviet military strength and in general opposed Barbarossa as an adventure, there is not a word in his own diary entry made the same evening or in the highly secret OKW memorandum of the meeting that supports this contention. Indeed, they disclose Holder to have made at first a business-like estimate of the opposing forces, calculating that while the enemy would have approximately 155 divisions, German strength would be about the same, and as Holder reported, far superior in quality. Later, when catastrophe set in, 
Alder and his fellow generals realized that their intelligence on the Red Army had been fantastically faulty. But on February 3, 1941, they did not suspect that. In fact, so convincing was Halder's report on respective strengths and on the strategy to be employed to annihilate the Red Armies, that Hitler at the end not only expressed agreement on the whole, but was so excited by the prospects which the general staff chief had raised, that he exclaimed, When Barbarossa commences, the world will hold its breath and make no comment. He could scarcely wait for it to commence. Impatiently, he ordered the operation map and the plan of deployment of forces to be sent to him as soon as possible. The strategy was essentially that laid down in Directive No. 21 of December 18, 1940. Again in comments to Brauchitsch and Halder, Hitler emphasized the importance of wiping out large sections of the enemy instead of forcing them to retreat, and he stressed that the main aim is to gain possession of the Baltic states and Leningrad. Balkan Prelude Before Barbarossa could get underway in the spring, the southern flank, which lay in the Balkans, had to be secured and built up. By the third week in February 1941, the Germans had massed a formidable army of 680,000 troops in Romania, which bordered the Ukraine for 300 miles between the Polish border and the Black Sea. But to the south, Greece still held the Italians at bay, and Berlin had reason to believe that British troops from Libya would soon be landed there. Hitler, as the minutes of his numerous conferences at this period make clear, feared that an Allied front above Salonika might be formed, which would be more troublesome to Germany than a similar one had been in the First World War, since it would give the British a base from which to bomb the Romanian oil fields. Moreover, it would jeopardize Barbarossa. In fact, the danger had been foreseen as far back as December 1940, when the first directive for Operation Marita had been issued, providing for a strong German attack on Greece through Bulgaria with troops assembled in Romania. Bulgaria, whose wrong guess as to the victors in the First War had cost her dearly, now made a similar miscalculation. Believing Hitler's assurances that he had already won the war and bedazzled by the prospect of obtaining Greek territory to the south, which would give her access to the Aegean Sea, her government agreed to participate in Merida, at least to the extent of allowing passage of German troops. An agreement to this effect was made secretly on February 8, 1941, between Field Marshal Liszt and the Bulgarian General Staff. On the night of February 28th, German army units crossed the Danube from Romania and took up strategic positions in Bulgaria, which the next day joined the Tripartite Pact. The hardier Yugoslavs were not quite so accommodating, but their stubbornness only spurred on the Germans to bring them into camp, too. On March 4th to 5th, the regent, Prince Paul, was summoned in great secrecy to the Berghof by the Fuhrer, given the usual threats, and in addition offered the bribe of Salonika. On March 25th, the Yugoslav Premier, Dragisha Cvetkovic, and Foreign Minister Alexander Sinkar Markovic, having slipped surreptitiously out of Belgrade the night before to avoid hostile demonstrations or even kidnapping, arrived at Vienna, where in the presence of Hitler and Ribbentrop they signed up Yugoslavia to the Tripartite Pact. Hitler was highly pleased and told Chano that this would facilitate his attack on Greece. Before leaving Vienna, the Yugoslav leaders were given two letters from Ribbentrop confirming Germany's determination to respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Yugoslavia at all times, and promising that the Axis would not demand transit rights for its troops across Yugoslavia during this war. Both agreements were broken by Hitler in what even for him was record time. The Yugoslav ministers had no sooner returned to Belgrade than they, the government, and the prince regent were overthrown on the night of March 26th to 27th by a popular uprising led by a number of top Air Force officers and supported by most of the army. The youthful heir to the throne, Peter, who had escaped from the surveillance of regency officials by sliding down a rain pipe, was declared king and though the new regime of General Dushan Simovich immediately offered to sign a non-aggression pact with Germany, it was obvious in Berlin that it would not accept the puppet status for Yugoslavia which the Fuhrer had assigned. 
During the delirious celebrations in Belgrade, in which a crowd spat on the German minister's car, the Serbs had shown where their sympathies lay. The coup in Belgrade threw Adolf Hitler into one of the wildest rages of his entire life. He took it as a personal affront, and in his fury made sudden decisions which would prove utterly disastrous to the fortunes of the Third Reich. He hurriedly summoned his military chieftains to the Chancellery in Berlin on March 27th, the meeting was so hastily called that Braukic, Halder, and Ribbentrop arrived late, and raged about the revenge he would take on the Yugoslavs. The Belgrade coup, he said, had endangered both Marita and, even more, Barbarossa. He was therefore determined, without waiting for possible declarations of loyalty of the new government, to destroy Yugoslavia militarily and as a nation. No diplomatic inquiries will be made, he ordered, and no ultimatums presented. Yugoslavia, he added, would be crushed with unmerciful harshness. He ordered Goering then and there to destroy Belgrade in attacks by waves, with bombers operating from Hungarian air bases. He issued Directive Number 25 for the immediate invasion of Yugoslavia, and told Keitel and Yodel to work out that very evening the military plans. He instructed Ribbentrop to advise Hungary, Romania, and Italy that they would all get a slice of Yugoslavia, which would be divided up among them, except for a small Croatian puppet state. The war against Yugoslavia should be very popular in Italy, Hungary, and Bulgaria, Hitler sneered. He said he would give the Banat to Hungary, Macedonia to Bulgaria, and the Adriatic coast to Italy. And then, according to an underlined passage in the top-secret OKW notes of the meeting, Hitler announced the most fateful decision of all. The beginning of the Barbarossa operation, he told his generals, will have to be postponed up to four weeks. It had originally been set for May 15th in the first Barbarossa Directive of December 18th, 1940. This postponement of the attack on Russia in order that the Nazi warlord might vent his personal spite against a small Balkan country which had dared to defy him was probably the most catastrophic single decision in Hitler's career. It is hardly too much to say that by making it that March afternoon in the Chancellery in Berlin during a moment of convulsive rage, he tossed away his last golden opportunity to win the war and to make of the Third Reich, which he had created with such stunning, if barbarous genius, the greatest empire in German history, and himself the master of Europe. Field Marshal von Brauchitsch, the commander-in-chief of the German army, and General Halder, the gifted chief of the general staff, were to recall it with deep bitterness, but also with more understanding of its consequences than they showed at the moment of its making, when later the deep snow and sub-zero temperatures of Russia hit them three or four weeks short of what they thought they needed for final victory. Forever afterward they and their fellow generals would blame that hasty, ill-advised decision of a vain and infuriated man for all the disasters that ensued. Military Directive Number 25, which the Supreme Commander issued to his generals before the meeting broke up, was a typical Hitlerian document. The military putsch in Yugoslavia has altered the political situation in the Balkans. Yugoslavia, in spite of her protestations of loyalty, must be considered for the time being as an enemy, and therefore crushed as speedily as possible. It is my intention to force my way into Yugoslavia and to annihilate the Yugoslav army. Yodel, as chief of the operations staff of OKW, was told to prepare the plans that very night. I worked the whole night at the Reich Chancellery, Yodel later told the Nuremberg Tribunal. At four o'clock in the morning of March 28th, I put an aid memoir into the hand of General von Rintelen, our liaison officer with the Italian High Command. For Mussolini, whose sagging armies in Albania were in danger of being taken in the rear by the Yugoslavs, had to be told immediately of the German operational plans and asked to cooperate with them. To make sure that the Duce understood what was expected of him, and without waiting for General Yodel to concoct the military plans, Hitler dashed off a letter at midnight of the 27th and ordered it wired to Rome immediately so that it would reach Mussolini that same night. Duce, events force me to give you by this quickest means my estimation of the situation and the consequences which may result from it. From the beginning, I have regarded Yugoslavia as a dangerous factor in the controversy with Greece. For this reason, I have done everything honestly to bring Yugoslavia into our community. Unfortunately, these endeavors did not meet with success. 
Today's reports leave no doubt as to the imminent turn in the foreign policy of Yugoslavia. Therefore I have already arranged for all necessary measures with military means. Now I would cordially request you, Duce, not to undertake any further operations in Albania in the course of the next few days. I consider it necessary that you should cover and screen the most important passes from Yugoslavia into Albania with all available forces. I also consider it necessary, Duce, that you should reinforce your forces on the Italian-Yugoslav front with all available means and with utmost speed. I also consider it necessary, Duce, that everything which we do and order be shrouded in absolute secrecy. These measures will completely lose their value should they become known. Duce, should secrecy be observed, then I have no doubt that we will both achieve a success no less than the success in Norway a year ago. This is my unshaken conviction. Accept my heartfelt and friendly greetings. Yours, Adolf Hitler. For this short-range objective, the Nazi warlord was again right in his prediction, but he seems to have had no inkling how costly his successful revenge on Yugoslavia would be in the long run. At dawn on April 6th, his armies in overwhelming strength fell on Yugoslavia and Greece, smashing across the frontiers of Bulgaria, Hungary, and Germany itself with all their armor, and advancing rapidly against poorly armed defenders dazed by the usual preliminary bombing from the Luftwaffe. Belgrade itself, as Hitler ordered, was razed to the ground. For three successive days and nights, Goering's bombers ranged over the little capital at rooftop level, for the city had no anti-aircraft guns, killing 17,000 civilians, wounding many more and reducing the place to a mass of smoldering rubble. Operation Punishment, Hitler called it, and he obviously was satisfied that his commands had been so effectively carried out. The Yugoslavs, who had not had time to mobilize their tough little army and whose general staff made the mistake of trying to defend the whole country, were overwhelmed. On April 13th, German and Hungarian troops entered what was left of Belgrade, and on the 17th, the remnants of the Yugoslav army, still 28 divisions strong, surrendered at Sarajevo, the king and the prime minister escaping by plane to Greece. The Greeks, who had humiliated the Italians in six months of fighting, could not stand up to Field Marshal List's 12th Army of 15 divisions, four of which were armored. The British had hurriedly sent to Greece some four divisions from Libya, 53,000 men in all, but they, like the Greeks, were overwhelmed by the German panzers and by the murderous strikes of the Luftwaffe. The northern Greek armies surrendered to the Germans and, bitter pill, to the Italians on April 23rd. Four days later, Nazi tanks rattled into Athens and hoisted the swastika over the Acropolis. By this time, the British were desperately trying once again to evacuate their troops by sea. A minor Dunkirk, and almost as successful. By the end of April, in three weeks, it was all over except for Crete, which was taken by the Germans from the British in an airborne assault toward the end of May. Where Mussolini had failed so miserably all winter, Hitler had succeeded in a few days in the spring. Though the Duce was relieved to be pulled off the hook, he was humiliated that it had to be done by the Germans. Nor were his feelings assuaged by Italy's disappointing share in the Yugoslav spoils, which Hitler now began to divide up. On April 12, 1941, six days after the launching of his attack, Hitler issued a secret directive dividing up Yugoslavia among Germany, Italy, Hungary, and Bulgaria. Croatia was created as an autonomous puppet state. The Führer helped himself liberally, Germany taking territory contiguous to the old Austria and keeping under its occupation all of old Serbia as well as the copper and coal mining districts. Italy's grab was left somewhat vague, but it did not amount to much. The Balkans were not the only place where the Führer pulled his muddling junior partner off the hook. After the annihilation of the Italian armies in Libya, Hitler, although reluctantly, had finally consented to sending a light armored division and some Luftwaffe units to North Africa, where he arranged for General Erwin Rommel to be in overall command of the Italo-German forces. Rommel, a dashing, resourceful tank officer who had distinguished himself as commander of a panzer division in the Battle of France, was a type of general whom the British had not previously met in the North African desert, and he was to prove an immense problem to them for two years. But he was not the only problem. The sizable army and air force which the British had sent to Greece from Libya had greatly weakened them in the desert. At first they were not unduly worried, not even after their intelligence reported the arrival of German armored units in Tripolitania 
at the end of February. But they should have been. Rommel, with his German panzer division and two Italian divisions, one of which was armored, struck suddenly at Cyrenaica on the last day of March. In twelve days he recaptured the province, invested Tobruk, and reached Bardia, a few miles from the Egyptian border. The entire British position in Egypt and the Suez was again threatened. In fact, with the Germans and Italians in Greece, the British hold on the eastern Mediterranean had become gravely endangered. Another spring, the second of the war, had brought more dazzling German victories, and the predicament of Britain, which now held out alone, battered at home by nightly Luftwaffe bombings, its armies overseas chased out of Greece and Cyrenaica, seemed darker and more hopeless than ever before. Its prestige, so important in a life-and-death struggle where propaganda was so potent a weapon, especially in influencing the United States and Russia, had sunk to a new low point. Charles A. Lindbergh, the hero flyer, who had seemed to this writer to have fallen with startling naivete during his visits to Germany to Nazi propaganda boasts, was already consigning Britain to defeat in his speeches to large and enthusiastic audiences in America. On April 23, 1941, at the moment of the Nazi victories in the Balkans and North Africa, he addressed 30,000 persons in New York at the first mass meeting of the newly formed America First Committee. The British government, he said, has one last desperate plan, to persuade us to send another American expeditionary force to Europe and to share with England militarily as well as financially the fiasco of this war. He condemned England for having encouraged the smaller nations of Europe to fight against hopeless odds. Apparently it did not occur to this man that Yugoslavia and Greece, which Hitler had just crushed, were brutally attacked without provocation and that they had instinctively tried to defend themselves because they had a sense of honor and because they had courage even in the face of hopeless odds. On April 28th, Lindbergh resigned his commission as a colonel in the U.S. Army Air Corps Reserve after President Roosevelt on the 25th had publicly branded him as a defeatist and an appeaser. The Secretary of War accepted the resignation. Hitler was not slow or backward in taking advantage of this in a victory speech to the Reichstag in Berlin on May 4th. It consisted mostly of a venomous and sarcastic personal attack on Churchill as the instigator, along with the Jews, of the war, and as the man who was masterminding the losing of it. He is the most bloodthirsty or amateurish strategist in history. For over five years this man has been chasing around Europe like a madman in search of something that he could set on fire. As a soldier, he is a bad politician, and as a politician, an equally bad soldier. The gift Mr. Churchill possesses is the gift to lie with a pious expression on his face and to distort the truth until finally glorious victories are made of the most terrible defeats. Churchill, one of the most hopeless dabblers in strategy, thus managed, in Yugoslavia and Greece, to lose two theaters of war at one single blow. In any other country, he would be court-martialed. His abnormal state of mind can only be explained as symptomatic either of a paralytic disease or of a drunkard's ravings. As to the Yugoslavian coup which had provoked him to such fury, Hitler made no attempt to hide his true feelings. We were all stunned by that coup, carried through by a handful of bribed conspirators. You will understand, gentlemen, that when I heard this I at once gave orders to attack Yugoslavia. To treat the German Reich in this way is impossible. Arrogant though he was over his spring victories, and especially those over the British, Hitler did not fully realize what a blow they had been to Britain, nor how desperate was the predicament of the empire. On the very day he was addressing the Reichstag, Churchill was writing President Roosevelt about the grave consequences of the loss of Egypt and the Middle East, and pleading for America to enter the war. The Prime Minister was in one of the darkest moods he was to know throughout the war. I adjure you, Mr. President, he wrote, not to underestimate the gravity of the consequences which may follow from a Middle East collapse. The German Navy urged the Fuhrer to make the most of this situation. To further improve matters for the Axis, the newly appointed Premier of Iraq, Rashid Ali, who was pro-German, had led an attack against the British air base of Habaniya, outside Baghdad, and appealed to Hitler for aid in driving the British out of the country. This was at the beginning of May. With Crete conquered by May 27th, Admiral Raider, who had always been lukewarm to Barbarossa, 
appealed to Hitler on May 30th to prepare a decisive offensive against Egypt and Suez. And Rommel, eager to continue his advance as soon as he had received reinforcements, sent similar pleas from North Africa. This stroke, Raider told the Fuhrer, would be more deadly to the British Empire than the capture of London. A week later, the Admiral handed Hitler a memorandum prepared by the Operations Division of the Naval War Staff, which warned that, while Barbarossa naturally stands in the foreground of the OKW leadership, it must under no circumstances lead to the abandonment of, or to delay in, the conduct of the war in the Mediterranean. But the Fuhrer already had made up his mind. In fact, he had not changed it since the Christmas holidays, when he had promulgated Barbarossa and told Admiral Rader that Russia must be eliminated first. His landlocked mind simply did not comprehend the larger strategy advocated by the Navy. Even before Raider and the naval staff pleaded with him at the end of May, he laid down the law in Directive No. 30, issued on May 25th. He ordered a military mission, a few planes and some arms, to be dispatched to Baghdad to help Iraq. I've decided, he said, to encourage developments in the Middle East by supporting Iraq. But he saw no further than this small, inadequate step. As for the larger, bold strategy championed by the admirals and Rommel, he declared, whether, and if so, by what means it would be possible afterward to launch an offensive against the Suez Canal and eventually oust the British finally from their position between the Mediterranean and the Persian Gulf, cannot be decided until Operation Barbarossa is completed. The destruction of the Soviet Union came first. All else must wait. This, we can now see, was a staggering blunder. At this moment, the end of May 1941, Hitler, with the use of only a fraction of his forces, could have dealt the British Empire a crushing blow, perhaps a fatal one. No one realized this better than the hard-pressed Churchill. In his message to President Roosevelt on May 4th, he had admitted that, were Egypt and the Middle East to be lost, the continuation of the war would be a hard, long, and bleak proposition, even if the United States entered the conflict. But Hitler did not understand this. His blindness is all the more incomprehensible because his Balkan campaign had delayed the commencement of Barbarossa by several weeks and thereby jeopardized it. The conquest of Russia would have to be accomplished in a shorter space of time than originally planned. For there was an inexorable deadline, the Russian winter, which had defeated Charles XII and Napoleon. That gave the Germans only six months to overrun, before the onset of winter, an immense country that had never been conquered from the West and though June had arrived, the vast army which had been turned southeast into Yugoslavia and Greece had to be brought back great distances to the Soviet frontier, over unpaved roads and run-down single-track railway lines that were woefully inadequate to handle so swarming a traffic. The delay, as things turned out, was fatal. Defenders of Hitler's military genius have contended that the Balkan campaign did not set back the timetable for Barbarossa appreciably, and that in any case the postponement was largely due to the late thaw that year, which left the roads in Eastern Europe deep in mud until mid-June. But the testimony of the key German generals is otherwise. Field Marshal Friedrich Paulus, whose name will always be associated with Stalingrad, and who at this time was the chief planner of the Russian campaign on the Army General Staff, testified on the stand at Nuremberg that, Hitler's decision to destroy Yugoslavia postponed the beginning of Barbarossa by about five weeks. The naval war diary gives the same length of time. Field Marshal von Rundstedt, who led army groups south in Russia, told Allied interrogators after the war that because of the Balkan campaign, we began at least four weeks late. That, he added, was a very costly delay. At any rate, on April 30th, when his armies had completed their conquest of Yugoslavia and Greece, Hitler set the new date for Barbarossa. It was to begin on June 22, 1941. The Planning of the Terror No holds were to be barred in the taking of Russia. Hitler insisted that the generals understand this very clearly. Early in March 1941, he convoked the chiefs of the three armed services and the key army field commanders and laid down the law. Halder took down his words. The war against Russia, Hitler said, will be such that it cannot be conducted in a knightly fashion. This struggle is one of ideologies and racial differences, and will have to be conducted with unprecedented, unmerciful, and unrelenting harshness. 
all officers will have to rid themselves of obsolete ideologies. I know that the necessity for such means of waging war is beyond the comprehension of you generals, but I insist absolutely that my orders be executed without contradiction. The commissars are the bearers of ideologies directly opposed to National Socialism. Therefore the commissars will be liquidated. German soldiers guilty of breaking international law will be excused. Russia has not participated in the Hague Convention, and therefore has no rights under it. Thus was the so-called Commissar Order issued. It was to be much discussed at the Nuremberg trial when the great moral question was posed to the German generals whether they should have obeyed the orders of the Fuhrer to commit war crimes or obeyed their own consciences. It was the first time I found myself involved in a conflict between my soldierly conceptions and my duty to obey, Field Marshal von Manstein declared on the stand at Nuremberg in discussing the Commissar Order. Actually, I ought to have obeyed, but I said to myself that as a soldier I could not possibly cooperate in a thing like that. I told the commander of the army group under which I served at that time that I would not carry out such an order, which was against the honor of a soldier. As a matter of record, the order, of course, was carried out on a large scale. According to Halder, as he later remembered it, the generals were outraged at this order, and as soon as the meeting was over, protested to their commander-in-chief, Braukic. This spineless field marshal, a man of straw, Hitler later called him, Hitler's Secret Conversations, page 153, promised that he would fight against this order in the form it was given. Later, Halder swears, Braukic informed OKW in writing that the officers of the army could never execute such orders. But did he? In his testimony on direct examination at Nuremberg, Braukic admitted that he took no such action with Hitler because nothing in the world could change his attitude. What the head of the army did, he told the tribunal, was to issue a written order that discipline in the army was to be strictly observed along the lines and regulations that applied in the past. You did not give any order directly referring to the Commissar Order, Lord Justice Lawrence, the peppery president of the tribunal, asked Braukic. No, he replied, I could not rescind the order directly. The old line army officers, with their Prussian traditions, were given further occasion to struggle with their consciences by subsequent directives issued in the name of the Fuhrer by General Keitel on May 13th. The principal one limited the functions of German courts martial. They were to give way to a more primitive form of law. Punishable offenses committed by enemy civilians in Russia do not until further notice come any longer under the jurisdiction of the courts martial. Persons suspected of criminal action will be brought at once before an officer. This officer will decide whether they are to be shot. With regard to offenses committed against enemy civilians by members of the Wehrmacht, prosecution is not obligatory even where the deed is at the same time a military crime or offense. The army was told to go easy on such offenders, remembering in each case all the harm done to Germany since 1918 by the Bolsheviki. Courts martial of German soldiers would be justified only if maintenance of discipline or security of the forces call for such a measure. At any rate, the directive concluded, only those court sentences are confirmed which are in accordance with the political intentions of the high command. The directive was to be treated as most secret. On July 27, 1941, Keitel ordered all copies of this directive of May 13 concerning courts martial destroyed, though the validity of the directive, he stipulated, is not affected by the destruction of the copies. The July 27th order, he added, would itself be destroyed. But copies of both survived and turned up at Nuremberg to haunt the high command. Four days before, on July 23rd, Keitel had issued another order marked Top Secret. On July 22nd, the Fuhrer, after receiving the commander of the army, Raukic, issued the following order. In view of the vast size of the occupied areas in the east, the forces available for establishing security will be sufficient only if all resistance is punished not by legal prosecution of the guilty, but by the spreading of such terror by the occupying forces as is alone appropriate to eradicate every inclination to resist amongst the population. A second directive of the same date signed by Keitel on behalf of Hitler entrusted Himmler with special tasks for the preparation of the political administration in Russia. 
tasks, it said, which result from the struggle which has to be carried out between two opposing political systems. The Nazi secret police sadist was delegated to act independently of the army, under his own responsibility. The generals well knew what the designation of Himmler for special tasks meant, though they denied that they did when they took the stand at Nuremberg. Furthermore, the directive said, the occupied areas in Russia were to be sealed off while Himmler went to work. Not even the highest personalities of the government and party, Hitler stipulated, were to be allowed to have a look. The same directive named Goering for the exploitation of the country and the securing of its economic assets for use by German industry. Incidentally, Hitler also declared in this order that as soon as military operations were concluded, Russia would be divided up into individual states with governments of their own. Just how this would be done was to be worked out by Alfred Rosenberg, the befuddled Balt and officially the leading Nazi thinker, who had been, as we have seen, one of Hitler's early mentors in the Munich days. On April 20th, the Führer appointed him Commissioner for the Central Control of Questions Connected with the East European Region. And immediately this Nazi dolt, with a positive genius for misunderstanding history, even the history of Russia, where he was born and educated, went to work to build his castles in his once native land. Rosenberg's voluminous files were captured intact. Like his books, they make dreary reading and will not be allowed to impede this narrative, though occasionally they must be referred to because they disclose some of Hitler's plans for Russia. By early May, Rosenberg had drawn up his first wordy blueprint for what promised to be the greatest German conquest in history. To begin with, European Russia was to be divided up into so-called Reich Commissariats. Russian Poland would become a German protectorate called Ostland. The Ukraine, an independent state in alliance with Germany, Caucasia, with its rich oil fields, would be ruled by a German plenipotentiary, and the three Baltic states and White Russia would form a German protectorate preparatory to being annexed outright to the Greater German Reich. This last feat, Rosenberg explained in one of the endless memoranda which he showered on Hitler and the generals, in order, as he said, to elucidate the historical and racial conditions for his decisions, would be accomplished by Germanizing the racially assimilable Balts and banishing the undesirable elements. In Latvia and Estonia, he cautioned, banishment on a large scale will have to be envisaged. Those driven out would be replaced by Germans, preferably war veterans. The Baltic Sea, he ordained, must become a Germanic inland sea. Two days before the troops jumped off, Rosenberg addressed his closest collaborators who were to take over the rule of Russia. The job of feeding the German people, he said, stands at the top of the list of Germany's claims on the east. The southern Russian territories will have to serve for the feeding of the German people. We see absolutely no reason for any obligation on our part to feed also the Russian people with the products of that surplus territory. We know that this is a harsh necessity, bare of any feelings. The future will hold very hard years in store for the Russians. Very hard years indeed, since the Germans were deliberately planning to starve to death millions of them. Goering, who had been placed in charge of the economic exploitation of the Soviet Union, made this even clearer than Rosenberg did. In a long directive of May 23, 1941, his economic staff, East, laid it down that the surplus food from Russia's Black Earth Belt in the South must not be diverted to the people in the industrial areas, where in any case the industries would be destroyed. The workers and their families in these regions would simply be left to starve, or if they could, to emigrate to Siberia. Russia's great food production must go to the Germans. The German administration in these territories, the directive declared, may well attempt to mitigate the consequences of the famine, which undoubtedly will take place, and to accelerate the return to primitive agricultural conditions. However, these measures will not avert famine. Any attempt to save the population there from death by starvation by importing surpluses from the black soil zone, would be at the expense of supplies to Europe. It would reduce Germany's staying power in the war and would undermine Germany's and Europe's power to resist the blockade. This must be clearly and absolutely understood. How many Russian civilians would die as the result of this deliberate German policy? A meeting of state secretaries on May 2nd had already given a general answer. There is no doubt, a secret memorandum of the conference declared, 
that as a result many millions of persons will be starved to death if we take out of the country the things necessary for us. And Goering had said, and Rosenberg, that they would be taken out. That much had to be clearly and absolutely understood. Did any German, even one single German, protest against this planned ruthlessness, this well-thought-out scheme to put millions of human beings to death by starvation? In all the memoranda concerning the German directives for the spoliation of Russia, there is no mention of anyone's objecting, as at least some of the generals did in regard to the Commissar order. These plans were not merely wild and evil fantasies of distorted minds and souls of men such as Hitler, Goering, Himmler, and Rosenberg. For weeks and months, it is evident from the records, hundreds of German officials toiled away at their desks in the cheerful light of the warm spring days, adding up figures and composing memoranda which coldly calculated the massacre of millions, by starvation in this case. Heinrich Himmler, the mild-faced ex-chicken farmer, also sat at his desk at SS headquarters in Berlin those days, gazing through his pince-nez at plans for the massacre of other millions in a quicker and more violent way. Well pleased with the labors of his busy minions, both military and civilian, in planning the onslaught on the Soviet Union, her destruction, her exploitation, and the mass murder of her citizenry, Hitler on April 30th set the date for the attack, June 22nd, made his victory speech in the Reichstag on May 4th, and then retired to his favorite haunt, the Berghof above Berchtesgaden, where he could gaze at the splendor of the Alpine mountains, their peaks still covered with spring snow, and contemplate his next conquest, the greatest of all, at which, as he had told his generals, the world would hold its breath. It was here on the night of Saturday, May 10, 1941, that he received strange and unexpected news which shook him to the bone, and forced him, as it did almost everyone else in the Western world, to take his mind for the moment off the war. His closest personal confidant, the deputy leader of the Nazi party, the second in line to succeed him after Goering, the man who had been his devoted and fanatically loyal follower since 1921, and since Röhm's murder, the nearest there was to a friend, had literally flown the coop and on his own gone to parley with the enemy. The Flight of Rudolf Hess The first report late that evening of May 10th, that Rudolf Hess had taken off alone for Scotland in a Messerschmitt 110 fighter plane, hit Hitler, as Dr. Schmidt recalled, as though a bomb had struck the Berghof. General Keitel found the Fuhrer pacing up and down his spacious study, pointing a finger at his forehead and mumbling that Hess must have been crazy. I've got to talk to Goering right away, Hitler shouted. The next morning there was an agitated powwow with Goering and all the party Gauleiter as they sought to figure out, the words are Keitel's, how to present this embarrassing event to the German public and to the world. Their task was not made easier, Keitel later testified, by the British at first keeping silent about their visitor, and for a time Hitler and his conferees hoped that perhaps Hess had run out of gasoline and fallen into the chilly North Sea and drowned. The Führer's first information had come in a somewhat incoherent letter from Hess, which was delivered by courier a few hours after he took off at 5.45 p.m. on May 10th from Augsburg. I can't recognize Hess in it. It's a different person. Something must have happened to him. Some mental disturbance, Hitler told Keitel. But the Führer was also suspicious. Messerschmitt, from whose company airfield Hess had taken off, was ordered arrested, as were dozens of men on the deputy leader's staff. If Hitler was mystified by Hess's abrupt departure, so was Churchill by his unexpected arrival. Churchill has graphically described how he received the news late that Saturday night while visiting in the country, and how at first he thought it too fantastic to believe. The Grand Alliance, pages 50 to 55. Stalin was highly suspicious. For the duration of the war, the bizarre incident remained a mystery, and it was cleared up only at the Nuremberg trial, in which Hess was one of the defendants. The facts may be briefly set down. Hess, always a muddled man, though not so doltish as Rosenberg, flew on his own to Britain under the delusion that he could arrange a peace settlement. Though deluded, he was sincere, there seems to be no reason to doubt that. He had met the Duke of Hamilton at the Olympic Games in Berlin in 1936, and it was within twelve miles of the Duke's home in Scotland, 
So efficient was his navigation that he bailed out of his Messerschmitt, parachuted safely to the ground, and asked a farmer to take him to the Scottish Lord. As it happened, Hamilton, a wing commander in the RAF, was on duty that Saturday evening at a sector operations room, and had spotted the Messerschmitt plane off the coast as it came in to make a landfall shortly after 10 p.m. An hour later it was reported to him that the plane had crashed in flames, that the pilot, who had bailed out and who gave his name as Alfred Horn, had claimed to be on a special mission to see the Duke of Hamilton. This meeting was arranged by British authorities for the next morning. To the Duke, Hess explained that he was on a mission of humanity, and that the Fuhrer did not want to defeat England and wished to stop the fighting. The fact, Hess said, that this was his fourth attempt to fly to Britain, on the other three tries he had had to turn back because of weather, and that he was, after all, a Reich cabinet minister, showed his sincerity and Germany's willingness for peace. In this interview, as in later ones with others, Hess was not backward in asserting that Germany would win the war, and that if it continued the plight of the British would be terrible. Therefore his hosts had better take advantage of his presence and negotiate peace. So confident was this Nazi fanatic that the British would sit down and parley with him, that he asked the Duke to request the King to give him parole, as he had come unarmed and of his own free will. Later he demanded that he be treated with the respect due to a cabinet member. The subsequent talks, with one exception, were conducted on the British side by Yvonne Kirkpatrick, the knowing former First Secretary of the British Embassy in Berlin, whose confidential reports were later made available at Nuremberg. To this sophisticated student of Nazi Germany, Hess, after parroting Hitler's explanations of all the Nazi aggressions, from Austria to Scandinavia and the Lowlands, and having insisted that Britain was responsible for the war and would certainly lose it if she didn't bring a stop to it now, divulged his proposals for peace. They were none other than those which Hitler had urged on Chamberlain, unsuccessfully, on the eve of his attack on Poland, namely, that Britain should give Germany a free hand in Europe in return for Germany's giving Britain a completely free hand in the empire. The former German colonies would have to be returned, and, of course, Britain would have to make peace with Italy. Finally, as we were leaving the room, Kirkpatrick reported, Hess delivered a parting shot. He had forgotten, he declared, to emphasize that the proposal could only be considered on the understanding that it was negotiated by Germany with an English government other than the present one. Mr. Churchill, who had planned the war since 1936, and his colleagues who had lent themselves to his war policy, were not persons with whom the Fuhrer could negotiate. For a German who had got so far in the jungle warfare within the Nazi party and then within the Third Reich, Rudolf Hess, as all who knew him could testify, was singularly naive. He had expected, it is evident from the record of these interviews, to be received immediately as a serious negotiator, if not by Churchill, then by the opposition party, of which he thought the Duke of Hamilton was one of the leaders. When his contacts with British officialdom continued to be restricted to Kirkpatrick, he grew bellicose and threatening. At an interview on May 14th, he pictured to the skeptical diplomat the dire consequences to Britain if she continued the war. There would soon be, he said, a terrible and absolutely complete blockade of the British Isles. It was fruitless, Kirkpatrick was told by Hess, for anyone here to imagine that England could capitulate and that the war could be waged from the Empire. It was Hitler's intention, in such an eventuality, to continue the blockade of England, so that we would have to face the deliberate starvation of the population of these islands. Hess urged that the conversations, which he had risked so much to bring about, get underway at once. His own flight, as explained to Kirkpatrick, was intended to give us a chance of opening conversations without loss of prestige. If we rejected this chance, it would be clear proof that we desire no understanding with Germany, and Hitler would be entitled, in fact, it would be his duty, to destroy us utterly and to keep us after the war in a state of permanent subjection. Hess insisted that the number of negotiators be kept small. As a Reich minister, he could not place himself in the position of being a lone individual subjected to a crossfire of comment and questions from a large number of persons. On this ridiculous note, the conversations ended, so far as Kirkpatrick was concerned, but, surprisingly, the British cabinet, according to Churchill, 
invited Lord Simon to interview Hess on June 10th. According to the Nazi deputy leader's lawyer at Nuremberg, Simon promised that he would bring Hess's peace proposals to the attention of the British government. At Nuremberg, Hess told the tribunal that Lord Simon had introduced himself to him as Dr. Guthrie and had declared, I come with the authority of the government, and I shall be willing to discuss with you as far as seems good anything you would wish to state for the information of the government. Hess's motives are clear. He sincerely wanted peace with Britain. He had not the shadow of doubt that Germany would win the war and destroy the United Kingdom unless peace were concluded at once. There were, to be sure, other motives. The war had brought his personal eclipse. Running the Nazi party as Hitler's deputy during the war was dull business and no longer very important. What mattered in Germany now was running the war and foreign affairs. These were the things which engaged the attention of the Fuhrer to the exclusion of almost all else and which put the limelight on Goering, Ribbentrop, Himmler, Goebbels, and the generals. Hess felt frustrated and jealous. How better restore his old position with his beloved leader and in the country than by pulling off a brilliant and daring stroke of statesmanship such as single-handedly arranging peace between Germany and Britain? Finally, the beetle-browed deputy leader, like some of the other Nazi bigwigs, Hitler himself and Himmler, had come to have an abiding belief in astrology. At Nuremberg he confided to the American prison psychiatrist, Dr. Douglas M. Kelly, that late in 1940 one of his astrologers had read in the stars that he was ordained to bring about peace. He also related how his old mentor, Professor Haushofer, the Munich Gale politiker, had seen him in a dream striding through the tapestried halls of English castles, bringing peace between the two great Nordic nations. For a man who had never escaped from mental adolescence, this was heady stuff and no doubt helped impel Hess to undertake his weird mission to England. At Nuremberg, one of the British prosecutors suggested still another reason, that Hess flew to England to try to arrange a peace settlement so that Germany would have only a one-front war to fight when she attacked the Soviet Union. The Russian prosecutor told the tribunal that he was sure of it, and so was Joseph Stalin whose mighty suspicions at this critical time seem to have been concentrated not on Germany, as they should have been, but on Great Britain. The arrival of Hess in Scotland convinced him that there was some deep plot being hatched between Churchill and Hitler which would give Germany the same freedom to strike the Soviet Union, which the Russian dictator had given her to assault Poland and the West. When three years later the British Prime Minister, then on his second visit to Moscow, tried to convince Stalin of the truth, he simply did not believe it. It is fairly clear from the interrogations conducted by Kirkpatrick, who tried to draw the Nazi leader out on Hitler's intentions regarding Russia, that either Hess did not know of Barbarossa, or if he did, did not know that it was imminent. The days following Hess's sudden departure were among the most embarrassing of Hitler's life. He realized that the prestige of his regime had been severely damaged by the flight of his closest collaborator. How was it to be explained to the German people and the outside world? The questioning of the arrested members of Hess's entourage convinced the Fuhrer that there had been no disloyalty toward him and certainly no plot, and that his trusted lieutenant had simply cracked up. It was decided at the Berghof, after the British had confirmed Hess's arrival, to offer this explanation to the public. Soon the German press was dutifully publishing brief accounts that this once great star of National Socialism had become a deluded, deranged, and muddled idealist, ridden with hallucinations traceable to World War I injuries. It seemed, said the official press communique, that party comrade Hess lived in a state of hallucination, as a result of which he felt he could bring about an understanding between England and Germany. This, however, will have no effect on the continuance of the war, which has been forced on the German people. Privately, Hitler gave orders to have Hess shot at once if he returned, and publicly he stripped his old comrade of all his offices, replacing him as deputy leader of the party by Martin Bormann, a more sinister and conniving character. The Fuhrer hoped that the bizarre episode would be forgotten as soon as possible. His own thoughts quickly turned again to the attack on Russia, which was not far off. Hess a sorry, broken figure at Nuremberg, where for a part of the trial he faked total amnesia, his mind had certainly been shattered, outlived Hitler. He was sentenced to life imprisonment by the International Tribunal, 
escaping the death sentence largely due to his mental collapse. I have described his appearance there in End of a Berlin Diary. The British treated him as a prisoner of war, releasing him on October 10, 1945, so that he could stand trial at Nuremberg. During his captivity in England, he complained bitterly at being denied full diplomatic privileges, which he constantly demanded, and his none-too-balanced mind began to deteriorate, and he had long stretches of amnesia. He told Dr. Kelly, however, that he twice tried to kill himself during his internment. He became convinced, he said, that the British were trying to poison him. The Plight of the Kremlin Despite all the evidence of Hitler's intentions, the build-up of German forces in eastern Poland, the presence of a million Nazi troops in the nearby Balkans, the Wehrmacht's conquest of Yugoslavia and Greece and its occupation of Romania, Bulgaria, and Hungary, the men in the Kremlin, Stalin above all, stark realists though they were reputed to be and had been, blindly hoped that Russia somehow would still escape the Nazi tyrant's wrath. Their natural suspicions, of course, could not help but feed on the bare facts, nor could their growing resentment at Hitler's moves in southeastern Europe be suppressed. There is, however, something unreal, almost unbelievable, quite grotesque, in the diplomatic exchanges between Moscow and Berlin in these spring weeks, exhaustively recorded in the captured Nazi documents, in which the Germans tried clumsily to deceive the Kremlin to the last, and the Soviet leaders seemed unable to fully grasp reality and act on it in time. Though they several times protested the entry of German troops into Romania and Bulgaria, and then the attack on Yugoslavia and Greece as a violation of the Nazi-Soviet pact and a threat to Russian security interests, the Soviets went out of their way to appease Berlin as the date for the German attack approached. Stalin personally took the lead in this. On April 13, 1941, Ambassador von der Schulenberg telegraphed an interesting dispatch to Berlin, recounting how on the departure of the Japanese foreign minister, Yosuke Matsuoka, that evening from Moscow, Stalin had shown a remarkably friendly manner, not only to the Japanese, but to the Germans. At the railroad station, Stalin publicly asked for me, Schulenberg wired, and threw his arm around my shoulders. We must remain friends, and you must now do everything to that end. Somewhat later, Stalin turned to the acting German military attaché, Colonel Krebs, first made sure that he was a German, and then said to him, We will remain friends with you, through thick and thin. Three days later, the German charge in Moscow, Tippelskirk, wired Berlin, stressing that the demonstration at the station showed Stalin's friendliness toward Germany, and that this was especially important in view of the persistently circulating rumors of an imminent conflict between Germany and the Soviet Union. The day before, Tippelskirk had informed Berlin that the Kremlin had accepted, unconditionally, after months of wrangling, the German proposals for the settlement of the border between the two countries from the Igorka River to the Baltic Sea. The compliant attitude of the Soviet government, he said, seems very remarkable. In view of what was brewing in Berlin, it surely was. In supplying blockaded Germany with important raw materials, the Soviet government continued to be equally compliant. On April 5, 1941, Schnurra, in charge of trade negotiations with Moscow, reported jubilantly to his Nazi masters that after the slowdown in Russian deliveries in January and February 1941, due to the cooling off of political relations, they had risen by leaps and bounds in March, especially in grains, petroleum, manganese ore, and the non-ferrous and precious metals. Transit traffic through Siberia, he added, is proceeding favorably as usual. At our request, the Soviet government even put a special freight train for rubber at our disposal at the Manchurian border. Six weeks later, on May 15th, Schnurra was reporting that the obliging Russians had put on several special freight trains so that 4,000 tons of badly needed raw rubber could be delivered to Germany over the Siberian railway. The quantities of raw materials contracted for are being delivered punctually by the Russians, despite the heavy burden this imposes on them. I am under the impression that we could make economic demands on Moscow which would go even beyond the scope of the Treaty of January 10th, demands designed to secure German food and raw material requirements beyond the extent now contracted for. German deliveries of machinery to Russia were falling behind, Schnurr observed, but he did not seem to mind if the Russians didn't. 
However, he was disturbed on May 15th by another factor. Great difficulties are created, he complained, by the countless rumors of an imminent German-Russian conflict, for which he blamed German official sources. Amazingly, the difficulties, Schnurre explained in a lengthy memorandum to the Foreign Office, did not come from Russia but from German industrial firms, which he said were trying to withdraw from their contracts with the Russians. Hitler, it must be noted here, was doing his best to contradict the rumors, but at the same time, he was busy trying to convince his generals and top officials that Germany was in growing danger of being attacked by Russia. Though the generals, from their own military intelligence, knew better, so hypnotic was Hitler's spell over them that even after the war, Halder, Brauchitsch, Manstein, and others, though not Paulus, who seems to have been more honest, contended that a Soviet military buildup on the Polish frontier had become very threatening by the beginning of the summer. Count von der Schulenberg, who had come home from Moscow on a brief leave, saw Hitler in Berlin on April 28th and tried to convince him of Russia's peaceful intentions. Russia, he attempted to explain, is very apprehensive at the rumors predicting a German attack on Russia. I cannot believe, he added, that Russia will ever attack Germany. If Stalin was unable to go with England and France in 1939 when both were still strong, he will certainly not make such a decision today when France is destroyed and England badly battered. On the contrary, I am convinced that Stalin is prepared to make even further concessions to us. The Fuhrer feigned skepticism. He had been forewarned, he said, by events in Serbia. What devil had possessed the Russians, he asked, to conclude the friendship pact with Yugoslavia? On April 5th, the day before the German attack on Yugoslavia, the Soviet government had hastily concluded a treaty of non-aggression and friendship with the new Yugoslav government, apparently in a frantic attempt to head off Hitler. Molotov had informed Schulenberg of it the night before, and the ambassador had exclaimed that the moment was very unfortunate, and had tried unsuccessfully to argue the Russians into at least postponing the signing of the treaty. Hitler did not believe it was true, he said, that Russia could be brought to attack Germany. Nevertheless, he concluded, he was obliged to be careful. Hitler did not tell his ambassador to the Soviet Union what plans he had in store for that country, and Schulenberg, an honest, decent German of the old school, remained ignorant of them to the last. Stalin, too, but not of the signs or the warnings of what Hitler was up to. On April 22nd, the Soviet government formally protested 80 instances of border violations by Nazi planes which it said had taken place between March 27th and April 18th, providing detailed accounts of each. In one case, it said, in a German reconnaissance plane which landed near Rovno on April 15th, there was found a camera, rolls of exposed film, and a torn topographical map of the western districts of the USSR all of which give evidence of the purpose of the crew of this airplane. Even in protesting, the Russians were conciliatory. They had given the border troops, the note said, the order not to fire on German planes flying over Soviet territory, so long as such flights do not occur frequently. Stalin made further conciliatory moves early in May. To please Hitler, he expelled the diplomatic representatives in Moscow of Belgium, Norway, Greece, and even Yugoslavia, and closed their legations. He recognized the pro-Nazi government of Rashid Ali in Iraq. He kept the Soviet press under the strictest restraint in order to avoid provoking Germany. These manifestations, Schulenberg wired Berlin on May 12th, of the intention of the Stalin government are calculated to relieve the tension between the Soviet Union and Germany and to create a better atmosphere for the future. We must bear in mind that Stalin personally has always advocated a friendly relationship between Germany and the Soviet Union. Though Stalin had long been the absolute dictator of the Soviet Union, this was the first mentioned by Schulenberg in his dispatches of the term Stalin government. There was good reason. On May 6th, Stalin had personally taken over as chairman of the Council of People's Commissars, or Prime Minister, replacing Molotov, who remained as Foreign Commissar. This was the first time the all-powerful secretary of the Communist Party had taken government office and the general world reaction was that it meant the situation had become so serious for the Soviet Union, especially in its relations with Nazi Germany, that only Stalin could deal with it as the nominal as well as the actual head of government. This interpretation was obvious, but there was another which was not so clear, but which the astute German ambassador in Moscow promptly pointed out to Berlin. 
Stalin, he reported, was displeased with the deterioration of German-Soviet relations and blamed Molotov's clumsy diplomacy for much of it. In my opinion, Schulenberg said, it may be assumed with certainty that Stalin has set himself a foreign policy goal of overwhelming importance, which he hopes to attain by his personal efforts. I firmly believe that in an international situation which he considers serious, Stalin has set himself the goal of preserving the Soviet Union from a conflict with Germany. Did the crafty Soviet dictator not realize by now, the middle of May 1941, that this was an impossible goal, that there was nothing short of an abject surrender to Hitler that he could do to attain it? He surely knew the significance of Hitler's conquest of Yugoslavia and Greece, of the presence of large masses of German troops in Romania and Hungary on his southwest borders, of the Wehrmacht buildup on his western frontier in Poland. The persistent rumors in Moscow itself surely reached him. By the beginning of May, what Schulenberg called in a dispatch on the second day of that month, rumors of an imminent German-Russian military showdown, were so rife in the Soviet capital that he and his officials in the German embassy were having difficulty in combating them. Please bear in mind, he advised Berlin, that attempts to counteract these rumors here in Moscow must necessarily remain ineffectual if such rumors incessantly reach here from Germany, and if every traveler who comes to Moscow or travels through Moscow not only brings these rumors along but can even confirm them by citing facts. The veteran ambassador was getting suspicious himself. He was instructed by Berlin to continue to deny the rumors and to spread it about that not only was there no concentration of German troops on Russia's frontiers, but that actually considerable forces, eight divisions he was told for his personal information, were being transferred from east to west. Perhaps these instructions only confirmed the ambassador's uneasiness, since by this time the press throughout the world was beginning to trumpet the German military buildup along the Soviet borders. But long before this, Stalin had received specific warnings of Hitler's plans and apparently paid no attention to them. The most serious one came from the government of the United States. Early in January 1941, the U.S. commercial attaché in Berlin, Sam E. Woods, had sent a confidential report to the State Department, stating that he had learned from trustworthy German sources that Hitler was making plans to attack Russia in the spring. It was a long and detailed message, outlining the general staff plan of attack, which proved to be quite accurate, and the preparations being made for the economic exploitation of the Soviet Union once it was conquered. Sam Woods, a genial extrovert whose grasp of world politics and history was not striking, seems to those of us who knew him and liked him the last man in the American embassy in Berlin likely to have come by such crucial intelligence. Some of his colleagues in the embassy still doubt that he did, but Cordell Hull has confirmed it in his memoirs and disclosed the details. Woods, the late Secretary of State relates, had a German friend, an anti-Nazi, who had contacts high in the ministries, the Reichsbank, and the Nazi party. As early as August 1940, this friend informed Woods of conferences taking place at Hitler's headquarters concerning preparations for an attack on the Soviet Union. From then on, this informant kept the commercial attaché au courant of what was transpiring, both at the general staff and among those planning the economic spoliation of Russia. To avoid detection, Woods met his informant in various movie houses in Berlin and in the darkness received scribbled notes from him. See the Memoirs of Cordell Hull, Volume 2, pages 967 to 968. I left Berlin in December 1940. George Kennan, the most brilliant foreign service officer at the embassy who remained there, informs me that the embassy learned from several sources of the coming attack on Russia. Two or three weeks before the assault, he says, our consul at Königsberg, Kaikendal, relayed a report specifying correctly the exact day it would begin. Secretary of State Cordell Hull thought at first that Woods had been victim of a German plant. He called in J. Edgar Hoover. The FBI head read the report and judged it authentic. Woods had named some of his sources, both in various ministries in Berlin and in the German general staff, and on being checked, they were adjudged in Washington to be men who ought to know what was up and anti-Nazi enough to tattle. Despite the strained relations then existing between the American and Soviet governments, Hull decided to inform the Russians, requesting Under Secretary of State Sumner Wells 
to communicate the substance of the report to Ambassador Konstantin Umansky. This was done on March 20th. Mr. Umansky turned very white, Wells later wrote. He was silent for a moment and then merely said, I fully realize the gravity of the message you have given me. My government will be grateful for your confidence, and I will inform it immediately of our conversation. If it was grateful, indeed, if it ever believed this timely intelligence, it never communicated any inkling to the American government. In fact, as Secretary Hull has related in his memoirs, Moscow grew more hostile and truculent because America's support of Britain made it impossible to supply Russia with all the materials it demanded. Nevertheless, according to Hull, the State Department, having received dispatches from its legations in Bucharest and Stockholm the first week in June, stating that Germany would invade Russia within a fortnight, forwarded copies of them to Ambassador Steinhardt in Moscow, who turned them over to Molotov. Churchill, too, sought to warn Stalin. On April 3rd, he asked his ambassador in Moscow, Sir Stafford Cripps, to deliver a personal note to the dictator, pointing out the significance to Russia of German troop movements in southern Poland, which he had learned of through a British agent. Cripps's delay in delivering the message still vexed Churchill when he wrote about the incident years later in his memoirs. Before the end of April, Cripps knew the date set for the German attack, and the Germans knew he knew it. On April 24th, the German naval attaché in Moscow sent a curt message to the Navy High Command in Berlin. The British ambassador predicts June 22nd as the day of the outbreak of the war. This message, which is among the captured Nazi papers, was recorded in the German naval diary on the same day, with an exclamation point added at the end. The admirals were surprised at the accuracy of the British envoy's prediction. The poor naval attaché, who, like the ambassador in Moscow, had not been let in on the secret, added in his dispatch that it was manifestly absurd. Molotov must have thought so, too. A month later, on May 22nd, he received Schulenberg to discuss various matters. He was as amiable, self-assured, and well-informed as ever, the ambassador reported to Berlin, and again emphasized that Stalin and Molotov, the two strongest men in the Soviet Union, were striving, above all, to avoid a conflict with Germany. On one point, the usually perspicacious ambassador couldn't have been more wrong. Molotov, at this juncture, was certainly not well-informed but neither was the ambassador. The extent to which the Russian foreign commissar was ill-informed was given public expression on June 14, 1941, just a week before the German blow fell. Molotov called in Schulenberg that evening and handed him the text of a TASS statement, which, he said, was being broadcast that very night and published in the newspapers the next morning. Blaming Cripps personally for the widespread rumors of an impending war between the USSR and Germany in the English and foreign press, this official statement of the Soviet government branded them as obvious absurdity, a clumsy propaganda maneuver of the forces arrayed against the Soviet Union and Germany. It added, In the opinion of Soviet circles, the rumors of the intention of Germany to launch an attack against the Soviet Union are completely without foundation. Even the recent German troop movements from the Balkans to the Soviet frontiers were explained in the communique as having no connection with Soviet-German relations. As for the rumors saying that Russia would attack Germany, they were false and provocative. The irony of the TASS communique on behalf of the Soviet government is enhanced by two German moves, one on the day of its publication, June 15th, the other on the next day. From Venice, where he was conferring with Chano, Ribbentrop sent a secret message on June 15th to Budapest warning the Hungarian government to take steps to secure its frontiers. In view of the heavy concentration of Russian troops at the German eastern border, the Führer will probably be compelled, by the beginning of July at the latest, to clarify German-Russian relations, and in this connection to make certain demands. The Germans were tipping off the Hungarians, but not their principal ally. When Chano, the next day, during a gondola ride on the canals of Venice, asked Ribbentrop about the rumors of a German attack on Russia, the Nazi foreign minister replied, Dear Chano, I cannot tell you anything as yet, because every decision is locked in the impenetrable bosom of the Fuhrer. However, one thing is certain. If we attack them, the Russia of Stalin will be erased from the map within eight weeks. 
This is from the last diary entry of Chano, made on December 23, 1943, in cell 27 of the Verona jail, a few days before he was executed. He added that the Italian government learned of the German invasion of Russia a half hour after it began. Chano Diaries, page 583. While the Kremlin was smugly preparing to broadcast to the world on June 14, 1941, that the rumors of a German attack on Russia were an obvious absurdity, Adolf Hitler that very day was having his final big war conference on Barbarossa with the leading officers of the Wehrmacht. The timetable for the massing of troops in the east and their deployment to the jumping-off positions had been put in operation on May 22nd. A revised version of the timetable was issued a few days later. It is a long and detailed document, and shows that by the beginning of June, not only were all plans for the onslaught on Russia complete, but the vast and complicated movement of troops, artillery, armor, planes, ships, and supplies was well underway and on schedule. A brief item in the Naval War Diary from May 29th states, The preparatory movements of warships for Barbarossa has begun. Talks with the general staffs of Romania, Hungary, and Finland, the last country anxious now to win back what had been taken from her by the Russians in the Winter War, were completed. On June 9th, from Berchtesgaden, Hitler sent out an order convoking the commanders-in-chief of the three armed services and the top field generals for a final all-day meeting on Barbarossa in Berlin on June 14th. Despite the enormity of the task, not only Hitler but his generals were in a confident mood as they went over last-minute details of the most gigantic military operation in history, an all-out attack on a front stretching some 1,500 miles from the Arctic Ocean at Petsamo to the Black Sea. The night before, Braukic had returned to Berlin from an inspection of the build-up in the east, Holder noted in his diary that the army commander-in-chief was highly pleased. Officers and men, he said, were in top shape and ready. This last military powwow on June 14th lasted from 11 a.m. until 6.30 p.m. It was broken by lunch at 2 p.m., at which Hitler gave his generals yet another of his fiery eve-of-the-battle pep talks. According to Holder, it was a comprehensive political speech, with Hitler stressing that he had to attack Russia because her fall would force England to give up. But the bloodthirsty Führer must have emphasized something else even more. Keitel told about it during direct examination on the stand at Nuremberg. The main theme was that this was the decisive battle between two ideologies, and that the practices which we knew as soldiers, the only correct ones under international law, had to be measured by completely different standards. Hitler thereupon, said Keitel, gave various orders for carrying out an unprecedented terror in Russia by brutal means. Did you, or did any other generals, raise objections to these orders? asked Keitel's own attorney. No, I personally made no remonstrances, the general replied. Nor did any of the other generals, he added. Hassel confirms this. Writing in his diary two days later, June 16th, he remarks, Braukic and Holder have already agreed to Hitler's tactics in Russia. Thus the army must assume the onus of the murders and burnings which up to now have been confined to the SS. At first the anti-Nazi conspirators had naively believed that Hitler's terror orders for Russia might shock the generals into joining an anti-Nazi revolt. But by June 16th, Hassel himself is disillusioned. His diary entry for that date begins... A series of conferences with Popitz, Girdler, Beck, and Oster to consider whether certain orders which the army commanders have received, but which they have not as yet issued, might suffice to open the eyes of the military leaders to the nature of the regime for which they are fighting. These orders concern brutal measures the troops are to take against the Bolsheviks when Russia is invaded. We came to the conclusion that nothing was to be hoped for now. They, the generals, delude themselves. Hopeless Sergeant Majors. The Von Hassel Diaries, pages 198 to 199. It is almost inconceivable, but nevertheless true, that the men in the Kremlin, for all the reputation they had of being suspicious, crafty, and hard-headed, and despite all the evidence and all the warnings that stared them in the face, did not realize right up to the last moment that they were to be hit, and with a force which would almost destroy their nation. At 9.30 on the pleasant summer evening of June 21, 1941, nine hours before the German attack was scheduled to begin, 
Molotov received the German ambassador at his office in the Kremlin and delivered his final fatuity, the expression is Churchill's. After mentioning further border violations by German aircraft, which he said he had instructed the Soviet ambassador in Berlin to bring to the attention of Ribbentrop, Molotov turned to another subject, which Schulenberg described in an urgent telegram to the Wilhelmstrasse that same night. There were a number of indications, Molotov had told him, that the German government was dissatisfied with the Soviet government. Rumors were even current that a war was impending between Germany and the Soviet Union. The Soviet government was unable to understand the reasons for Germany's dissatisfaction. He would appreciate it if I could tell him what had brought about the present situation in German-Soviet relations. I replied, Schulenberg added, that I could not answer his questions as I lacked the pertinent information. He was soon to get it, for on its way to him over the airwaves between Berlin and Moscow was a long coded radio message from Ribbentrop dated June 21, 1941, marked Very Urgent State Secret for the Ambassador Personally, which began, Upon receipt of this telegram, all of the cipher material still there is to be destroyed. The radio set is to be put out of commission. Please inform Herr Molotov at once that you have an urgent communication to make to him. Then please make the following declaration to him. It was a familiar declaration, strewn with all the shop-worn lies and fabrications at which Hitler and Ribbentrop had become so expert and which they had concocted so often before to justify each fresh act of unprovoked aggression. Perhaps, at least such is the impression this writer gets in rereading it, it somewhat topped all the previous ones for sheer effrontery and deceit. While Germany had loyally abided by the Nazi-Soviet pact, it said, Russia had repeatedly broken it. The USSR had practiced sabotage, terrorism, and espionage against Germany. It had combated the German attempt to set up a stable order in Europe. It had conspired with Britain for an attack against the German troops in Romania and Bulgaria. By concentrating all available Russian forces on a long front from the Baltic to the Black Sea, it had menaced the Reich. Reports received the last few days, it went on, eliminate the last remaining doubts as to the aggressive character of this Russian concentration. In addition, there are reports from England regarding the negotiations of Ambassador Cripps for still closer political and military collaboration between England and the Soviet Union. To sum up, the government of the Reich declares, therefore, that the Soviet government, contrary to the obligations it assumed, one, has not only continued but even intensified its attempts to undermine Germany and Europe, two, has adopted a more and more anti-German foreign policy, three, has concentrated all its forces in readiness at the German border. Thereby, the Soviet government has broken its treaties with Germany and is about to attack Germany from the rear in its struggle for life. The Führer has therefore ordered the German armed forces to oppose this threat with all the means at their disposal. Please do not enter into any discussion of this communication, Ribbentrop advised his ambassador at the end. What could the shaken and disillusioned Schulenberg, who had devoted the best years of his life to improving German-Russian relations and who knew that the attack on the Soviet Union was unprovoked and without justification, say? Arriving back at the Kremlin just as dawn was breaking, he contented himself with reading the German declaration. Molotov, stunned at last, listened in silence to the end, and then said, It is war. Do you believe that we deserved that? Thus ended the veteran ambassador's diplomatic career. Returning to Germany and forced to retire, he joined the opposition circle led by General Beck, Girdler, Hassel, and others and for a time was marked to become foreign minister of an anti-Hitler regime. Hassel reported Schulenberg in 1943 as being willing to cross the Russian lines in order to talk with Stalin about a negotiated peace with an anti-Nazi government in Germany. The von Hassel Diaries, pages 321 to 322. Schulenberg was arrested and imprisoned after the July 1944 plot against Hitler and executed by the Gestapo on November 10. At the same hour of daybreak, a similar scene was taking place in the Wilhelmstrasse in Berlin. All afternoon on June 21st, the Soviet ambassador, Vladimir Dekanozov, had been telephoning the foreign office asking for an appointment with Ribbentrop so that he could deliver his little protest against further border violations by German planes. He was told that the Nazi foreign minister was out of town. Then at 2 a.m. on the 22nd, he was informed that Ribbentrop would receive him at 4 a.m. at the foreign office. 
There the envoy, who had been a deputy foreign commissar, a hatchet man for Stalin and the troubleshooter who had arranged the taking over of Lithuania, received, like Molotov in Moscow, the shock of his life. Dr. Schmidt, who was present, has described the scene. I had never seen Ribbentrop so excited as he was in the five minutes before Dekanozov's arrival. He walked up and down his room like a caged animal. Dekanozov was shown in, and obviously not guessing anything was amiss, held out his hand to Ribbentrop. We sat down, and Dekanozov proceeded to put on behalf of his government certain questions that needed clarification. But he had hardly begun before Ribbentrop, with a stony expression, interrupted, saying, That's not the question now. The arrogant Nazi foreign minister thereupon explained what the question was, gave the ambassador a copy of the memorandum which Schulenberg at that moment was reading out to Molotov, and informed him that German troops were at that instant taking military countermeasures on the Soviet frontier. The startled Soviet envoy, says Schmidt, recovered his composure quickly and expressed his deep regret at the developments, for which he blamed Germany. He rose, bowed perfunctorily, and left the room without shaking hands. The Nazi-Soviet honeymoon was over. At 3.30 a.m. on June 22, 1941, a half hour before the closing diplomatic formalities in the Kremlin and the Wilhelmstrasse, the roar of Hitler's guns along hundreds of miles of front had blasted it forever. There was one other diplomatic prelude to the cannonade. On the afternoon of June 21st, Hitler sat down at his desk in his new underground headquarters, Wolfschanze, Wolf's Lair, near Rostenburg, in a gloomy forest of East Prussia, and dictated a long letter to Mussolini. As in the preparation of all his other aggressions, he had not trusted his good friend and chief ally enough to let him in on his secret until the last moment. Now, at the eleventh hour, he did. His letter is the most revealing and authentic evidence we have of the reasons for his taking this fatal step, which for so long puzzled the outside world and which was to pave the way for his end and that of the Third Reich. The letter, to be sure, is full of Hitler's customary lies and evasions, which he tried to fob off even on his friends, but beneath them and between them there emerges his fundamental reasoning and his true, if mistaken, estimate of the world situation as the summer of 1941 the second of the war, officially began. Duce, I am writing this letter to you at a moment when months of anxious deliberation and continuous nerve-wracking waiting are ending in the hardest decision of my life. The situation. England has lost this war. Like a drowning person, she grasps at every straw. Nevertheless, some of her hopes are naturally not without a certain logic. The destruction of France has directed the glances of the British warmongers continually to the place from which they tried to start the war, to Soviet Russia. Both countries, Soviet Russia and England, are equally interested in a Europe rendered prostrate by a long war. Behind these two countries stands the North American Union, goading them on. Hitler next explained that with large Soviet military forces in his rear, he could never assemble the strength particularly in the air, to make the all-out attack on Britain which would bring her down. Really, all available Russian forces are at our border. If circumstances should give me cause to employ the German air force against England, there is danger that Russia will then begin its strategy of extortion, to which I would have to yield in silence simply from a feeling of air inferiority. England will be all the less ready for peace, for it will be able to pin its hopes on the Russian partner. Indeed, this hope must naturally grow with the progress in preparedness of the Russian armed forces. And behind this is the mass delivery of war material from America, which they hope to get in 1942. I have therefore, after constantly racking my brains, finally reached the decision to cut the noose before it can be drawn tight. My overall view is now as follows. One, France is, as ever, not to be trusted. Two, North Africa itself, insofar as your colonies, Duce, are concerned, is probably out of danger until fall. Three, Spain is irresolute, and, I am afraid, will take sides only when the outcome of the war is decided. Five, an attack on Egypt before autumn is out of the question. Six, whether or not America enters the war is a matter of indifference, inasmuch as she supports our enemy with all the power she is able to mobilize. 7. 
The situation in England itself is bad. The provision of food and raw materials is growing steadily more difficult. The martial spirit to make war, after all, lives only on hopes. These hopes are based solely on two assumptions, Russia and America. We have no chance of eliminating America, but it does lie in our power to exclude Russia. The elimination of Russia means, at the same time, a tremendous relief for Japan and East Asia, and thereby the possibility of a much stronger threat to American activities through Japanese intervention. I have decided under these circumstances to put an end to the hypocritical performance in the Kremlin. Germany, Hitler said, would not need any Italian troops in Russia. He was not going to share the glory of conquering Russia any more than he had shared the conquest of France. But Italy, he declared, could give decisive aid by strengthening its forces in North Africa and by preparing to march into France in case of a French violation of the treaty. This was a fine bait for the land-hungry Duce. So far as the air war on England is concerned, we shall for a time remain on the defensive. As for the war in the East, Duce, it will surely be difficult, but I do not entertain a second's doubt as to its great success. I hope above all that it will then be possible for us to secure a common food supply base in the Ukraine, which will furnish us such additional supplies as we may need in the future. Then came the excuse for not tipping off his partner earlier. If I waited until this moment, Duce, to send you this information, it is because the final decision itself will not be made until seven o'clock tonight. Whatever may come, Duce, our situation cannot become worse as a result of this step. It can only improve. Should England nevertheless not draw any conclusions from the hard facts, then we can, with our rear secured, apply ourselves with increased strength to the dispatching of our enemy. Finally, Hitler described his great feeling of relief at having finally made up his mind. Let me say one more thing, Duce. Since I struggled through to this decision, I again feel spiritually free. The partnership with the Soviet Union, in spite of the complete sincerity of our efforts to bring about a final conciliation, was nevertheless often very irksome to me, for in some way or other it seemed to me to be a break with my whole origin, my concepts and my former obligations. I am happy now to be relieved of these mental agonies. With hearty and comradely greetings, your Adolf Hitler. At three o'clock in the morning of June 22nd, a bare half-hour before the German troops jumped off, Ambassador von Bismarck awakened Ciano in Rome to deliver Hitler's long missive, which the Italian foreign minister then telephoned to Mussolini, who was resting at his summer place at Riccione. It was not the first time that the Duce had been wakened from his sleep in the middle of the night by a message from his Axis partner, and he resented it. Not even I disturb my servants at night, Mussolini fretted to Ciano, but the Germans make me jump out of bed at any hour without the least consideration. Nevertheless, as soon as Mussolini had rubbed the sleep from his eyes, he gave orders for an immediate declaration of war on the Soviet Union. He was now completely a prisoner of the Germans. He knew it and resented it. I hope for only one thing, he told Chano, that in this war in the East the Germans lose a lot of feathers. Still, he realized that his own future now depended wholly on German arms. The Germans would win in Russia, he was sure, but he hoped that at least they would get a bloody nose. He could not know, nor did he suspect, nor did anyone else in the West on either side, that they would get much worse. On Sunday morning, June 22nd, the day Napoleon had crossed the Niemen in 1812 on his way to Moscow, and exactly a year after Napoleon's country, France, had capitulated at Compiègne. Adolf Hitler's armored, mechanized, and hitherto invincible armies poured across the Niemen and various other rivers and penetrated swiftly into Russia. The Red Army, despite all the warnings and the warning signs, was, as General Halder noted in his diary the first day, tactically surprised along the entire front. There is a curious notation in Halder's diary that first day, after mentioning that at noon the Russian radio stations which the Germans were monitoring, had come back on the air, he writes, They have asked Japan to mediate the political and economic differences between Russia and Germany and remain in active contact with the German Foreign Office. Did Stalin believe, nine hours after the attack, that he somehow might get it called off? All the first bridges were captured intact. 
In fact, says Holder, at most places along the border, the Russians were not even deployed for action and were overrun before they could organize resistance. Hundreds of Soviet planes were destroyed on the flying fields. General Gunter Blumentritt, chief of staff of the Fourth Army, later recalled that a little after midnight on the 21st, when the German artillery had already zeroed on its targets, the Berlin-Moscow express train chugged through the German lines on the Bug and across the river into Brest-Litovsk without incident. It struck him as a weird moment. Almost equally weird to him was that the Russian artillery did not respond even when the assault began. The Russians, he subsequently wrote, were taken entirely by surprise on our front. As dawn broke, German signal stations picked up the Red Army radio networks. We are being fired on. What shall we do? Blumentritt quotes one Russian message as saying. Back came the answer from headquarters. You must be insane, and why is your signal not in code? The Fatal Decisions, edited by Seymour Frieden and William Richardson. Within a few days, tens of thousands of prisoners began to pour in. Whole armies were quickly encircled. It seemed like the Feldzug in Poland all over again. It is hardly too much to say, the usually cautious Halder noted in his diary on July 3rd after going over the latest general staff reports, that the Feldzug against Russia has been won in fourteen days. In a matter of weeks, he added, it would all be over. Chapter 24 A Turn of the Tide By the beginning of autumn 1941, Hitler believed that Russia was finished. Within three weeks of the opening of the campaign, Field Marshal von Bock's Army Group Center, with thirty infantry divisions and fifteen panzer or motorized divisions, had pushed four hundred fifty miles from Bialystok to Smolensk. Moscow lay but two hundred miles farther east along the high road which Napoleon had taken in 1812. To the north, Field Marshal von Leib's Army Group, twenty-one infantry and six armored divisions strong, was moving rapidly up through the Baltic states toward Leningrad. To the south, Field Marshal von Rundstedt's army group of twenty-five infantry, four motorized, four mountain and five panzer divisions, was advancing toward the Dnieper River and Kiev, capital of the fertile Ukraine, which Hitler coveted. So Plan Messig, according to Plan, as the OKW communiques put it, was the German progress along a thousand-mile front from the Baltic to the Black Sea, and so confident was the Nazi dictator that it would continue at an accelerated pace as one Soviet army after another was surrounded or dispersed, that on July 14th, the bare three weeks after the invasion had begun, he issued a directive advising that the strength of the army could be considerably reduced in the near future, and that armament production would be concentrated on naval ships and Luftwaffe planes, especially the latter, for the conduct of the war against the last remaining enemy, Britain, and, he added, against America should the case arise. By the end of September he instructed the High Command to prepare to disband forty infantry divisions so that this additional manpower could be utilized by industry. Russia's two greatest cities, Leningrad, which Peter the Great had built as the capital on the Baltic, and Moscow, the ancient and now Bolshevik capital, seemed to Hitler about to fall. On September 18th he issued strict orders. A capitulation of Leningrad or Moscow is not to be accepted, even if offered. What was to happen to them he made clear to his commanders in a directive of September 29th. The Fuhrer has decided to have St. Petersburg, Leningrad, wiped off the face of the earth. The further existence of this large city is of no interest once Soviet Russia is overthrown. The intention is to close in on the city and raise it to the ground by artillery and by continuous air attack. Requests that the city be taken over will be turned down, for the problem of the survival of the population and of supplying it with food is one which cannot and should not be solved by us. In this war for existence, we have no interest in keeping even part of this great city's population. A few weeks later, Goering told Chano, this year between twenty and thirty million persons will die of hunger in Russia. Perhaps it is well that it should be so, for certain nations must be decimated. But even if it were not, nothing can be done about it. It is obvious that if humanity is condemned to die of hunger, 
The last to die will be our two peoples. In the camps for Russian prisoners, they have begun to eat each other. Chano's Diplomatic Papers, pages 464 to 465. That same week, on October 3rd, Hitler returned to Berlin and, in an address to the German people, proclaimed the collapse of the Soviet Union. I declare today, and I declare it without any reservation, he said, that the enemy in the East has been struck down and will never rise again. Behind our troops there already lies a territory twice the size of the German Reich when I came to power in 1933. When, on October 8th, Oral, a key city south of Moscow, fell, Hitler sent his press chief, Otto Dietrich, flying back to Berlin to tell the correspondents of the world's leading newspapers there the next day that the last intact Soviet armies, those of Marshal Timoshenko, defending Moscow, were locked in two steel German pockets before the capital, that the southern armies of Marshal Budyani were routed and dispersed, and that sixty to seventy divisions of Marshal Voroshilov's army were surrounded in Leningrad. For all military purposes, Dietrich concluded smugly, Soviet Russia is done with. The British dream of a two-front war is dead. These public boasts of Hitler and Dietrich were, to say the least, premature. Not as premature, however, as the warnings of the American general staff, which in July had confidentially informed American editors and Washington correspondents that the collapse of the Soviet Union was only a matter of a few weeks. It is not surprising that the declarations of Hitler and Dr. Dietrich early in October 1941 were widely believed in the United States and Britain as well as in Germany and elsewhere. In reality, the Russians, despite the surprise with which they were taken on June 22nd, their subsequent heavy losses in men and equipment, their rapid withdrawal and the entrapment of some of their best armies, had begun in July to put up a mounting resistance such as the Wehrmacht had never encountered before. Halder's diary and the reports of such front-line commanders as General Guderian, who led a large panzer group on the Central Front, began to be peppered and then laden with accounts of severe fighting, desperate Russian stands and counterattacks, and heavy casualties to German as well as Soviet troops. The conduct of the Russian troops, General Blumentritt wrote later, even in this first battle, for Minsk, was in striking contrast to the behavior of the Poles and the Western Allies in defeat. Even when encircled, the Russians stood their ground and fought. And there proved to be more of them, and with better equipment than Adolf Hitler had dreamed was possible. Fresh Soviet divisions, which German intelligence had no inkling of, were continually being thrown into battle. It is becoming ever clearer, Holder wrote in his diary on August 11th, that we underestimated the strength of the Russian colossus not only in the economic and transportation sphere, but above all in the military. At the beginning we reckoned with some 200 enemy divisions, and we have already identified 360. When a dozen of them are destroyed, the Russians throw in another dozen. On this broad expanse our front is too thin. It has no depth. As a result, the repeated enemy attacks often meet with some success. Rundstedt put it bluntly to Allied interrogators after the war. I realized, he said, soon after the attack was begun, that everything that had been written about Russia was nonsense. Several generals, Guderian, Blumentritt, and Zepp Dietrich among them, have left reports expressing astonishment at their first encounter with the Russian T-34 tank, of which they had not previously heard and which was so heavily armored that the shells from the German anti-tank guns bounced harmlessly off it. The appearance of this panzer, Blumentritt said later, marked the beginning of what came to be called the tank terror. Also, for the first time in the war, the Germans did not have the benefit of overwhelming superiority in the air to protect their ground troops and scout ahead. Despite the heavy losses on the ground in the first day of the campaign and in early combat, Soviet fighter planes kept appearing, like the fresh divisions, out of nowhere. Moreover, the swiftness of the German advance and the lack of suitable airfields in Russia left the German fighter bases too far back to provide effective cover at the front. At several stages in the advance, General von Kleist later reported, my panzer forces were handicapped through lack of cover overhead. There was another German miscalculation about the Russians, which Kleist mentioned to Little Hart, and which, of course, was shared by most of the other peoples of the West that summer. Hopes of victory, Kleist said, 
were largely built on the prospect that the invasion would produce a political upheaval in Russia. Two high hopes were built on the belief that Stalin would be overthrown by his own people if he suffered heavy defeats. The belief was fostered by the Fuhrer's political advisers. Indeed, Hitler had told Yodel, We have only to kick in the door and the whole rotten structure will come crashing down. The opportunity to kick in the door seemed to the Fuhrer to be at hand halfway through July, when there occurred the first great controversy over strategy in the German high command, and led to a decision by the Fuhrer, over the protests of most of the top generals, which Halder thought proved to be the greatest strategic blunder of the Eastern Campaign. The issue was simple but fundamental. Should Bach's Army Group Center, the most powerful and so far the most successful of the three main German armies, push on the 200 miles to Moscow from Smolensk, which it had reached on July 16th, or should the original plan, which Hitler had laid down in the December 18th directive and which called for the main thrusts on the north and south flanks, be adhered to? In other words, was Moscow the prize goal or Leningrad and the Ukraine? The Army High Command, led by Braukic and Halder and supported by Bach, whose Central Army Group was moving up the main highway to Moscow, and by Guderian, whose panzer forces were leading it, insisted on an all-out drive for the Soviet capital. There was much more to their argument than merely stressing the psychological value of capturing the enemy capital. Moscow, they pointed out to Hitler, was a vital source of armament production, and even more important, the center of the Russian transportation and communications system. Take it, and the Soviets would not only be deprived of an essential source of arms, but would be unable to move troops and supplies to the distant fronts, which thereafter would weaken, wither, and collapse. But there was a final conclusive argument which the generals advanced to the former corporal who was now their supreme commander. All their intelligence reports showed that the main Russian forces were now being concentrated before Moscow for an all-out defense of the capital. Just east of Smolensk, a Soviet army of half a million men, which had extricated itself from Bach's double envelopment, was digging in to bar further German progress toward the capital. The center of gravity of Russian strength, Holder wrote in a report prepared for the Allies immediately after the war, was therefore in front of Army Group Center. The general staff had been brought up with the idea that it must be the aim of an operation to defeat the military power of the enemy, and it therefore considered the next and most pressing task to be to defeat the forces of Timoshenko by concentrating all available forces at Army Group Center, to advance on Moscow, to take this nerve center of enemy resistance, and to destroy the new enemy formations. The assembly for this attack had to be carried out as soon as possible because the season was advanced. Army Group North was in the meantime to fulfill its original mission and to try to contact the Finns. Army Group South was to advance farther east to tie down the strongest possible enemy force. After oral discussions between the General Staff and the Supreme Command, OKW, had failed, the Commander-in-Chief of the Army, Braukic, submitted a memorandum of the General Staff to Hitler. This, we learn from Halder's diary, was done on August 18th. The effect, says Halder, was explosive. Hitler had his hungry eyes on the food belt and industrial areas of the Ukraine and on the Russian oil fields just beyond in the Caucasus. Besides, he thought he saw a golden opportunity to entrap Budyani's armies east of the Dnieper beyond Kiev, which still held out. He also wanted to capture Leningrad and join up with the Finns in the north. To accomplish these twin aims, several infantry and panzer divisions from Army Group Center would have to be detached and sent north and especially south. Moscow could wait. On August 21st, Hitler hurled a new directive at his rebellious general staff. Holder copied it out word for word in his diary the next day. The proposals of the army for the continuation of the operations in the east do not accord with my intentions. The most important objective to attain before the onset of winter is not the capture of Moscow, but the taking of the Crimea, the industrial and coal mining areas of the Donetsk Basin, and the cutting off of Russian oil supplies from the Caucasus. In the north, it is the locking up of Leningrad and the union with the Finns. The Soviet Fifth Army on the Dnieper in the south, whose stubborn resistance had annoyed Hitler for several days, must, he laid it down, be utterly destroyed. The Ukraine and the Crimea occupied 
Leningrad surrounded and a junction with the Finns achieved. Only then, he concluded, will the conditions be created whereby Timoshenko's army can be attacked and successfully defeated. Thus, commented Holder bitterly, the aim of defeating decisively the Russian armies in front of Moscow was subordinated to the desire to obtain a valuable industrial area and to advance in the direction of Russian oil. Hitler now became obsessed with the idea of capturing both Leningrad and Stalingrad, for he persuaded himself that if these two holy cities of communism were to fall, Russia would collapse. To add insult to injury to the field marshals and the generals who did not appreciate his strategic genius, Hitler sent what Holder called a counter-memorandum to that of the Army of the 18th, which the general staff chief described as full of insults, such as stating that the Army High Command was full of minds fossilized and out-of-date theories. Unbearable, unheard of, the limit, Holder snorted in his diary the next day. He conferred all afternoon and evening with Field Marshal von Braukitsch about the Fuhrer's inadmissible mixing into the business of the Army High Command and General Staff, finally proposing that the head of the Army and he himself resign their posts. Braukitsch refused, Holder noted, because it wouldn't be practical and would change nothing. The gutless Field Marshal had already, as on so many other occasions, capitulated to the one-time corporal. When General Guderian arrived at the Fuhrer's headquarters the next day, August 23rd, and was egged on by Halder to try to talk Hitler out of his disastrous decision, though the hard-bitten panzer leader needed no urging, he was met by Braukitsch. I forbid you, the army commander-in-chief said, to mention the question of Moscow to the Fuhrer. The operation to the south has been ordered. The problem now is simply how it is to be carried out. Discussion is pointless. Nevertheless, when Guderian was ushered into the presence of Hitler, neither Braukitsch nor Holder accompanied him, he disobeyed orders and argued as strongly as he could for the immediate assault on Moscow. Hitler let me speak to the end, Guderian later wrote. He then described in detail the considerations which had led him to make a different decision. He said that the raw materials and agriculture of the Ukraine were vitally necessary for the future prosecution of the war. He spoke of the need of neutralizing the Crimea, that Soviet aircraft carrier for attacking the Romanian oil fields. For the first time I heard him use the phrase, My generals know nothing about the economic aspects of war. He had given strict orders that the attack on Kiev was to be the immediate strategic objective, and all actions were to be carried out with that in mind. I here saw for the first time a spectacle with which I was later to become very familiar. All those present, Keitel, Yodel, and others, nodded in agreement with every sentence that Hitler uttered while I was left alone with my point of view. But Halder had at no point in the previous discussions nodded his agreement. When Guderian saw him the next day and reported his failure to get Hitler to change his mind, he says the general staff chief, to my amazement, suffered a complete nervous collapse which led him to make accusations and imputations which were utterly unjustified. Holder, in his diary of August 24th, gives quite a different version. He accuses Guderian of irresponsibly changing his mind after seeing Hitler, and muses how useless it is to try to change a man's character. If he suffered, as Guderian alleges, a complete nervous collapse, his pedantic diary notes that day indicate that he quickly recovered. This was the most severe crisis in the German military high command since the beginning of the war. Worse were to follow with adversity. In itself, Rundstedt's offensive in the south, made possible by the reinforcement of Guderian's panzer forces and infantry divisions withdrawn from the central front, was, as Guderian put it, a great tactical victory. Kiev itself fell on September 19th, German units had already penetrated 150 miles beyond it, and on the 26th, the Battle of Kiev ended with the encirclement and surrender of 665,000 Russian prisoners, according to the German claim. To Hitler it was the greatest battle in the history of the world. But though it was a singular achievement, some of his generals were more skeptical of its strategic significance. Bach's armorless army group in the center had been forced to cool its heels for two months along the Desna River, just beyond Smolensk. The autumn rains, which would turn the Russian roads into quagmires, were drawing near, and after them, the winter, the cold, and the snow. 
the great drive on Moscow. Reluctantly, Hitler gave in to the urging of Frau Kitschholder and Bach and consented to the resumption of the drive on Moscow. But too late. Holder saw him on the afternoon of September 5th, and now the Fuhrer, his mind made up, was in a hurry to get to the Kremlin. Get started on the Central Front within eight to ten days, the Supreme Commander ordered. Impossible, Holder exclaimed in his diary. Encircle them, beat, and destroy them, Hitler added, promising to return to Army Group Center Guderian's Panzer Group, then still heavily engaged in the Ukraine, and add Reinhardt's tank corps from the Leningrad Front but it was not until the beginning of October that the armored forces could be brought back, refitted, and made ready. On October 2nd, the great offensive was finally launched. Typhoon was the code name. A mighty wind, a cyclone, was to hit the Russians, destroy their last fighting forces before Moscow, and bring the Soviet Union tumbling down. But here again the Nazi dictator became a victim of his megalomania. Taking the Russian capital before winter came was not enough. He gave orders that Field Marshal von Leib in the north was, at the same time, to capture Leningrad, make contact with the Finns beyond the city, and drive on and cut the Murmansk Railway. Also, at the same time, Rundstedt was to clear the Black Sea coast, take Rostov, seize the Mykop oil fields, and push forward to Stalingrad on the Volga, thus severing Stalin's last link with the Caucasus. When Rundstedt tried to explain to Hitler that this meant an advance of more than 400 miles beyond the Dnieper, with his left flank dangerously exposed, the Supreme Commander told him that the Russians in the south were now incapable of offering serious resistance. Rundstedt, who says that he laughed aloud at such ridiculous orders, was soon to find the contrary. The German drive along the old road which Napoleon had taken to Moscow at first rolled along with all the fury of a typhoon. In the first fortnight of October, in what later Blumentritt called a textbook battle, the Germans encircled two Soviet armies between Vyazma and Bryansk, and claimed to have taken 650,000 prisoners along with 5,000 guns and 1,200 tanks. By October 20th, German armored spearheads were within 40 miles of Moscow, and the Soviet ministries and foreign embassies were hastily evacuated to Kwebyshev on the Volga. Even the sober holder, who had fallen off his horse and broken a collarbone and was temporarily hospitalized, now believed that with bold leadership and favorable weather, Moscow could be taken before the severe Russian winter set in. The fall rains, however, had commenced. Rasputitsa, the period of mud, set in. The great army, moving on wheels, was slowed down and often forced to halt. Tanks had to be withdrawn from battle to pull guns and ammunition trucks out of the mire. Chains and couplings for this job were lacking, and bundles of rope had to be dropped by Luftwaffe transport planes, which were badly needed for lifting other military supplies. The rains began in mid-October, and, as Guderian later remembered, the next few weeks were dominated by the mud. General Blumentritt, chief of staff of Field Marshal von Kluge's Fourth Army, which was in the thick of the battle for Moscow, has vividly described the predicament. The infantrymen slithers in the mud, while many teams of horses are needed to drag each gun forward. All wheeled vehicles sink up to their axles in the slime. Even tractors can only move with great difficulty. A large portion of our heavy artillery was soon stuck fast. The strain that all this caused our already exhausted troops can perhaps be imagined. For the first time, there crept into the diary of Holder and the reports of Guderian, Blumentritt, and other German generals, signs of doubt, and then of despair. It spread to the lower officers and the troops in the field, or perhaps it stemmed from them. And now, when Moscow was already almost in sight, Blumentritt recalled, the mood both of commanders and troops began to change. Enemy resistance stiffened and the fighting became more bitter. Many of our companies were reduced to a mere sixty or seventy men. There was a shortage of serviceable artillery and tanks. Winter, he says, was about to begin, but there was no sign of winter clothing. Far behind the front, the first partisan units were beginning to make their presence felt in the vast forests and swamps. Supply columns were frequently ambushed. Now, Blumentritt remembered, the ghosts of the Grand Army, which had taken this same road to Moscow, and the memory of Napoleon's fate began to haunt the dreams of the Nazi conquerors. The German generals began to read, or reread 
Colancourt's grim account of the French conqueror's disastrous winter in Russia in 1812. Far to the south, where the weather was a little warmer, but the rain and the mud were just as bad, things were not going well either. Kleist's tanks had entered Rostov at the mouth of the Don on November 21st amidst much fanfare from Dr. Goebbels's propaganda band that the gateway to the Caucasus had been opened. It did not remain open very long. Both Kleist and Rundstedt realized that Rostov could not be held. Five days later the Russians retook it, and the Germans, attacked on both the northern and southern flanks, were in headlong retreat back fifty miles to the Meuse River where Kleist and Rundstedt had wished in the first place to establish a winter line. The retreat from Rostov is another little turning point in the history of the Third Reich. Here was the first time that any Nazi army had ever suffered a major setback. Our misfortunes began with Rostov, Guderian afterward commented. That was the writing on the wall. It cost Field Marshal von Rundstedt, the senior officer in the German army, his command. As he was retreating to the Meuse, Suddenly an order came to me, he subsequently told Allied interrogators, from the Fuhrer. Remain where you are and retreat no further. I immediately wired back, it is madness to attempt to hold. In the first place the troops cannot do it, and in the second place if they do not retreat they will be destroyed. I repeat that this order be rescinded or that you find someone else. That same night the Fuhrer's reply arrived. I am acceding to your request. Please give up your command. I then, said Rundstedt, went home. Grüster Aufregung, greatest excitement by the Führer, Holder noted in his diary on November 30th in describing Rundstedt's retreat to the Meuse and Hitler's dismissal of the field marshal. The Führer calls in Braukic and hurls reproaches and abuse at him. Holder had begun his diary that day by noting the figures of German casualties up to November 26th. Total losses of the Eastern armies, not counting the sick, 743,112 officers and men, 23% of the entire force of 3.2 million. On December 1st, Halder recorded the replacement of Rundstedt by Reichenau, who still commanded the Sixth Army, which he had led in France and which had been having a hard time of it to the north of Kleist's armored divisions, which were retreating from Rostov. Reichenau phones the Führer, Holder wrote, and asks permission to withdraw tonight to the Meuse line. Permission is given. So we are exactly where we were yesterday, but time and strength have been sacrificed and Rundstedt lost. The health of Braukitsch, he added, as the result of the continuing excitement is again causing anxiety. On November 10th, Holder had recorded that the army chief had suffered a severe heart attack. This mania for ordering distant troops to stand fast no matter what their peril, perhaps saved the German army from complete collapse in the shattering months ahead, though many generals dispute it, but it was to lead to Stalingrad and other disasters, and to help seal Hitler's fate. Heavy snows and sub-zero temperatures came early that winter in Russia. Guderian noted the first snow on the night of October 6th to 7th, just as the drive on Moscow was being resumed. It reminded him to ask headquarters again for winter clothing, especially for heavy boots and heavy wool socks. On October 12th, he recorded the snow as still falling. On November 3rd came the first cold wave, the thermometer dropping below the freezing point and continuing to fall. By the 7th, Guderian was reporting the first severe cases of frostbite in his ranks, and on the 13th, that the temperature had fallen to 8 degrees below zero Fahrenheit and that the lack of winter clothing was becoming increasingly felt. The bitter cold affected guns and machines as well as men. Ice was causing a lot of trouble, Guderian wrote, since the corks for the tank tracks had not yet arrived. The cold made the telescopic sights useless. In order to start the engines of the tanks, fires had to be lit beneath them. Fuel was freezing on occasions, and the oil became viscous. Each regiment of the 112th Infantry Division, had already lost some 500 men from frostbite. As a result of the cold, the machine guns were no longer able to fire, and our 37mm anti-tank guns had proved ineffective against the Russian T-34 tank. The result, says Guderian, was a panic which reached as far back as Bodorodsk. This was the first time that such a thing had occurred during the Russian campaign, 
and it was a warning that the combat ability of our infantry was at an end. But not only of the infantry. On November 21st, Holder scribbled in his diary that Guderian had telephoned to say that his panzer troops had reached their end. This tough, aggressive tank commander admits that on this very day he decided to visit the commander of Army Group Center, Bach, and request that the orders he had received be changed, since he could see no way of carrying them out. He was in a deep mood of depression, writing on the same day, the icy cold, the lack of shelter, the shortage of clothing, the heavy losses of men and equipment, the wretched state of our fuel supplies, all this makes the duties of a commander a misery and the longer it goes on, the more I am crushed by the enormous responsibility I have to bear. In retrospect, Guderian added, Only he who saw the endless expanse of Russian snow during this winter of our misery, and felt the icy wind that blew across it, burying in snow every object in its path, who drove for hour after hour through that no-man's land, only at last to find too thin shelter with insufficiently clothed, half-starved men, and who also saw, by contrast, the well-fed, warmly clad, and fresh Siberians, fully equipped for winter fighting, can truly judge the events which now occurred. Those events may now be briefly narrated, but not without first stressing one point. Terrible as the Russian winter was, and granted that the Soviet troops were naturally better prepared for it than the German, the main factor in what is now to be set down was not the weather, but the fierce fighting of the Red Army troops and their indomitable will not to give up. The diary of Holder and the reports of the field commanders, which constantly express amazement at the extent and severity of Russian attacks and counterattacks, and despair at the German setbacks and losses, are proof of that. The Nazi generals could not understand why the Russians, considering the nature of their tyrannical regime and the disastrous effects of the first German blows, did not collapse, as had the French and so many others, with less excuse. With amazement and disappointment, Blumentritt wrote, we discovered in late October and early November that the beaten Russians seemed quite unaware that as a military force they had almost ceased to exist. Guderian tells of meeting an old retired Tsarist general at Oral on the road to Moscow. If only you had come twenty years ago, he told the panzer general, we should have welcomed you with open arms, but now it's too late. We were just beginning to get on our feet, and now you arrive and throw us back twenty years, so that we will have to start from the beginning all over again. Now we are fighting for Russia, and in that cause we are all united. Yet, as November approached its end amidst fresh blizzards and continued sub-zero temperatures, Moscow seemed within grasp to Hitler and most of his generals. North, south, and west of the capital, German armies had reached points within twenty to thirty miles of their goal. To Hitler, poring over the map at his headquarters far off in East Prussia, the last stretch seemed no distance at all. His armies had advanced five hundred miles. They had only twenty to thirty miles to go. One final heave, he told Yodel in mid-November, and we shall triumph. On the telephone to Halder on November 22nd, Field Marshal von Bock, directing Army Group Center in its final push for Moscow, compared the situation to the Battle of the Marne, where the last battalion thrown in decided the battle. Despite increased enemy resistance, Bock told the General Staff Chief he believed everything was attainable. By the last day of November, he was literally throwing in his last battalion. The final all-out attack on the heart of the Soviet Union was set for the next day, December 1, 1941. It stumbled on a steely resistance. The greatest tank force ever concentrated on one front, General Hüppner's 4th Tank Group and General Hermann Hutz's 3rd Tank Group just north of Moscow and driving south, Guderian's 2nd Panzer Army just to the south of the capital and pushing north from Tula, Kluge's great 4th Army in the middle and fighting its way due east through the forests that surrounded the city. On this formidable array were pinned Hitler's high hopes. By December 2nd, a reconnaissance battalion of the 258th Infantry Division had penetrated to Kimki, a suburb of Moscow, within sight of the spires of the Kremlin, but was driven out the next morning by a few Russian tanks and a motley force of hastily mobilized workers from the city's factories. This was the nearest the German troops ever got to Moscow. It was their first and last glimpse of the Kremlin.
Already on the evening of December 1st, Bach, who was now suffering severe stomach cramps, had telephoned Halder to say that he could no longer operate with his weakened troops. The general staff chief had tried to cheer him on. One must try, he said, to bring the enemy down by a last expenditure of force. If that proves impossible, then we will have to draw new conclusions. The next day Halder jotted in his diary, Enemy resistance has reached its peak. On the following day, December 3rd, Bach was again on the phone to the chief of the general staff, who noted his message in his diary. Spearheads of the Fourth Army again pulled back because the flanks could not come forward. The moment must be faced when the strength of our troops is at an end. When Bach spoke for the first time of going over to the defensive, Holder tried to remind him that the best defense was to stick to the attack. It was easier said than done in view of the Russians and the weather. The next day, December 4th, Guderian, whose second panzer army had been halted in its attempt to take Moscow from the south, reported that the thermometer had fallen to 31 degrees below zero. The next day it dropped another five degrees. His tanks, he said, were almost immobilized, and he was threatened on his flanks and in the rear north of Tula. December 5th was the critical day. Everywhere along the 200 miles semicircular front around Moscow the Germans had been stopped. By evening Guderian was notifying Bach that he was not only stopped, but must pull back, and Bach was telephoning Halder that his strength was at an end, and Braukic was telling his chief of the general staff in despair that he was quitting as commander-in-chief of the army. It was a dark and bitter day for the German generals. This was the first time, Guderian later wrote, that I had to take a decision of this sort, and none was more difficult. Our attack on Moscow had broken down. All the sacrifices and endurance of our brave troops had been in vain. We had suffered a grievous defeat. At Kluge's Fourth Army headquarters, Blumentritt, the chief of staff, realized that the turning point had been reached. Recalling it later, he wrote, Our hopes of knocking Russia out of the war in 1941 had been dashed at the very last minute. The next day, December 6th, General Georgi Zhukov, who had replaced Marshal Timoshenko as commander of the Central Front but six weeks before, struck. On the 200-mile front before Moscow, he unleashed seven armies and two cavalry corps, 100 divisions in all, consisting of troops that were either fresh or battle-tried and were equipped and trained to fight in the bitter cold and the deep snow. The blow which this relatively unknown general now delivered with such a formidable force of infantry, artillery, tanks, cavalry, and planes, which Hitler had not faintly suspected existed, was so sudden and so shattering that the German army and the Third Reich never fully recovered from it. For a few weeks during the rest of that cold and bitter December and on into January, it seemed that the beaten and retreating German armies, their front continually pierced by Soviet breakthroughs, might disintegrate and perish in the Russian snows, as had Napoleon's grand army just a hundred and thirty years before. At several crucial moments it came very close to that. Perhaps it was Hitler's granite will and determination, and certainly it was the fortitude of the German soldier, that saved the armies of the Third Reich from a complete debacle. But the failure was great. The Red Armies had been crippled, but not destroyed. Moscow had not been taken nor Leningrad, nor Stalingrad, nor the oil fields of the Caucasus. And the lifelines to Britain and America, to the north and to the south, remained open. For the first time in more than two years of unbroken military victories, the armies of Hitler were retreating before a superior force. That was not all. The failure was greater than that. Halder realized this, at least later. The myth of the invincibility of the German army, he wrote, was broken. There would be more German victories in Russia when another summer came around, but they could never restore the myth. December 6, 1941, then, is another turning point in the short history of the Third Reich and one of the most fateful ones. Hitler's power had reached its zenith. From now on it was to decline, sapped by the growing counterblows of the nations against which he had chosen to make aggressive war. A drastic shake-up in the German high command and among the field commanders now took place. As the armies fell back over the icy roads and snowy fields before the Soviet counter-offensive, the heads of the German generals began to roll. Rundstedt, as we have already seen, was relieved of command of the southern armies because he had been forced to retreat from Rostov. 
Field Marshal von Bach's stomach pains became worse with the setbacks in December, and he was replaced on December 18th by Field Marshal von Kluge, whose battered Fourth Army was being pushed back forever from the vicinity of Moscow. Even the dashing General Guderian, the originator of massive armored warfare which had so revolutionized modern battle, was cashiered on Christmas Day for ordering a retreat without permission from above. General Herpner, an equally brilliant tank commander whose 4th Armored Group had come within sight of Moscow on the north and then been pushed back, was abruptly dismissed by Hitler on the same grounds, stripped of his rank and forbidden to wear a uniform. General Hans Count von Sponeck, who had received the Ritterkreuz for leading the airborne landings at The Hague the year before, received a severer chastisement for pulling back one division of his corps in the Crimea on December 29th, after Russian troops had landed by sea behind him. He was not only summarily stripped of his rank, but imprisoned, court-martialed, and, at the insistence of Hitler, sentenced to death. He was not executed until after the July 1944 plot against Hitler, in which he was in no way involved. Even the obsequious Keitel was in trouble with the Supreme Commander. Even he had enough sense to see during the first days of December that a general withdrawal around Moscow was necessary in order to avert disaster. But when he got up enough courage to say so to Hitler, the latter turned on him and gave him a tongue-lashing, shouting that he was a blockhead. Yodel found the unhappy OKW chief a little later sitting at a desk writing out his resignation, a revolver at one side. Yodel quietly removed the weapon and persuaded Keitel, apparently without too much difficulty, to stay on and to continue to swallow the Fuhrer's insults, which he did with amazing endurance to the very end. The strain of leading an army which could not always win, under a supreme commander who insisted that it always do, had brought about renewed heart attacks for Field Marshal von Braukic, and by the time Zhukov's counteroffensive began, he was determined to step down as commander-in-chief. He returned to headquarters from a trip to the receding front on December 15th, and Halder found him very beaten down. Braukic no longer sees any way out, Halder noted in his diary, for the rescue of the army from its desperate position. The head of the army was at the end of his rope. He had asked Hitler on December 7th to relieve him, and he renewed the request on December 17th. It was formally granted two days later. What the Fuhrer really thought of the man he himself had named to head the army, he told to Goebbels three months later. The Fuhrer spoke of him, Braukic, only in terms of contempt, Goebbels wrote in his diary on March 20th, 1942. A vain, cowardly wretch and a nincompoop. To his cronies, Hitler said of Braukic, He's no soldier. He's a man of straw. If Braukic had remained at his post only for another few weeks, things would have ended in catastrophe. There was some speculation in army circles as to who would succeed Braukic, but it was as wide of the mark as the speculation years before as to who would succeed Hindenburg. On December 19th, Hitler called in Halder and informed him that he himself was taking over as commander-in-chief of the army. Halder could stay on as chief of the general staff if he wanted to, and he wanted to. But from now on, Hitler made it clear he was personally running the army, as he ran almost everything else in Germany. This little matter of operational command, Hitler told him, is something anyone can do. The task of the commander-in-chief of the army is to train the army in a national socialist way. I know of no general who could do that, as I want it done. Consequently, I've decided to take over command of the army myself. Hitler's triumph over the Prussian officer corps was thus completed. The former Vienna vagabond and ex-corporal was now head of state, minister of war, supreme commander of the armed forces, and commander-in-chief of the army. The generals, as Alder complained, in his diary, were now merely postmen, purveying Hitler's orders based on Hitler's singular conception of strategy. Actually, the megalomaniacal dictator soon would make himself something even greater, legalizing a power never before held by any man, emperor, king, or president, in the experience of the German Reichs. On April 26, 1942, he had his rubber-stamp Reichstag pass a law which gave him absolute power of life and death over every German, and simply suspended any laws which might stand in the way of this. The words of the law have to be read to be believed. In the present war, in which the German people are faced with a struggle for their existence or their annihilation, 
the Fuhrer must have all the rights postulated by him which serve to further or achieve victory. Therefore, without being bound by existing legal regulations, in his capacity as leader of the nation, supreme commander of the armed forces, head of government and supreme executive chief, as supreme justice and leader of the party, the Fuhrer must be in a position to force with all means at his disposal every German, if necessary, whether he be common soldier or officer, low or high official or judge, leading or subordinate official of the party, worker or employer, to fulfill his duties. In case of violation of these duties, the Fuhrer is entitled after conscientious examination, regardless of so-called well-deserved rights, to mete out due punishment and to remove the offender from his post, rank and position without introducing prescribed procedures. Truly, Adolf Hitler had become not only the leader of Germany, but the law. Not even in medieval times, nor further back in the barbarous tribal days, had any German arrogated such tyrannical power, nominal and legal as well as actual, to himself. But even without this added authority, Hitler was absolute master of the army, of which he had now assumed direct command. Ruthlessly he moved that bitter winter to stem the retreat of his beaten armies and to save them from the fate of Napoleon's troops along the same frozen snow-bound roads back from Moscow. He forbade any further withdrawals. The German generals have long debated the merits of his stubborn stand, whether it saved the troops from complete disaster or whether it compounded the inevitable heavy losses. Most of the commanders have contended that if they had been given freedom to pull back when their position became untenable, they could have saved many men and much equipment, and been in a better position to reform and even counterattack. As it was, whole divisions were frequently overrun or surrounded and cut to pieces when a timely withdrawal would have saved them. And yet some of the generals later reluctantly admitted that Hitler's iron will in insisting that the armies stand and fight was his greatest accomplishment of the war in that it probably did save his armies from completely disintegrating in the snow. This view is best summed up by General Blumentritt. Hitler's fanatical order that the troops must hold fast regardless in every position and in the most impossible circumstances was undoubtedly correct. Hitler realized instinctively that any retreat across the snow and ice must, within a few days, lead to the dissolution of the front and that if this happened, the Wehrmacht would suffer the same fate that had befallen the Grande Armée. The withdrawal could only be carried out across the open country, since the roads and tracks were blocked with snow. After a few nights, this would prove too much for the troops, who would simply lie down and die wherever they found themselves. There were no prepared positions in the rear into which they could be withdrawn, nor any sort of line to which they could hold on. General von Tippelskirk, a corps commander, agreed. It was Hitler's one great achievement. At that critical moment, the troops were remembering what they had heard about Napoleon's retreat from Moscow and living under the shadow of it. If they had once begun a retreat, it might have turned into a panic flight. There was panic in the German army, not only at the front, but far in the rear at headquarters, and it is graphically recorded in Halder's diary. Very difficult day, he begins his journal on Christmas Day, 1941. And thereafter, into the new year, he repeats the words at the head of many a day's entry as he describes each fresh Russian breakthrough and the serious situation of the various armies. December 29th. Another critical day. Dramatic long-distance telephone talk between Führer and Kluge. Führer forbids further withdrawal of northern wing of 4th Army. Very bad crisis by 9th Army where apparently the commanders have lost their heads. At noon, an excited call from Kluge. Ninth Army wishes to withdraw behind Rajoff. January 2, 1942. A day of wild fighting. Grave crisis by Fourth and Ninth Armies. Russian breakthrough north of Maloyaroslavets tears the front wide open, and it's difficult to see at the moment how front can be restored. This situation leads Kluge to demand withdrawal of sagging front. Very stormy argument with Fuhrer, who, however, holds to his stand. The front will remain where it is, regardless of consequences. January 3rd. The situation has become more critical as the result of the breakthrough between Maloyaroslavets and Borovsk. Kubler and Bach very excited and demand withdrawal on the north front, which is crumbling. Again a dramatic scene by Fuhrer, who doubts courage of generals to make hard decisions. But troops simply don't hold their ground when it's thirty below zero. Fuhrer orders. 
he will personally decide if any more withdrawals necessary. General Kubler had replaced Kluge on December 26th as commander of the Fourth Army when the latter took over Army Group Center. Though a tough soldier, he stood the strain only three weeks and then was relieved by General Heinrichsy. Not the Fuhrer, but the Russian army was by now deciding such matters. Hitler could force the German troops to stand fast and die, but he could no more stop the Soviet advance than King Canute could prevent the tides from coming in. At one moment of panic, some of the high command officers suggested that perhaps the situation could be retrieved by the employment of poison gas. Colonel Oxner tries to talk me into beginning gas warfare against the Russians, Holder noted in his diary on January 7th. Perhaps it was too cold. At any rate, nothing came of the suggestion. January 8th was a very critical day, as Holder noted in his journal. The breakthrough at Sukhanichi, southwest of Moscow, is becoming unbearable for Kluge. He is consequently insisting on withdrawing the Fourth Army front. All day long the field marshal was on the phone to Hitler and Holder insisting on it. Finally, in the evening, the Fuhrer reluctantly consented. Kluge was given permission to withdraw step by step in order to protect his communications. Step by step, and sometimes more rapidly throughout that grim winter, the German armies, which had planned to celebrate Christmas in Moscow, were driven back or forced by Russian encirclements and breakthroughs to retreat. By the end of February they found themselves from seventy-five to two hundred miles from the capital. By the end of that freezing month, Holder was noting in his diary the cost in men of the misfired Russian adventure. Total losses up to February 28th, he wrote down, were 1,005,636, or 31 percent of his entire force. Of these, 202,251 had been killed, 725,642 wounded, and 46,511 were missing. Casualties from frostbite were 112,627. This did not include the heavy losses among the Hungarians, Romanians, and Italians in Russia. With the coming of the spring thaws, a lull came over the long front, and Hitler and Halder began making plans for bringing up fresh troops and more tanks and guns to resume the offensive, at least on part of the front. Never again would they have the strength to attack all along the vast battle line. The bitter winter's toll and, above all, Zhukov's counteroffensive doomed that hope. But Hitler, we now know, had realized long before that his gamble of conquering Russia, not only in six months, but ever, had failed. In a diary entry of November 19, 1941, General Halder notes a long lecture of the Fuhrer to several officers of the high command. Though his armies are only a few miles from Moscow and still driving hard to capture it, Hitler has abandoned hopes of striking Russia down this year, and has already turned his thoughts to next year. Halder jotted down the leader's ideas. Goals for next year. First of all, the Caucasus. Objective? Russia's southern borders. Time? March to April. In the north, after the close of this year's campaign, Vologda or Gorky, but only at the end of May. Vologda, three hundred miles northeast of Moscow, controlled the railway to Archangel. Gorky is three hundred miles due east of the capital. Further goals for next year must remain open. They will depend on the capacity of our railroads. The question of later building an east wall also remains open. No east wall would be necessary if the Soviet Union were to be destroyed. Alder seems to have mulled over that as he listened to the Supreme Commander go on. On the whole, he concluded, one gets the impression that Hitler recognizes now that neither side can destroy the other, and that this will lead to peace negotiations. This must have been a rude awakening for the Nazi conqueror who six weeks before in Berlin had made a broadcast declaring, without any reservation, that Russia had been struck down and would never rise again. His plans had been wrecked, his hopes doomed. They were further dashed a fortnight later on December 6th when his troops began to be beaten back from the suburbs of Moscow. The next day, Sunday, December 7th, 1941, an event occurred on the other side of the round earth that transformed the European war, which he had so lightly provoked, into a world war, which, though he could not know it, would seal his fate and that of the Third Reich. Japanese bombers attacked Pearl Harbor. 
The next day, Hitler's movements and whereabouts are noted in his daily calendar book, which is among the captured documents, Hitler hurried back by train to Berlin from his headquarters at Wulschanze. He had made a solemn secret promise to Japan, and the time had come to keep it or break it. Chapter 25 The Turn of the United States Adolf Hitler's reckless promise to Japan had been made during a series of talks in Berlin with Yosuke Matsuoka, the pro-Axis Japanese foreign minister, in the spring of 1941, just before the German attack on Russia. The captured German minutes of the meetings enable us to trace the development of another one of Hitler's monumental miscalculations. They and other Nazi documents of the period show the Fuhrer too ignorant, Goering too arrogant and Ribbentrop too stupid, to comprehend the potential military strength of the United States a blunder which had been made in Germany during the First World War by Wilhelm II, Hindenburg, and Ludendorff. There was a basic contradiction from the beginning in Hitler's policy toward America. Though he had only contempt for her military prowess, he endeavored during the first two years of the conflict to keep her out of the war. This, as we have seen, was the main task of the German embassy in Washington, which went to great lengths, including the bribing of congressmen, attempting to subsidize writers and aiding the America First Committee to support the American isolationists and thus help to keep America from joining Germany's enemies in the war. That the United States, as long as it was led by President Roosevelt, stood in the way of Hitler's grandiose plans for world conquest and the dividing up of the planet among the tripartite powers, the Nazi dictator fully understood, as his various private utterances make clear. The American Republic, he saw, would have to be dealt with eventually, and, as he said, severely, but one nation at a time. That had been the secret of his successful strategy thus far. The turn of America would come, but only after Great Britain and the Soviet Union had been struck down. Then, with the aid of Japan and Italy, he would deal with the upstart Americans, who, isolated and alone, would easily succumb to the power of the victorious Axis. Japan was the key to Hitler's efforts to keep America out of the war until Germany was ready to take her on. Japan, as Ribbentrop pointed out to Mussolini on March 11, 1940, possessed the counterweight to the United States which would prevent the Americans from trying to intervene in Europe against Germany as they had in the First War. In their wartime dealings with the Japanese, Hitler and Ribbentrop at first stressed the importance of not provoking the United States to abandon her neutrality. By the beginning of 1941, they were exceedingly anxious to draw Japan into the war, not against America, not even against Russia, which they were shortly to attack, but against Britain, which had refused to give in even when apparently beaten. Early in 1941, German pressure on Japan was stepped up. On February 23rd, Ribbentrop received at his stolen estate at Fuchsel, near Salzburg, the fiery and hot-tempered Japanese ambassador, General Hiroshi Oshima who had often impressed this observer as more Nazi than the Nazis. Though the war, Ribbentrop told his guest, was already won, Japan should come in as soon as possible in its own interest and seize Britain's empire in Asia. A surprise intervention by Japan, he continued, was bound to keep America out of the war, America which at present is not armed and would hesitate to expose her navy to any risks west of Hawaii, could do this even less in such a case. If Japan would otherwise respect the American interests, there would not even be the possibility for Roosevelt to use the argument of lost prestige to make war plausible to the Americans. It was very unlikely that America would declare war if it had to stand by while Japan took the Philippines. But even if the United States did get involved, Ribbentrop declared, this would not endanger the final victory of the countries of the three-power pact. The Japanese fleet would easily defeat the American fleet, and the war would be brought rapidly to an end with the fall of both Britain and America. This was heady stuff for the fire-eating Japanese envoy, and Ribbentrop poured it on. He advised the Japanese to be firm and use plain language in their current negotiations in Washington. Only if the U.S. realized that they were confronting firm determination would they hold back. The people in the U.S., were not willing to sacrifice their sons, and therefore were against any entry into the war. The American people felt instinctively that they were being drawn into war for no reason by Roosevelt and the Jewish wire-pullers. Therefore, our policies with the U.S. should be plain and firm. The Nazi foreign minister had one warning to give, 
the one that had failed so dismally with Franco. If Germany should ever weaken, Japan would find itself confronted by a world coalition within a short time. We are all in the same boat. The fate of both countries was being determined now for centuries to come. A defeat of Germany would also mean the end of the Japanese imperialist idea. To acquaint his military commanders and the top men in the foreign office with his new Japanese policy, Hitler issued on March 5, 1941, a top-secret directive entitled Basic Order No. 24 regarding collaboration with Japan. It must be the aim of the collaboration based on the Three Power Pact to induce Japan as soon as possible to take active measures in the Far East. Strong British forces will thereby be tied down, and the center of gravity of the interests of the United States will be diverted to the Pacific. The common aim of the conduct of war is to be stressed as forcing England to her knees quickly, and thereby keeping the United States out of the war. The seizure of Singapore as the key British position in the Far East would mean a decisive success for the entire conduct of war of the three powers. Hitler also urged the Japanese seizure of other British naval bases and even American bases if the entry of the United States into the war cannot be prevented. He concluded by ordering that the Japanese must not be given any intimation of the Barbarossa operation. The Japanese ally, like the Italian ally, was to be used to further German ambitions, but neither government would be taken into the Fuhrer's confidence regarding his intention to attack Russia. A fortnight later, on March 18th, at a conference with Hitler, Keitel, and Yodel, Admiral Raider strongly urged that Japan be pressed to attack Singapore. The opportunity would never again be so favorable, Raider explained, what with the whole English fleet contained, the unpreparedness of the USA for war against Japan, and the inferiority of the U.S. fleet compared to the Japanese. The capture of Singapore, the Admiral said, would solve all the other Asiatic questions regarding the USA and England, and would of course enable Japan to avoid war with America if she wished. There was only one hitch, the Admiral opined, and mention of it must have made Hitler frown. According to naval intelligence, Raider warned, Japan would move against the British in Southeast Asia only if Germany proceeds to land in England. There is no record in the Navy minutes of this meeting indicating what reply Hitler made to this remark. Raider certainly knew that the Supreme Commander had neither plans nor hopes for a landing in England this year. Raider said something else that the Fuhrer did not respond to. He recommended that Matsuoka be advised regarding the designs on Russia. The Japanese foreign minister was now on his way to Berlin via Siberia and Moscow, uttering bellicose pro-Axis statements, as Secretary of State Hull put it, along the route. Hull made the remark to the new Japanese ambassador in Washington, Admiral Nomura, in the presence of Mr. Roosevelt on March 14th. Nomura replied that Matsuoka talked loudly for home consumption because he was ambitious politically. The Memoirs of Cordell Hull, Volume 2, pages 900 to 901. His arrival in the German capital on March 26th came at an awkward moment for Hitler, for that night the pro-German Yugoslav government was overthrown in the Belgrade coup, and the Fuhrer was so busy improvising plans to crush the obstreperous Balkan country that he had to postpone seeing the Japanese visitor until the afternoon of the 27th. Ribbentrop saw him in the morning, playing over, so to speak, the old gramophone records reserved for such guests on such occasions, though managing to be even more fatuous than usual and not allowing the dapper little Matsuoka to get in a word. The lengthy confidential minutes drawn up by Dr. Schmidt, and now among the captured foreign office papers, leave no doubt of that. The war has already been definitely won by the Axis, Ribbentrop announced, and it is only a question of time before England admits it. In the next breath, he was urging a quick attack upon Singapore, because it would be a very decisive factor in the speedy overthrow of England. In the face of such a contradiction, the diminutive Japanese visitor did not bat an eye. He sat there inscrutably, Schmidt later remembered, in no way revealing how these curious remarks impressed him. As to America, There was no doubt, Ribbentrop said, that the British would long since have abandoned the war if Roosevelt had not always given Churchill new hope. The Three Power Pact had above all had the goal of frightening America and of keeping it out of the war. America had to be prevented by all possible means from taking an active part in the war, 
and from making its aid to England too effective. The capture of Singapore would perhaps be most likely to keep America out of the war because the United States could scarcely risk sending its fleet into Japanese waters. Roosevelt would be in a very difficult position. Though Hitler had laid it down that Matsuoka must not be told about the impending German attack on Russia, a necessary precaution to keep the news from leaking out, but nevertheless, as we shall see, one that would have disastrous consequences for Germany, Ribbentrop did drop several broad hints. Relations with the Soviet Union, he told his visitor, were correct but not very friendly. Moreover, should Russia threaten Germany, the Fuhrer would crush Russia. The Fuhrer was convinced, he added, that if it came to war, there would be in a few months no more Russia. Matsuoka, says Schmidt, blinked at this and looked alarmed, whereupon Ribbentrop hastened to assure him that he did not believe that Stalin would pursue an unwise policy. At this juncture, says Schmidt, Ribbentrop was called away by Hitler to discuss the Yugoslav crisis and failed even to return for the official lunch which he was supposed to tender the distinguished visitor. In the afternoon, Hitler, having determined to smash another country, Yugoslavia, worked on the Japanese foreign minister. England has already lost the war, he began. It is only a matter of having the intelligence to admit it. Still, the British were grasping at two straws, Russia and America. Toward the Soviet Union, Hitler was more circumspect than Ribbentrop had been. He did not believe, he said, that the danger of a war with Russia would arise. After all, Germany had some 160 to 170 divisions for defense against Russia. As to the United States, America was confronted by three possibilities. She could arm herself, she could assist England, or she could wage war on another front. If she helped England, she could not arm herself. If she abandoned England, the latter would be destroyed, and America would then find herself fighting the powers of the three-power pact alone. In no case, however, could America wage war on another front. Therefore, the Fuhrer concluded, never in the human imagination could there be a better opportunity for the Japanese to strike in the Pacific than now. Such a moment, he said, laying it on as thickly as he could, would never return. It was unique in history. Matsuoka agreed, but reminded Hitler that unfortunately he did not control Japan. At the moment, he could make no pledge on behalf of the Japanese Empire that it would take action. But Hitler, being absolute dictator, could make a pledge, and he made it to Japan, quite casually and without being asked to, on April 4th, after Matsuoka had returned to Berlin from seeing Mussolini. Mussolini had told him, he informed Hitler, that America was the number one enemy, and Soviet Russia came only in second place. This second meeting took place on the eve of the Nazi attack on two more innocent countries, Yugoslavia and Greece, and the Fuhrer, thirsting for further easy conquests and for revenge on Belgrade, was in one of his warlike moods. While he considered war with the United States undesirable, he said, he had already included it in his calculations. But he did not think much of America's military power, or of anything else about the United States. His weird conception of America, by this time Hitler had come to believe his own Nazi propaganda, was given further exposition in a talk he had with Mussolini at the Russian front late in August 1941. The Fuhrer, the Italian records quote him indirectly as saying, gave a detailed account of the Jewish clique which surrounds Roosevelt and exploits the American people. He stated that he could not for anything in the world live in a country like the USA, whose conceptions of life are inspired by the most grasping commercialism, and which does not love any of the loftiest expressions of the human spirit, such as music. Chano's Diplomatic Papers, pages 449 to 452. Germany had made her preparations so that no American could land in Europe. Germany would wage a vigorous war against America with U-boats and the Luftwaffe, and with her greater experience would be more than a match for America, entirely apart from the fact that German soldiers were obviously far superior to the Americans. This boast led him to make the fateful pledge. Schmidt recorded it in his minutes. If Japan got into a conflict with the United States, Germany, on her part, would take the necessary steps at once. From Schmidt's notes, it is evident that Matsuoka did not quite grasp the significance of what the Fuhrer was promising, so Hitler said it again. Germany, as he had said, 
would promptly take part in case of a conflict between Japan and America. Hitler paid dearly not only for this assurance, so casually given, but for his deceit in not telling the Japanese about his intention to attack Russia as soon as the Balkans were occupied. Somewhat coyly, Matsuoka had asked Ribbentrop during a talk on March 28th whether on his return trip he should remain in Moscow in order to negotiate with the Russians on the non-aggression pact or the treaty of neutrality. The dull-witted Nazi foreign minister had replied smugly that Matsuoka, if possible, should not bring up the question in Moscow, since it probably would not altogether fit into the framework of the present situation. He did not quite grasp the significance of what was up. But by the next day it had penetrated his wooden mind, and he began the conversations that day by referring to it. First of all, he threw in, as casually as Hitler would do on April 4th, a German guarantee that if Russia attacked Japan, Germany would strike immediately. He wanted to give this assurance, he said, so that Japan could push southward toward Singapore without fear of any complications with Russia. When Matsuoka finally admitted that while in Moscow on his way to Berlin, he himself had proposed a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union, and hinted that the Russians were favorably inclined toward it, Ribbentrop's mind again became somewhat of a blank. He merely advised that Matsuoka handle the problem in a superficial way. But as soon as the Nipponese foreign minister was back in Moscow on his trip home, he signed a treaty of neutrality with Stalin which, as Ambassador von der Schulenberg, who foresaw its consequences, wired Berlin, provided for each country to remain neutral in case the other got involved in the war. This was one treaty. It was signed on April 13th, which Japan honored to the very last, despite subsequent German exhortations that she disregard it. For before the summer of 1941 was out, the Nazis would be begging the Japanese to attack not Singapore or Manila, but Vladivostok. At first, however, Hitler did not grasp the significance of the Russo-Japanese neutrality pact. On April 20th, he told Admiral Rader, who inquired about it, that it had been made with Germany's acquiescence, and that he welcomed it, because Japan is now restrained from taking action against Vladivostok and should be induced to attack Singapore instead. News of the signing in Moscow of the Soviet-Japanese neutrality pact caused considerable alarm in Washington where Roosevelt and Hull were inclined to take a view similar to Hitler's. Namely, that the treaty would release Japanese forces earmarked for a possible war with Russia for action farther south against British and perhaps American possessions. Sherwood discloses that on April 13th, when the news of the conclusion of the pact was received, the President scrapped a plan for launching aggressive action by U.S. naval ships against German U-boats in the western Atlantic. A new order called merely for American warships to report movements of German naval vessels west of Iceland, not to shoot at them. It was considered that the new Japanese-Soviet neutrality agreement made the situation in the Pacific too dangerous to risk too much in the Atlantic. Robert E. Sherwood, Roosevelt and Hopkins, page 291. At this stage, Hitler was confident Germany could destroy Russia during the summer. He did not want Japan to share in this mighty feat, any more than he had desired that Italy should share in the conquest of France, and he was absolutely confident that Japanese help would not be needed. Ribbentrop, echoing his master's thoughts, had told Matsuoka on March 29th that if Russia forced Germany to strike, he would consider it proper if the Japanese army were prevented from attacking Russia. But the views of Hitler and Ribbentrop on this matter changed very suddenly and quite drastically scarcely three months later. Six days after the Nazi armies were flung into Russia, on June 28, 1941, Ribbentrop was cabling the German ambassador in Tokyo, General Eugen Ott, to do everything he could to get the Japanese to promptly attack Soviet Russia in the rear. Ott was advised to appeal to the Japanese appetite for spoils, and also to argue that this was the best way of keeping America neutral. It may be expected, Ribbentrop explained, that the rapid defeat of Soviet Russia, especially should Japan take action in the East, will prove the best argument to convince the United States of the utter futility of entering the war on the side of a Great Britain entirely isolated and confronted by the most powerful alliance in the world. Matsuoka was in favor of immediately turning on Russia, but his views were not accepted by the government in Tokyo, whose attitude seemed to be that if the Germans were rapidly defeating the Russians, as they claimed, they needed no help from the Japanese. 
However, Tokyo was not so sure about a lightning Nazi victory, and this was the real reason for its stand. But Ribbentrop persisted. On July 10th, when the German offensive in Russia was really beginning to roll, and even Halder, as we have seen, thought that victory already had been won, the Nazi foreign minister got off from his special train on the Eastern Front a new and stronger cable to his ambassador in Tokyo. Since Russia, as reported by the Japanese ambassador in Moscow, is in effect close to collapse, it is simply impossible that Japan does not solve the matter of Vladivostok and the Siberian area as soon as her military preparations are completed. I ask you to employ all available means in further insisting upon Japan's entry into the war against Russia at the soonest possible date. The sooner this entry is effected, the better it is. The natural objective still remains that we and Japan join hands on the Trans-Siberian Railroad before winter starts. Such a giddy prospect did not turn the head of even the militaristic Japanese government. Four days later, Ambassador Ott replied that he was doing his best to persuade the Japanese to attack Russia as soon as possible, that Matsuoka was all for it, but that he, Ott, had to fight against great obstacles in the Tokyo cabinet. As a matter of fact, the fire-eating Matsuoka was soon forced out of the cabinet. With his departure, Germany lost, for the time being, its best friend. And though, as we shall see, closer relations were later restored between Berlin and Tokyo, they never became close enough to convince the Japanese of the wisdom of helping Germany in the war against Russia. Once more, Hitler had been bested at his own game by a wily ally. Ribbentrop kept trying all that fall and several times during the next two years to induce the Japanese to fall upon Russia from the rear, but each time the Tokyo government replied politely, in effect, so sorry, please. Hitler himself remained hopeful all through the summer. On August 26th, he told Raider he was convinced that Japan will carry out the attack on Vladivostok as soon as forces have been assembled. The present aloofness can be explained by the fact that the assembling of forces is to be accomplished undisturbed, and the attack is to come as a surprise. The Japanese archives reveal how Tokyo evaded the Germans on this embarrassing question. When, for instance, on August 19th, Ambassador Ott asked the Japanese Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs about Japan's intervention against Russia, the latter replied, For Japan to do a thing like attacking Russia would be a very serious question, and would require profound reflection. When on August 30th, Ott, who by now was a very irritated ambassador, asked Foreign Minister Admiral Toyoda, is there any possibility that Japan may participate in the Russo-German War? Toyota replied, Japan's preparations are now making headway, and it will take more time for their completion. Avoid Incidents with the USA With Japan stubbornly refusing to help pull Hitler's chestnuts out of the fire in Russia, the Japanese had their own chestnuts roasting, it became all the more important to Germany that the United States be kept out of the war until the Soviet Union had been conquered, as the Fuhrer was confident that summer of 1941 it would be before winter came. The German Navy had long chafed under the restraints which Hitler had imposed on its efforts to curtail American shipments to Britain and to cope with the increasing belligerency of U.S. warships toward German U-boats and surface craft operating in the Atlantic. The Nazi admirals, looking further afield than Hitler's landlocked mind was capable of doing, had almost from the first regarded America's entry into the war as inevitable, and they had urged the supreme commander to prepare for it. Immediately after the fall of France in June 1940, Admiral Raider, backed by Goering, had urged Hitler to seize not only French West Africa, but, more important, the Atlantic Islands, including Iceland, the Azores, and the Canaries, to prevent the United States from occupying them. Hitler had expressed interest, but he first wanted to invade England and conquer Russia. Then the upstart Americans, their position rendered hopeless, would be taken care of. A top-secret memorandum of Major Freiherr von Falkenstein, of the General Staff, discloses Hitler's views at the end of the summer in 1940. The Fuhrer is at present occupied with the question of the occupation of the Atlantic Islands with a view to the prosecution of war against America at a later date. Deliberations on this subject are being embarked on here. It was not a question, then, of whether or not Hitler intended to go to war against the United States, but of the date he would choose to embark on it. By the following spring, the date was beginning to sprout in the Fuhrer's mind. On May 22, 1941, Admiral Raider conferred with the Supreme Commander, 
and reported ruefully that the Navy must reject the idea of occupying the Azores. It simply didn't have the strength. But by this time Hitler had warmed to the project, and according to Raider's confidential notes, replied, The Fuhrer is still in favor of occupying the Azores in order to be able to operate long-range bombers from there against the USA. The occasion for this may arise by autumn. The Germans had no long-range bombers capable of reaching the American coast from the Azores, much less getting back, and it is a sign of the warping of Hitler's mind by this time that he conjured up the non-existent long-range bombers. After the fall of the Soviet Union, that is. The turn of the United States would come then. He put this clearly to Raider when the Admiral saw him just two months later on July 25th, when the offensive in Russia was in full swing. After the Eastern Campaign, Raider notes him as saying, he reserves the right to take severe action against the USA. But until then, Hitler emphasized to his Navy chief, he wanted to avoid having the USA declare war out of consideration for the Army, which is involved in heavy combat. Raider was not satisfied with this stand. In fact, his diary accounts of his meetings with Hitler, which one can now peruse in the captured documents, show his growing impatience at the raps which the Fuhrer had placed on the German Navy. At every interview he sought to change the leader's mind. Early that year, on February 4th, Raider submitted a memorandum to Hitler in which the Navy expressed strong doubts about the value of continued American neutrality, as it was working out, to Germany. In fact, the admirals argued that America's entry into the war might even prove advantageous for the German war effort, if Japan thereby became a belligerent on the side of the Axis. But the Nazi dictator was not impressed by the argument. Raider was greatly discouraged. The Battle of the Atlantic was at its height, and Germany was not winning it. American supplies under the Lend-Lease Agreement were pouring into Britain. The Pan-American Neutrality Patrol was making it more and more difficult for the U-boats to be effective. All this Raider pointed out to Hitler, but without much effect. He saw the leader again on March 18th and reported that U.S. warships were escorting American convoys bound for Britain as far as Iceland. He demanded authority to attack them without warning. He asked that something be done to prevent the USA from gaining a foothold in French West Africa. This possibility, he said, was most dangerous. Hitler listened and said he would discuss these matters with the Foreign Office, of all places, which was one way of putting the admirals off. All through the spring and early summer, he continued to put them off. On April 20th, he refused to listen to Raider's pleas for warfare against merchant ships of the USA, according to prize regulations. The first recorded clash between American and German war vessels had occurred on April 10th, when the U.S. destroyer Niblack dropped depth charges on a German U-boat which showed signs of attacking. On May 22nd, Raider was back at the Berghof with a long memorandum suggesting countermeasures to President Roosevelt's unfriendly acts, but he could not move his supreme commander. The Fuhrer, the Admiral noted, considers the attitude of the President of the United States still undecided. Under no circumstances does he wish to cause incidents which would result in U.S. entry into the war. There was all the more reason to avoid such incidents when the campaign in Russia began. And on June 21st, the day before the attack commenced, Hitler emphasized this to Raider. The Grand Admiral had given him a glowing account of how the U-253, spotting the U.S. battleship Texas and an accompanying destroyer within the blockade zone in the North Atlantic proclaimed by Germany, had chased and attempted to attack them, and had added that, where the USA is concerned, firm measures are always more effective than apparent yielding. The Fuhrer agreed with the principle, but not with the specific action and once more he admonished the Navy. The Fuhrer declares in detail that until Operation Barbarossa is well underway, he wishes to avoid any incident with the USA. After a few weeks, the situation will become clearer and can be expected to have a favorable effect on the USA and Japan. America will have less inclination to enter the war due to the threat from Japan, which will then increase. If possible, therefore, in the next weeks, all attacks on naval vessels in the closed area should cease. When Raider attempted to argue that at night it was difficult to distinguish enemy from neutral warships, Hitler cut him short by instructing him to issue new orders to avoid incidents with America. As a result, the Navy chief sent out orders the same night calling off attacks on any naval vessels inside or outside the closed area, unless they were definitely identified as British. A similar order was given the Luftwaffe. 
On July 9th, President Roosevelt announced that American forces were taking over the occupation of Iceland from the British. The reaction in Berlin was immediate and violent. Ribbentrop cabled Tokyo that this intrusion of American military forces in support of England into a territory which has been officially proclaimed by us to be a combat area is in itself an aggression against Germany and Europe. Raider hurried to Wulfschanze, from where the Führer was directing his armies in Russia. He wanted a decision, he said, on whether the occupation of Iceland by the USA is to be considered as an entry into the war or as an act of provocation which should be ignored. As for the German Navy, it considered the American landings in Iceland an act of war, and in a two-page memorandum it reminded the Führer of all the other acts of aggression against Germany committed by the Roosevelt government. Moreover, the Navy demanded the right to sink American freighters in the convoy area and to attack U.S. warships if the occasion required it. It might be noted here that, on the stand at Nuremberg, Admiral Rader insisted that he did everything possible to avoid provoking the United States into war. Hitler refused. The Führer explains in detail, Rader's report on the meeting declares, that he is most anxious to postpone the United States' entry into the war for another one or two months. On the one hand, the Eastern Campaign must be carried on with the entire Air Force, which he does not wish to divert even in part. On the other hand, a victorious campaign on the Eastern Front will have a tremendous effect on the whole situation and probably on the attitude of the USA. Therefore, for the time being, he does not wish the existing instructions changed, but rather wants to be sure that incidents will be avoided. When Raider argued that his naval commanders could not be held responsible for a mistake if American ships were hit, Hitler retorted that at least in regard to war vessels, the Navy had better definitely establish that they were enemy craft before attacking. To make sure that the admirals understood him correctly, the Führer issued a specific order on July 19th stipulating that, in the extended zone of operations, U.S. merchant ships, whether single or sailing in English or American convoys, and if recognized as such before resort to arms, are not to be attacked. Within the blockade area, which was also recognized by the United States as being out of bounds, American vessels could be attacked, but Hitler specifically laid it down in this order that this war zone did not include the USA-Iceland sea route. But mistakes, as Raider said, were bound to occur. On May 21st, a U-boat had sunk the American freighter Robin Moore en route to South Africa and at a place well outside the German blockade zone. Two more American merchant vessels were torpedoed toward the end of the summer. On September 4th, a German submarine fired two torpedoes at the U.S. destroyer Greer, both missing. A week later, on September 11th, Roosevelt reacted to this attack in a speech in which he announced that he had given orders to the Navy to shoot on sight and warned that Axis warships entering the American defense zone did so at their peril. The speech incensed Berlin. In the Nazi press, Roosevelt was attacked as warmonger number one. Ribbentrop recalled at Nuremberg that Hitler was greatly excited. However, by the time Admiral Rader arrived at the Wolfschanze headquarters on the Eastern Front on the afternoon of September 17th to urge a drastic retaliation to the shoot-on-sight order, the Führer had calmed down. To the Admiral's plea that the German Navy at least be released from the restrictions against attacking American ships, the Supreme Commander again gave a firm no. Since it appears that the end of September will bring the great decision in the Russian campaign, Raider's record of the conversation declares, the Führer requests that care be taken to avoid any incidents in the war on merchant shipping before about the middle of October. Therefore, Raider noted sadly, the Commander-in-Chief, Navy, and the Commanding Admiral submarines, Dernitz, withdraw their suggestions. The submarines are to be informed of the reason for temporarily keeping to the old orders. In view of the circumstances, Hitler was certainly behaving with unaccustomed restraint, but admittedly it was more difficult for the young U-boat commanders, operating in the stormy waters of the North Atlantic and constantly harassed by increasingly effective British anti-submarine measures, in which U.S. war vessels sometimes joined, to restrain themselves. Hitler had told Raider in July that he would never call a submarine skipper to account if he sank an American ship by mistake. On November 9th, in his annual address to the Nazi Old Guard at the familiar beer cellar in Munich, he answered Roosevelt's speech. President Roosevelt has ordered his ships to shoot the moment they sight German ships. I have ordered German ships not to shoot when they sight American vessels, 
but to defend themselves when attacked. I will have any German officer court-martialed who fails to defend himself. And on November 13th, he issued a new directive ordering that while engagements with American warships were to be avoided as far as possible, German submarines must defend themselves against attack. They had, of course, already done that. On the night of October 16th to 17th, the U.S. destroyer Kearney, coming to the aid of a convoy which was being attacked by German submarines, dropped depth charges on one of them which retaliated by torpedoing it. Eleven men of the crew were killed. These were the first American casualties in the undeclared war with Germany. More were to quickly follow. On October 31st, the U.S. destroyer Reuben James was torpedoed and sunk while on convoy duty, with the loss of 100 men of 145 in its crew, including all its seven officers. Thus, long before the final formalities of declaring war, a shooting war had begun. History has recorded who fired the first shot, Roosevelt declared in reference to this incident in a Navy Day speech on October 27th. In all fairness, it would seem that in dropping depth charges, the United States fired the first shot. According to the confidential German Navy records, this was not the first such occasion. The official U.S. naval historian confirms that as early as April 10th, the Niblack attacked a U-boat with depth charges. Samuel Elliott Morrison, History of the United States Naval Operations in World War II, Volume 1, page 57. Japan plays its own game. Japan, as we have seen, had been assigned by Hitler the role not of bringing the United States into the war, but of keeping her, at least for the time being, out of it. He knew that if the Japanese took Singapore and threatened India, this would not only be a severe blow to the British, but would divert America's attention and some of her energies from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Even after he began begging the Japanese to attack Vladivostok, he saw in this a means not only to help him bring Russia down, but to further pressure the United States into remaining neutral. Strangely enough, it never seems to have occurred to him or to anyone else in Germany until very late that Japan had her own fish to fry, and that the Japanese might be fearful of embarking on a grand offensive in Southeast Asia against the British and Dutch, not to mention attacking Russia in the rear, until they had secured their own rear by destroying the United States Pacific Fleet. True, the Nazi conqueror had promised Matsuoka that Germany would go to war with America if Japan did, but Matsuoka was no longer in the government, and besides, Hitler had constantly nagged the Japanese to avoid a direct conflict with America and concentrate on Britain and the Soviet Union, whose resistance was preventing him from winning the war. It did not dawn on the Nazi rulers that Japan might give first priority to a direct challenge to the United States. Not that Berlin wanted the Japanese and Americans to reach an understanding. That would defeat the main purpose of the Tripartite Pact, which was to frighten the Americans into staying out of the war. For once, Ribbentrop probably gave an honest and accurate appraisal of the Fuhrer's thoughts on this when he told an interrogator at Nuremberg, He, Hitler, was afraid that if an arrangement were made between the United States and Japan, this would mean, so to speak, the back free for America, and an unexpected attack or entry into the war by the United States would come quicker. He was worried about an agreement because there were certain groups in Japan who wanted to come to an arrangement with America. One member of such a group was Admiral Kichi Saburo Nomura, who arrived in Washington in February 1941 as the new Japanese ambassador, and whose series of confidential conversations with Cordell Hull, which began in March, with the aim of settling peacefully the differences between the two countries, and which continued right up to the end, gave considerable worry to Berlin. I credit Nomura, Hull wrote later in his memoirs, with having been honestly sincere in trying to avoid war between his country and mine. The Memoirs of Cordell Hull, Volume 2, page 987. In fact, the Germans did their best to sabotage the Washington talks. As early as May 15, 1941, Weizsäcker submitted a memorandum to Ribbentrop pointing out that any political treaty between Japan and the United States is undesirable at the present, and arguing that unless it were prevented, Japan might be lost to the Axis. General Ott, the Nazi ambassador in Tokyo, called frequently at the Foreign Office to warn against the hull nomura negotiations. When, in spite of this, they continued, the Germans switched to a new maneuver of trying to induce the Japanese to make as a condition for their continuation that the United States abandon its aid to Britain and its hostile policies toward Germany. That was in May. The summer brought a change. 
In July, Hitler was concerned mainly with badgering Japan into attacking the Soviet Union. And that month, Secretary Hull broke off the talks with Nomura because the Japanese had invaded French into China. They were resumed toward the middle of August when the Japanese government proposed a personal meeting between Premier Prince Konoye and President Roosevelt for the purpose of arriving at a peaceful settlement. This did not please Berlin at all, and the indefatigable Ott was soon at the Tokyo Foreign Office expressing Nazi displeasure with this turn of events. Both Foreign Minister Admiral Toyota and Vice Minister Amao told him blandly that the proposed Konoye roosevelt talks would merely advance the purpose of the Tripartite Pact which, they reminded him, was to prevent American participation in the war. In the autumn, as the hull nomura talks continued, the Wilhelmstrasse switched back to the old tactics of the spring. It insisted in Tokyo that Nomura be instructed to warn the United States that if it continued its unfriendly acts toward the European axis, Germany and Italy might have to declare war, and that in this case Japan, under the terms of the Tripartite Pact, would have to join them. Hitler still did not want America in the war. The move was made, in fact, to bluff Washington into staying out while at the same time affording some relief from American belligerency in the Atlantic. Secretary Hull learned immediately of this new German pressure, thanks to magic, as it was called, which since the end of 1940 had enabled the American government to decode intercepted Japanese cable and wireless messages in Tokyo's most secret ciphers. Not only those sent to and from Washington, but those to and from Berlin and other capitals. The German demand was cabled by Toyota to Nomura on October 16, 1941, along with instructions to present a watered-down version to Hull. That day the Konoye government fell and was replaced by a military cabinet headed by the hot-headed belligerent General Hideki Tojo. In Berlin, General Oshima, a warrior of similar caste, hastened to the Wilhelmstrasse to explain the good news to the German government. Tojo's appearance at the post as premier meant, the ambassador said, that Japan would draw closer to its Axis partners and that the talks in Washington would cease. Whether on purpose or not, he neglected to tell his Nazi friends what the consequences of the cessation of those talks must be, and that Tojo's appointment therefore meant a good deal more than they suspected, namely, that his new government was determined to go to war with the United States unless the Washington negotiations swiftly ended, with President Roosevelt accepting the Japanese terms for a free hand, not to attack Russia, but to occupy Southeast Asia. This course had never entered the minds of Ribbentrop and Hitler, who still envisaged Japan as useful and helpful to German interests only if she attacked Siberia and Singapore, and frightened Washington into worrying about the Pacific and staying out of the war. The Führer and, of course, his doltish foreign minister had never understood that the failure of the Nomura Hull negotiations in Washington, which they so greatly desired, would bring the very result they had been trying to avoid until the time was ripe, America's entry into the world conflict. Prince Konoye's post-war memoirs revealed that as early as August 4th he was forced to agree to a demand of the army that if, in his proposed meeting with Roosevelt, the President did not accept Japan's terms, he would walk out of the meeting with the determination to make war on the United States. Hull, Memoirs, pages 1025 to 1026. The sands were now rapidly running out. On November 15th, Saburo Kurusu arrived in Washington as a special ambassador to aid Nomura in the negotiations, but Secretary Hull soon sensed that the diplomat, who as the Japanese envoy in Berlin had signed the Tripartite Pact and was somewhat pro-German, had brought no fresh proposals with him. His purpose, Hull thought, was to try to persuade Washington to accept the Japanese terms at once, or, if that failed, to lull the American government with talk until Japan was ready to strike a heavy surprise blow. On November 19th came the ominous winds message to Nomura from Tokyo, which Hull's cryptographers promptly deciphered. If the Japanese newscaster on the shortwave Tokyo broadcast, which the embassy picked up daily, inserted the words, East Wind, Rain, that would mean that the Japanese government had decided on war with America. Nomura was instructed on receipt of the wind's warning to destroy all his codes and confidential papers. Now Berlin awoke to what was up. The day before the wind's message, on November 18th, 
Ribbentrop was somewhat surprised to receive a request from Tokyo asking Germany to sign a treaty in which the two nations would agree not to conclude a separate peace with common enemies. Just which enemies the Japanese meant was not clear, but the Nazi foreign minister obviously hoped that Russia was the first of them. He agreed in principle to the proposal, apparently in the comforting belief that Japan at last was about to honor its vague promises to hit the Soviet Union in Siberia. This was most welcome and timely, for the resistance of the Red Army on the broad front was becoming formidable, and the Russian winter was setting in, much earlier than had been anticipated. A Japanese attack on Vladivostok and the Pacific Maritime provinces might provide that extra ounce of pressure which would bring a Soviet collapse. Ribbentrop was swiftly disillusioned. On November 23rd, Ambassador Ott wired him from Tokyo that all indications were that the Japanese were moving south with the intention of occupying Thailand and the Dutch-held Borneo oil fields, and that the Japanese government wanted to know if Germany would make common cause with her if she were to start a war. This information plainly meant that Japan would not strike against Russia, but was contemplating starting a war with the Netherlands and Britain in the South Pacific, which well might embroil her in an armed conflict with the United States. But Ribbentrop and Ott did not grasp the last point. Their exchanges of telegrams during these days show that though they now realized, to their disappointment, that Japan would not attack Russia, they believed that her move southward would be against the possessions of the Dutch and British, and not those of the United States. Uncle Sam, as Hitler desired, would be kept on the sidelines until his time came. Nazi misapprehensions were due in large part to the failure at this juncture of the Japanese to take the German government into their confidence as to their fateful decisions regarding America. Secretary Hull, thanks to the magic codebreaker, was much better informed. As early as November 5th, he knew that the new foreign minister, Shigenori Togo, had wired Nomura setting a deadline of November 25th for the signing of an agreement on Japan's terms with the American government. The final Japanese proposals were delivered in Washington on November 20th. Hull and Roosevelt knew they were final because two days later, magic decoded for them a message from Togo to Nomura and Kurusu, which said so, while extending the deadline to November 29th. There are reasons beyond your ability to guess, Togo wired his ambassadors, why we wanted to settle Japanese-American relations by the 25th. But if the signing can be completed by the 29th, we have decided to wait until that date. This time we mean it, that the deadline absolutely cannot be changed. After that, things are automatically going to happen. November 25, 1941, is a crucial date. On that day, the Japanese carrier task force sailed for Pearl Harbor. In Washington, Hull went to the White House to warn the War Council of the danger confronting the country from Japan, and to stress to the U.S. Army and Navy chiefs the possibility of Japanese surprise attacks. In Berlin that day there was a somewhat grotesque ceremony in which the three Axis powers, amid much pomp and ceremony, renewed the anti common Turn Pact of 1936, an empty gesture which, as some Germans noted, did absolutely nothing to get Japan into the war against Russia, but which afforded the pompous Ribbentrop an opportunity to denounce Roosevelt as the chief culprit of this war and to shed crocodile tears for the truthful, religious American people betrayed by such an irresponsible leader. The Nazi foreign minister seems to have become intoxicated by his own words. He called in Oshima on the evening of November 28th, following a lengthy council of war earlier that day presided over by Hitler, and gave the Japanese ambassador the impression that the German attitude toward the United States, as Oshima promptly radioed Tokyo, had considerably stiffened. Hitler's policy of doing everything possible to keep America out of the war until Germany was ready to take her on seemed about to be jettisoned. Suddenly, Ribbentrop was urging the Japanese to go to war against the United States as well as Britain and promising the backing of the Third Reich. After warning Oshima that if Japan hesitates, all the military might of Britain and the United States will be concentrated against Japan, a rather silly thesis as long as the European war continued, Ribbentrop added, As Hitler said today, there are fundamental differences in the very right to exist between Germany and Japan and the United States. We have received advice to the effect that there is practically no hope of the Japanese-U.S. negotiations being concluded successfully because the United States is putting up a stiff front. 
If this is indeed the fact of the case, and if Japan reaches a decision to fight Britain and the United States, I am confident that that not only will be in the interest of Germany and Japan jointly, but will bring about favorable results for Japan herself. The ambassador, a tense little man, was agreeably surprised, but he wanted to be sure he understood correctly. Is your excellency, he asked, indicating that a state of actual war is to be established between Germany and the United States? Ribbentrop hesitated. Perhaps he had gone too far. Roosevelt is a fanatic, he replied, so it is impossible to tell what he would do. This seemed a strange and unsatisfactory answer to Oshima in view of what the foreign minister had said just before, and toward the end of the talk he insisted on coming back to the main point. What would Germany do if the war were actually extended to countries which have been aiding Britain? Should Japan become engaged in a war against the United States, Ribbentrop replied, Germany, of course, would join the war immediately. There is absolutely no possibility of Germany's entering into a separate peace with the United States under such circumstances. The Fuhrer is determined on that point. This was the flat guarantee for which the Japanese government had been waiting. True, Hitler had given a similar one in the spring to Matsuoka, but it seemed to have been forgotten during the intervening period when he had become vexed at Japan's refusal to join in the war on Russia. All that remained now, so far as the Japanese were concerned, was to get the Germans to put their assurance in writing. General Oshima joyfully filed his report to Tokyo on November 29th. Fresh instructions reached him in Berlin the next day. The Washington talks, he was informed, now stand ruptured, broken. Will Your Honor, the message directed, therefore immediately interview Chancellor Hitler and Foreign Minister Ribbentrop, and confidentially communicate to them a summary of developments. Say to them that lately England and the United States have taken a provocative attitude, both of them. Say that they are planning to move military forces into various places in East Asia, and that we will inevitably have to counter by also moving troops. Say very secretly to them that there is extreme danger that war may suddenly break out between Japan and the Anglo-Saxon nations through some clash of arms, and add that the time of the breaking out of that war may come quicker than anyone dreams. Hull says that he received a copy of this message through magic. Thus Washington, as well as Berlin, knew by the last day of November that the Japanese might strike against the United States quicker than anyone dreamt. Hull, Memoirs, page 1092. The Japanese carrier fleet was now well on its way to Pearl Harbor. Tokyo was in a hurry to get Germany to sign. On the same day that Oshima was receiving his new instructions, November 30th, the Japanese foreign minister was conferring with the German ambassador in Tokyo, to whom he emphasized that the Washington talks had broken down because Japan refused to accede to American demands that she abandon the tripartite pact. The Japanese hoped the Germans would appreciate this sacrifice in a common cause. Grave decisions are at stake, Togo told General Ott. The United States is seriously preparing for war. Japan is not afraid of a breakdown in negotiations, and she hopes that in that case Germany and Italy, according to the Three Power Agreement, will stand at her side. I answered, Ott radioed Berlin, that there could be no doubt about Germany's future position. Japanese foreign minister thereupon stated that he understood from my words that Germany in such a case would consider her relationship to Japan as that of a community of fate. I answered, according to my opinion, Germany was certainly ready to have mutual agreement between the two countries on this situation. On the Eve of Pearl Harbor General Oshima was a great lover of German-Austrian classical music and despite the gravity and tenseness of the situation, he took off for Austria to enjoy a Mozart festival. But he was not permitted to listen to the great Austrian composer's lovely music for long. An urgent call on December 1st brought him rushing back to his embassy in Berlin, where he found new instructions to get busy and sign up Germany on the dotted line. There was no time to lose. And now, when cornered, Ribbentrop stalled. Apparently realizing fully for the first time the consequences of his rash promises to the Japanese, the Nazi foreign minister grew exceedingly cool and evasive. He told Oshima late on the evening of December 1st that he would first have to consult the Fuhrer before making any definite commitment. The Japanese ambassador returned it to the Wilhelmstrasse on Wednesday, the 3rd, 
to press his case, but again Ribbentrop put him off. To Oshima's pleas that the situation had become extremely critical, the foreign minister replied that while he personally was for a written agreement, the matter would have to wait until the Fuhrer returned from headquarters later in the week. Actually, as Chano noted in his diary, not without a sign of glee, Hitler had flown to the southern front in Russia to see General von Kleist, whose armies continued to fall back under the pressure of an unexpected offensive. The Japanese by this time had also turned to Mussolini, who was not at any front. On December 3rd, the Japanese ambassador in Rome called on the Duce and formally asked Italy to declare war on the United States in accordance with the Tripartite Pact as soon as the conflict with America should begin. The ambassador also wanted a treaty specifying that there would be no separate peace. The Japanese interpreter, Chano noted in his diary, was trembling like a leaf. As for the Duce, he was pleased to comply after consultation with Berlin. The German capital, Chano found the next day, had grown extremely cautious. Maybe they will go ahead, he began his diary on December 4th, because they can't do otherwise. But the idea of provoking American intervention is less and less liked by the Germans. Mussolini, on the other hand, is happy about it. Regardless of Ribbentrop's opinion, which Hitler surprisingly still paid some attention to, the decision as to whether Germany would give a formal guarantee to Japan could be taken only by the Nazi warlord himself. During the night of December 4th to 5th, the foreign minister apparently got the Fuhrer's go-ahead, and at 3 a.m. he handed General Oshima a draft of the requested treaty in which Germany would join Japan in war against the United States and agree not to make a separate peace. Having taken the fateful plunge and followed his leader in reversing a policy that had been clung to stubbornly for two years, he could not refrain from seeing that his Italian ally promptly followed suit. A night interrupted by Ribbentrop's restiveness, Chano began his diary on December 5th. After having delayed two days, he now hasn't a minute to lose in answering the Japanese. And at three o'clock in the morning, he sends Ambassador Mackensen to my house to submit a plan for a tripartite pact of Japanese intervention and the promise not to make a separate peace. They wanted me to wake up the Duce, but I did not do it, and the Duce was very pleased. The Japanese had a draft treaty approved by both Hitler and Mussolini, but they did not yet have it signed, and this worried them. They suspected that the Fuhrer was stalling because he wanted a quid pro quo. If Germany joined at Japan in the war against the United States, Japan would have to join Germany in the war against Russia. In his telegram of instructions to Oshima on November 30th, the Japanese foreign minister had given some advice on how to handle this ticklish problem if the Germans and Italians raised it. If they question you about our attitude toward the Soviet, say that we have already clarified our attitude toward the Russians in our statement of last July. Say that by our present moves southward we do not mean to relax our pressure against the Soviet, and that if Russia joins hands tighter with England and the United States and resists us with hostilities, we are ready to turn upon her with all our might. However, right now it is to our advantage to stress the south, and for the time being we would prefer to refrain from any direct moves in the north. December 6th came. Zhukov that very day launched his counteroffensive in front of Moscow, and the German armies reeled back in the snow and bitter cold. There was all the more reason for Hitler to demand his quid pro quo. On this question there was great uneasiness in the foreign office in Tokyo. The naval task force was now within flying distance of Pearl Harbor for its carrier planes. So far, miraculously, it had not been discovered by American ships or aircraft but it might be any moment. A long message was being radioed from Tokyo to Nomura and Kurusu in Washington, instructing them to call on Secretary Hull at precisely 1 p.m. the next day, Sunday, December 7th, to present Japan's rejection of the latest American proposals, and stressing that the negotiations were de facto ruptured. In desperation, Tokyo turned to Berlin for a written guarantee of German support. The Japanese warlords still did not trust the Germans enough to inform them of the blow against the United States, which would fall the next day. But they were more worried than ever that Hitler would refrain from giving his guarantee unless Japan agreed to take on not only the United States and Great Britain, but the Soviet Union as well. In this predicament, Togo got off a long message to Ambassador Oshima in Berlin, urging him to somehow stall the Germans on the Russian matter and not to give in unless it became absolutely necessary. Deluded though they were about their ability to deal with the Americans and the British, 
The Japanese generals and admirals retained enough sense to realize that they could not fight the Russians at the same time, even with German help. Togo's instructions to Oshima on that fateful Saturday, December 6th, which are among the intercepted messages decoded by Secretary Hull's expert decipherers, give an interesting insight into the diplomacy practiced by the Nipponese with the Third Reich at the eleventh hour. We would like to avoid an armed clash with Russia until strategic circumstances permit it. So get the German government to understand this position of ours and negotiate with them so that at least for the present they will not insist upon exchanging diplomatic notes on this question. Explain to them at considerable length that insofar as American materials being shipped to Soviet Russia, they are neither of high quality nor of large quantity, and that in case we start our war with the United States we will capture all American ships destined for Soviet Russia. Please endeavor to come to an understanding on this line. However, should Ribbentrop insist upon our giving a guarantee in this matter, since in that case we shall have no other recourse, make a statement to the effect that we would, as a matter of principle, prevent war materials from being shipped from the United States to Soviet Russia via Japanese waters, and get them to agree to a procedure permitting the addition of a statement to the effect that, so long as strategic reasons continue to make it necessary for us to keep Soviet Russia from fighting Japan, what I mean is that we cannot capture Soviet ships, we cannot carry this out thoroughly. In case the German government refuses to agree with the above and makes their approval of this question absolutely conditional upon our participation in the war and upon our concluding a treaty against making a separate peace, we have no way but to postpone the conclusion of such a treaty. The Japanese need not have worried so much, for reasons unknown to the Tokyo militarists or to anyone else and which defy logic and understanding, Hitler did not insist on Japan's taking on Russia along with the United States and Britain, though if he had, the course of the war conceivably might have been different. At any rate, the Japanese on this Saturday evening of December 6th, 1941, were determined to strike a telling blow against the United States in the Pacific, though no one in Washington or Berlin knew just where or even exactly when. That morning, the British Admiralty had tipped off the American government that a large Japanese invasion fleet had been observed heading across the Gulf of Siam for the Isthmus of Kra, which indicated that the Nipponese were striking first at Thailand and perhaps Malaya. At 9 p.m., President Roosevelt got off a personal message to the Emperor of Japan, imploring him to join him in finding ways of dispelling the dark clouds, and at the same time warning him that a thrust of the Japanese military forces into Southeast Asia would create a situation that was unthinkable. At the Navy Department, intelligence officers drew up their latest report on the location of the major warships of the Japanese Navy. It listed most of them as being in home ports, including all the carriers and other warships of the task force which, at that very moment, had steamed to within three hundred miles of Pearl Harbor and was tuning up its bombers to take off at dawn. On that Saturday evening, too, the Navy Department informed the President and Mr. Hull that the Japanese Embassy was destroying its codes. It had first had to decipher Togo's long message, which had dribbled in all afternoon in fourteen parts. The Navy decoders were also deciphering it as fast as it came in, and by 9.30 p.m. a naval officer was at the White House with translations of the first thirteen parts. Mr. Roosevelt, who was with Harry Hopkins in the study, read it and said, This means war but exactly when and just where the message did not say and the President did not know. Even Admiral Nomura did not know, nor far off in Eastern Europe did Adolf Hitler. He knew less than Roosevelt. Hitler Declares War The Japanese onslaught on the U.S. Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor at 7.30 a.m. local time on Sunday, December 7, 1941, caught Berlin as completely by surprise as it did Washington. Though Hitler had made an oral promise to Matsuoka that Germany would join Japan in a war against the United States, and Ribbentrop had made another to Ambassador Oshima, the assurance had not yet been signed, and the Japanese had not breathed a word to the Germans about Pearl Harbor. It was long believed by many that Hitler knew in advance the exact hour of the attack on Pearl Harbor, but I have been unable to find a single scrap of evidence in the secret German papers to substantiate it. Besides, at this moment, Hitler was fully occupied trying to rally his faltering generals and retreating troops in Russia. 
Night had fallen in Berlin when the Foreign Broadcast Monitoring Service first picked up the news of the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. When an official of the Foreign Office Press Department telephoned Ribbentrop the world-shaking news, he at first refused to believe it and was extremely angry at being disturbed. The report was probably a propaganda trick of the enemy, he said, and ordered that he be left undisturbed until morning. So probably Ribbentrop for once told the truth when he testified on the stand at Nuremberg that this attack came as a complete surprise to us. We had considered the possibility of Japan's attacking Singapore or perhaps Hong Kong, but we never considered an attack on the United States as being to our advantage. However, contrary to what he told the tribunal, he was exceedingly happy about it, or so he struck Chano. A night telephone call from Ribbentrop, Chano began his diary on December 8th. He is joyful over the Japanese attack on the United States. He is so happy, in fact, that I can't but congratulate him, even though I am not so sure about the advantage. Mussolini was also happy. For a long time now he has been in favor of clarifying the position between America and the Axis. At 1 p.m. on Monday, December 8th, General Oshima went to the Wilhelmstrasse to get Ribbentrop to clarify Germany's position. He demanded a formal declaration of war on the United States at once. Ribbentrop replied, Oshima Radio Tokyo, that Hitler was then in the midst of a conference at General Headquarters discussing how the formalities of declaring war could be carried out so as to make a good impression on the German people, and that he would transmit your wish to him at once and do whatever he was able to have it carried out promptly. The Nazi foreign minister also informed the ambassador, according to the latter's message to Tokyo, that on that very morning of the 8th, Hitler issued orders to the German Navy to attack American ships whenever and wherever they may meet them. But the dictator stalled on a declaration of war. In Tokyo at the same time, Foreign Minister Togo was telling Ambassador Ott, The Japanese government expects that now Germany too will speedily declare war on the United States. The Fuhrer, according to the notation in his daily calendar book, hurried back to Berlin on the night of December 8th, arriving there at eleven o'clock the next morning. Ribbentrop claimed at Nuremberg that he pointed out to the leader that Germany did not necessarily have to declare war on America, under the terms of the Tripartite Pact, since Japan was obviously the aggressor. The text of the Tripartite Pact bound us to assist Japan only in case of an attack against Japan herself. I went to see the Fuhrer, explained the legal aspect of the situation, and told him that, although we welcomed a new ally against England, it meant we had a new opponent to deal with as well, if we declared war on the United States. I told him that according to the stipulation of the Three Power Pact, since Japan had attacked, we would not have to declare war formally. The Fuhrer thought this matter over quite a while, and then he gave me a very clear decision. If we don't stand on the side of Japan, he said, the pact is politically dead, but that is not the main reason. The chief reason is that the United States already are shooting against our ships. They have been a forceful factor in this war, and through their actions have already created a situation of war. The Fuhrer was of the opinion at that moment that it was quite evident that the United States would now make war against Germany. Therefore he ordered me to hand over the passports to the American representative. This was a decision that Roosevelt and Hull in Washington had been confidently waiting for. There had been some pressure on them to have Congress declare war on Germany and Italy on December 8th when that step was taken against Japan. But they had decided to wait. The bombing at Pearl Harbor had taken them off one hook, and certain information in their possession led them to believe that the headstrong Nazi dictator would take them off a second hook. My own impression in Washington at that moment was that it might be difficult for President Roosevelt to get Congress to declare war on Germany. There seemed to be a strong feeling in both houses, as well as in the Army and Navy, that the country ought to concentrate its efforts on defeating Japan and not take on the additional burden of fighting Germany at the same time. Hans Thompson, the German charge in Washington, who, like all the other Nazi envoys abroad, was usually kept ignorant of what Hitler and Ribbentrop were conniving, reported this sentiment to Berlin. Immediately after the President's speech to Congress on the morning of December 8th, calling for a declaration of war on Japan, Thompson radioed Berlin, the fact that he, Roosevelt, did not mention Germany and Italy with one word shows that he will try at first to avoid sharpening the situation in the Atlantic. On the evening of the same day, Thompson got off another dispatch on the subject. 
Whether Roosevelt will demand declaration of war on Germany and Italy is uncertain. From the standpoint of the American military leaders, it would be logical to avoid everything which could lead to a two-front war. In several dispatches just prior to Pearl Harbor, the German charge had emphasized that the United States simply was not prepared for a two-front war. On December 4th, he had radioed the revelations in the Chicago Tribune of the War Plans of the American High Command on Preparations and Prospects for Defeating Germany and Her Allies. Report confirms, he said, that full participation of America in war is not to be expected before July 1943. Military measures against Japan are of defensive character. In his message to Berlin on the evening of December 8th, Thompson stressed that Pearl Harbor was certain to bring relief to Germany from America's belligerent activities in the Atlantic. War with Japan, he reported, means transferring of all energy to America's own rearmament, a corresponding shrinking of lend-lease help and a shifting of all activity to the Pacific. For the exchange of dispatches between the Wilhelmstrasse and the German embassy in Washington during this period, I am indebted to the State Department, which gave me access to them. They will be published later in the Documents on German Foreign Policy series. Roosevelt and Hull had pondered the intercepted message of Ambassador Oshima from Berlin to Tokyo on November 29th, in which Ribbentrop had assured the Japanese that Germany would join Japan if she became engaged in a war against the United States. There was nothing in that assurance which made German aid conditional upon who was the aggressor. It was a blank check, and the Americans had no doubt that the Japanese were now clamoring in Berlin that it be honored. It was honored, but only after the Nazi warlord again hesitated. He had convoked the Reichstag to meet on December 9th, the day of his arrival in Berlin, but he postponed it for two days until the 11th. Apparently, as Ribbentrop later reported, he had made up his mind. He was fed up with the attacks made by Roosevelt on him and on Nazism. His patience was exhausted by the warlike acts of the U.S. Navy against German U-boats in the Atlantic, about which Raider had continually nagged him for nearly a year. He had a growing hatred for America and Americans, and what was worse for him in the long run, a growing tendency to disastrously underestimate the potential strength of the United States. I don't see much future for the Americans, he told his cronies a month later during a monologue at headquarters on January 7th, 1942. It's a decayed country, and they have their racial problem and the problem of social inequalities. My feelings against Americanism are feelings of hatred and deep repugnance. Everything about the behavior of American society reveals that it's half Judaized and the other half negrified. How can one expect a state like that to hold together? a country where everything is built on the dollar. Hitler's Secret Conversations, page 155. At the same time, he grossly overestimated Japan's military power. In fact, he seems to have believed that once the Japanese, whose navy he believed to be the most powerful in the world, had disposed of the British and Americans in the Pacific, they would turn on Russia and thus help him finish his great conquest in the East. He actually told some of his followers a few months later that he thought Japan's entry into the war had been of exceptional value to us, if only because of the date chosen. It was, in effect, at the moment when the surprises of the Russian winter were pressing most heavily on the morale of our people, and when everybody in Germany was oppressed by the certainty that sooner or later the United States would come into the conflict. Japanese intervention, therefore, was, from our point of view, most opportune. There is also no doubt that Japan's sneaky and mighty blow against the American fleet at Pearl Harbor kindled his admiration, and all the more so because it was the kind of surprise he had been so proud of pulling off so often himself. He expressed this to Ambassador Oshima on December 14th when he awarded him the Grand Cross of the Order of Merit of the German Eagle in gold. You gave the right declaration of war. This method is the only proper one. It corresponded, he said, to his own system. That is, to negotiate as long as possible. But if one sees that the other is interested only in putting one off, in shaming and humiliating one, and is not willing to come to an agreement, then one should strike, indeed as hard as possible, and not waste time declaring war. It was heartwarming to him to hear of the first operations of the Japanese. He himself negotiated with infinite patience at times, for example with Poland and also with Russia, when he then realized that the other did not want to come to an agreement, he struck suddenly and without formalities. He would continue to go this way in the future.
There was one other reason for Hitler's deciding in such haste to add the United States to the formidable list of his enemies. Dr. Schmidt, who was in and out of the Chancellery and Foreign Office that week, put his finger on it. I got the impression, he later wrote, that with his inveterate desire for prestige, Hitler, who was expecting an American declaration of war, wanted to get his declaration in first. The Nazi warlord confirmed this in his speech to the Reichstag on December 11th. We will always strike first, he told the cheering deputies. We will always deal the first blow. Indeed, Berlin was so fearful on December 10th that America might declare war first that Ribbentrop sternly admonished Thompson, the German charge in Washington, about committing any indiscretion which might tip off the State Department to what Hitler planned to do on the following day. In a long radiogram on the 10th, the Nazi foreign minister filed the text of the declaration he would make in Berlin to the U.S. Charge d'Affaires at precisely 2.30 p.m. on December 11th. Thompson was instructed to call on Hull exactly one hour later at 3.30 p.m. Berlin time, hand the Secretary of State a copy of the declaration, ask for his passport, and turn over Germany's diplomatic representation to Switzerland. At the end of the message, Ribbentrop warned Thompson not to have any contact with the State Department before delivering his note. We wish to avoid under all circumstances, the warning said, that the government there beats us to such a step. Whatever hesitations led Hitler to postpone the Reichstag session by two days, it is evident from the captured exchange of messages between the Wilhelmstrasse and the German embassy in Washington, and from other foreign office papers, that the Fuhrer actually made his fateful decision to declare war on the United States on December 9th, the day he arrived in the capital from headquarters on the Russian front. The Nazi dictator appears to have wanted the two extra days not for further reflection, but to prepare carefully his Reichstag speech so that it would make the proper impression on the German people, of whose memories of America's decisive role in the First World War Hitler was quite aware. Hans Diekhoff, who was still officially the German ambassador to the United States, but who had been cooling his heels in the Wilhelmstrasse ever since both countries withdrew their chief envoys in the autumn of 1938, was put to work on December 9th to draw up a long list of Roosevelt's anti-German activities for the Fuhrer's Reichstag address. Dikov, whom Hassel thought temperamentally submissive, had drawn up just a week before at the request of Ribbentrop a long memorandum entitled Principles for Influencing American Public Opinion. Among his eleven principles were Real danger to America is Roosevelt himself, influence of Jews on Roosevelt, Frankfurter, Baruch, Benjamin Cohen, Samuel Rosenman, Henry Morgenthau, etc., the slogan for every American mother must be, I didn't raise my boy to die for Britain, from the foreign office papers not yet published. Some Americans in the State Department and in our embassy in Berlin thought rather highly of Diekhoff and believed him to be anti-Nazi. My own feeling was that he lacked the guts to be. He served Hitler to the end, from 1943 to 1945 as the Nazi ambassador to Franco, Spain. Also on December 9th, Thompson in Washington was instructed to burn his secret codes and confidential papers. Measures carried out as ordered, he flashed to Berlin at 11.30 a.m. on that day. For the first time, he became aware of what was going on in Berlin, and during the evening tipped the Wilhelmstrasse that apparently the American government knew too. Believed here, he said, that within 24 hours Germany will declare war on the United States, or at least break off diplomatic relations. Thompson also urged Berlin to arrest the American correspondents there in retaliation for the arrest of a handful of German newsmen in the United States. A Foreign Office memorandum signed by Undersecretary Ernst Wurmann on December 10th declares that all American correspondents in Germany were ordered arrested as a reprisal. Accepted was Guido Enderes, chief correspondent in Berlin of the New York Times, because, Wurmann wrote, of his proved friendliness to Germany. This may be unfair to the late Enderus, who was in ill health at the time, and who mainly for that reason perhaps was not arrested. Hitler in the Reichstag, December 11th Hitler's address on December 11th to the robots of the Reichstag in defense of his declaration of war on the United States was devoted mainly to hurling personal insults at Franklin D. Roosevelt, to charging that the President had provoked war in order to cover up the failures of the New Deal, and to thundering that this man alone, backed by the millionaires and the Jews, was responsible for the Second World War. 
All the accumulated pent-up resentment at a man who had stood from the first in his way toward world dominion, who had continually taunted him, who had provided massive aid to Britain at a moment when it seemed that battered island nation would fall, and whose navy was frustrating him in the Atlantic, burst forth in violent wrath. Permit me to define my attitude to that other world, which has its representative in that man who, while our soldiers are fighting in snow and ice, very tactfully likes to make his chats from the fireside, the man who is the main culprit of this war. I will pass over the insulting attacks made by this so-called president against me. That he calls me a gangster is uninteresting. After all, this expression was not coined in Europe but in America, no doubt because such gangsters are lacking here. Apart from this, I cannot be insulted by Roosevelt, for I consider him mad, just as Wilson was. First he incites war, then falsifies the causes, then odiously wraps himself in a cloak of Christian hypocrisy, and slowly but surely leads mankind to war, not without calling God to witness the honesty of his attack, in the approved manner of an old Freemason. Roosevelt has been guilty of a series of the worst crimes against international law. Illegal seizure of ships and other property of German and Italian nationals was coupled with the threat to and looting of those who were deprived of their liberty by being interned. Roosevelt's ever-increasing attacks finally went so far that he ordered the American Navy to attack everywhere ships under the German and Italian flags and to sink them. This in gross violation of international law. American ministers boasted of having destroyed German submarines in this criminal way. German and Italian merchant ships were attacked by American cruisers, captured, and their crews imprisoned. In this way, the sincere efforts of Germany and Italy to prevent an extension of the war and to maintain relations with the United States in spite of the unbearable provocations which have been carried on for years by President Roosevelt have been frustrated. What was Roosevelt's motive to intensify anti-German feeling to the pitch of war, Hitler asked. He gave two explanations. I understand only too well that a worldwide distance separates Roosevelt's ideas and my ideas. Roosevelt comes from a rich family and belongs to the class whose path is smoothed in the democracies. I was only the child of a small, poor family and had to fight my way by work and industry. When the Great War came, Roosevelt occupied a position where he got to know only its pleasant consequences, enjoyed by those who do business while others bleed. I was only one of those who carried out orders as an ordinary soldier, and naturally returned from the war just as poor as I was in the autumn of 1914. I shared the fate of millions, and Franklin Roosevelt only the fate of the so-called Upper Ten Thousand. After the war, Roosevelt tried his hand at financial speculations. He made profits out of inflation, out of the misery of others, while I lay in a hospital. Hitler continued at some length with this singular comparison before he reached his second point, that Roosevelt had reverted to war to escape the consequences of his failure as president. National Socialism came to power in Germany in the same year as Roosevelt was elected president. He took over a state in a very poor economic condition, and I took over the Reich faced with complete ruin, thanks to democracy. While an unprecedented revival of economic life, culture, and art took place in Germany under National Socialist leadership, President Roosevelt did not succeed in bringing about even the slightest improvement in his own country. This is not surprising if one bears in mind that the men he had called to support him, or rather the men who had called him, belonged to the Jewish element, whose interests are all for disintegration and never for order. Roosevelt's New Deal legislation was all wrong. There can be no doubt that a continuation of this economic policy would have undone this president in peacetime, in spite of all his dialectical skill. In a European state, he would surely have come eventually before a state court on a charge of deliberate waste of the national wealth, and he would scarcely have escaped at the hands of a civil court on a charge of criminal business methods. Hitler knew that this assessment of the New Deal was shared, in part at least, by the American isolationists and a considerable portion of the business community, and he sought to make the most of it, ignorant of the fact that on Pearl Harbor Day these groups, like all others in America, had rallied to the support of their country. This fact was realized, he continued, alluding to these groups, and fully appreciated by many Americans, including some of high standing. A threatening opposition was gathering over the head of this man. 
he guessed that the only salvation for him lay in diverting public attention from home to foreign policy. He was strengthened in this by the Jews around him. The full diabolical meanness of Jewry rallied around this man, and he stretched out his hands. Thus began the increasing efforts of the American president to create conflicts. For years this man harbored one desire, that a conflict should break out somewhere in the world. There followed a long recital of Roosevelt's efforts in this direction, beginning with the quarantine speech in Chicago in 1937. Now he, Roosevelt, is seized, Hitler cried at one point, with fear that if peace is brought about in Europe, his squandering of millions of money on armaments will be looked upon as plain fraud, since nobody will attack America. And then he himself must provoke this attack upon his country. The Nazi dictator seemed relieved that the break had come, and he sought to share his sense of relief with the German people. I think you have all found it a relief now that at last one state has been the first to take the step of protesting against this historically unique and shameless ill-treatment of truth and of right. The fact that the Japanese government, which has been negotiating for years with this man, has at last become tired of being mocked by him in such an unworthy way, fills us all, the German people and, I think, all other decent people in the world, with deep satisfaction. The President of the United States ought finally to understand, I say this only because of his limited intellect, that we know that the aim of his struggle is to destroy one state after another. As for the German nation, it needs charity neither from Mr. Roosevelt nor from Mr. Churchill, let alone from Mr. Eden. It wants only its rights. It will secure for itself this right to live even if thousands of Churchills and Roosevelts conspire against it. I have therefore arranged for passports to be handed to the American Chargé d'Affaires today, and the following... At this point, the deputies of the Reichstag leaped to their feet, cheering, and the Fuhrer's words were drowned in the bedlam. Shortly afterward, at 2.30 p.m., Ribbentrop, in one of his most frigid poses, received Leland Morris, the American Chargé d'Affaires in Berlin, and while keeping him standing, read out Germany's declaration of war, handed him a copy, and icily dismissed him. Although Germany, for her part, said the Declaration, has always strictly observed the rules of international law in her dealings with the United States throughout the present war, the government of the United States has finally proceeded to overt acts of war against Germany. It has, therefore, virtually created a state of war. The Reich government, therefore, breaks off all diplomatic relations with the United States, and declares that under these circumstances brought about by President Roosevelt, Germany too considers herself to be at war with the United States, as from today. The final act in the day's drama was the signing of a tripartite agreement by Germany, Italy, and Japan, declaring their unshakable determination not to lay down arms until the joint war against the United States and England reaches a successful conclusion, and not to conclude a separate peace. Adolf Hitler, who a bare six months before had faced only a beleaguered Britain in a war which seemed to him as good as won, now, by deliberate choice, had arrayed against him the three greatest industrial powers in the world in a struggle in which military might depended largely in the long run on economic strength. Those three enemy countries together also had a great preponderance of manpower over the three Axis nations. Neither Hitler nor his generals nor his admirals seemed to have weighed those sobering facts on that eventful December day as the year 1941 drew toward a close. General Halder, the intelligent chief of the general staff, did not even note in his diary on December 11th that Germany had declared war on the United States. He mentioned only that in the evening he attended a lecture by a naval captain on the background of the Japanese-American Sea War. The rest of his diary, understandably perhaps, was taken up with the continued bad news from most sectors of the hard-pressed Russian front. There was no room in his thoughts for an eventual day when his weakened armies might also have to confront fresh troops from the New World. Admiral Raider actually welcomed Hitler's move. He conferred with the Fuhrer on the following day, December 12th. The situation in the Atlantic, he assured him, will be eased by Japan's successful intervention. And warming up to his subject, he added, Reports have already been received of the transfer of some American battleships from the Atlantic to the Pacific. It is certain that light forces, especially destroyers, will be required in increased numbers in the Pacific. The need for transport ships will be very great, so that a withdrawal of American merchant ships from the Atlantic can be expected.
the strain on British merchant shipping will increase. Hitler, having taken his plunge and with such reckless bravado, now suddenly was prey to doubts. He had some questions to put to the Grand Admiral. Did he believe that the enemy will in the near future take steps to occupy the Azores, the Cape Verdes, and perhaps even to attack Dakar, in order to win back prestige lost as the result of the setbacks in the Pacific? Raider did not think so. The U.S., he answered, will have to concentrate all her strength in the Pacific during the next few months. Britain will not want to run any risks after her severe losses of big ships. It is hardly likely that transport tonnage is available for such occupation tasks or for bringing up supplies. Two days before, on December 10th, Japanese planes had sunk two British battleships, the Prince of Wales and the Repulse, off the coast of Malaya. Coupled with the crippling American losses in battleships at Pearl Harbor on December 7th, this blow gave the Japanese fleet complete supremacy in the Pacific, the China Sea, and the Indian Ocean. In all the war, Churchill wrote later of the loss of the two great ships, I never received a more direct shock. Hitler had a more important question to pose. Is there any possibility, he asked, that the USA and Britain will abandon East Asia for a time in order to crush Germany and Italy first? Here again the Grand Admiral was reassuring. It is improbable, he answered, that the enemy will give up East Asia even temporarily. By so doing, Britain would endanger India very seriously, and the U.S. cannot withdraw her fleet from the Pacific as long as the Japanese fleet has the upper hand. Raider further tried to cheer up the Fuhrer by informing him that six large submarines were to proceed as quickly as possible to the east coast of the United States. With the situation in Russia being what it was, not to mention that in North Africa, where Rommel was also retreating, the thoughts of the German supreme commander and his military chiefs quickly turned from the new enemy, which they were sure would have its hands full in the Pacific far away. Their thoughts were not to return to it before another year had passed the most fateful year of the war, in which the great turning point would come, irrevocably deciding not only the outcome of the conflict, which all through 1941 the Germans had believed almost over, almost won, but the fate of the Third Reich, whose astounding early victories had raised it so quickly to such a giddy height, and which Hitler sincerely believed, and said, would flourish for a thousand years. Holder's scribblings in his diary grew ominous as New Year's, 1942, drew near. Another dark day, he began his journal on December 30th, 1941, and again on the last day of the year. The chief of the German general staff had a presentiment of terrible things to come. Chapter 26 The Great Turning Point, 1942, Stalingrad and El Alamein the conspirators come back to life. The severe setback to Hitler's armies in Russia during the winter of 1941-42, to and the cashiering of a number of field marshals and top generals, ignited the hopes of the anti-Nazi conspirators again. They had been unable to interest the leading commanders in a revolt as long as their armies were smashing to one easy victory after another, and the glory of German arms and of the German Reich was soaring to the heavens. But now the proud and hitherto invincible soldiers were falling back in the snow and bitter cold before an enemy which had proved their match. Casualties in six months had passed the million mark, and a host of the most renowned generals were being summarily dismissed, some of them, such as Hüppner and Sponeck, publicly disgraced, and most of the others humiliated and made scapegoats of by the ruthless dictator. Among those retired, it will be recalled, were Field Marshal von Braukitsch, the Commander-in-Chief of the Army, and Field Marshals von Rundstedt and von Bach, who led the Southern and Central Army groups respectively, and General Guderian, the genius of the Panzer Corps. The Commander of the Army Group in the North, Field Marshal von Leib, soon followed, being relieved of his post on January 18, 1942. The day before, Field Marshal von Reichenau, who had taken over Rundstedt's command, died of a stroke. General Udet of the Luftwaffe shot himself to death on November 17, 1941. Moreover, some 35 corps and divisional commanders were replaced during the winter retreat. This, of course, was only a beginning. Field Marshal von Manstein summed up at Nuremberg what happened to the generals when they started losing battles or finally got up enough courage to oppose Hitler. 
Of seventeen field marshals, he told the tribunal, ten were sent home during the war and three lost their lives as a result of July 20, 1944. The plot against Hitler. Only one field marshal managed to get through the war and keep his position. Of thirty-six full generals, General Obersten, eighteen were sent home and five died as a result of July 20th or were dishonorably discharged. Only three full generals survived the war in their positions. The time is almost ripe, Hassel concluded hopefully in his diary on December 21st, 1941. He and his fellow conspirators were sure that the Prussian officer corps would react not only to their shabby treatment, but to the madness of their supreme commander in leading them and their armies to the brink of disaster in the Russian winter. The plotters had long been convinced, as we have seen, that only the generals in command of troops had the physical power to overthrow the Nazi tyrant. Now was their chance before it was too late. Timing was all important. The war they saw after the reverses in Russia and the entry of America into the conflict could no longer be won, but neither was it yet lost. An anti-Nazi government in Berlin could still get peace terms, they thought, which would leave Germany a major power, and perhaps with at least some of Hitler's gains, such as Austria, the Sudetenland, and western Poland. These thoughts had been very much in their minds at the end of the summer of 1941, even when the prospect of destroying the Soviet Union was still good. The text of the Atlantic Charter, which Churchill and Roosevelt had drawn up on August 19th, had come as a heavy blow to them, especially Point 8, which had stipulated that Germany would have to be disarmed after the war pending a general disarmament agreement. To Hassel, Girdler, Beck, and the other members of their opposition circle, this meant that the Allies had no intention of distinguishing between Nazi and anti-Nazi Germans and was proof, as Hassel put it, that England and America are not fighting only against Hitler, but also want to smash Germany and render her defenseless. Indeed, to this aristocratic former ambassador, now deep in treason against Hitler, but determined to get as much as possible for a Germany without Hitler, point eight, as he noted in his journal, destroys every reasonable chance for peace. Disillusioned though they were by the Atlantic Charter, the conspirators seemed to have been spurred to action by its promulgation, if only because it impressed them with the necessity of doing away with Hitler while there was yet time for an anti-Nazi regime to bargain advantageously for peace for a Germany which still held most of Europe. They were not adverse to using Hitler's conquests to obtain the most favorable terms for their country. The upshot of a series of talks in Berlin during the last days of August between Hassel, Popitz, Oster, Dochnanyi, and General Friedrich Ulbricht, Chief of Staff of the Home Army, was that the German patriots, as they called themselves, would make very moderate demands of the Allies. But, to quote Hassel again, there are certain claims from which they could not desist. What the demands and claims were, he does not say. One gathers from other entries in his diary that they amounted to an insistence on Germany's 1914 frontiers in the East, plus Austria and the Sudetenland. But time pressed. After a final conference with his confederates at the end of August, Hassel wrote in his diary, They were unanimously convinced that it would soon be too late. When our chances for victory are obviously gone or only very slim, there will be nothing more to be done. There had been some effort to induce key generals on the Eastern Front to arrest Hitler during the summer campaign in Russia. But though it inevitably proved ineffectual because the great captains were naturally too absorbed in their initial stunning victories to give any thought to overthrowing the man who had given them the opportunity to achieve them, it did plant some seeds among the military minds that would eventually sprout. The center of the conspiracy in the army that summer was in the headquarters of Field Marshal von Bock, whose army group center was driving on Moscow. Major General Henning von Treskow, of Bach's staff, whose early enthusiasm for National Socialism had so soured as to land him in the ranks of the plotters, was the ringleader, and he was assisted by Fabian von Schlabrendorf, his ADC, and by two fellow conspirators whom they had planted on Bach as ADCs, Count Hans von Hardenberg and Count Heinrich von Lehndorf, both scions of old and prominent German families. Lehndorf was executed by the Nazis on September 4th, 1944. One of their self-appointed tasks was to work on the field marshal and to persuade him to arrest Hitler on one of his visits to the army group's headquarters. But Bach was hard to work on. 
Though professing to loathe Nazism, he had advanced too far under it and was much too vain and ambitious to take any chances at this stage of the game. Once, when Treskow tried to point out to him that the Fuhrer was leading the country to disaster, Bach shouted, I do not allow the Fuhrer to be attacked. Treskow and his young aide were discouraged, but not daunted. They decided to act on their own. When, on August 4, 1941, the Fuhrer visited the Army Group's headquarters at Borisov, they planned to seize him as he was driving from the airfield to box quarters. But the plotters were still amateurs at this time and had not counted on the Fuhrer's security arrangements. Surrounded by his own SS bodyguards and declining to use one of the Army Group's automobiles to drive in from the airfield, he had sent ahead his own fleet of cars for this purpose, he gave the two officers no opportunity of getting near him. This fiasco, apparently there were others like it, taught the plotters who were in the army some lessons. The first was that to get their hands on Hitler was no easy job. He was always well guarded. Another was that to seize him and arrest him might not solve the problem, since the key generals were too cowardly or too confused about their oaths of allegiance to help the opposition to carry on from there. It was about this time, the fall of 1941, that some of the young officers in the army, many of them civilians in uniform like Schlabrendorf, reluctantly came to the conclusion that the simplest and perhaps the only solution was to kill Hitler. Then the timid generals, released from their personal oaths to the leader, would go along with the new regime and give it the support of the army. But the ringleaders in Berlin were not yet ready to go so far. They were concocting an idiotic plan called isolated action, which for some reason they thought would satisfy the consciences of the generals about breaking their personal oaths to the Fuhrer, and at the same time enable them to rid the Reich of Hitler. It is difficult even today to follow their minds in this, but the idea was that the top military commanders, both in the East and in the West, would simply on a prearranged signal refuse to obey the orders of Hitler as commander-in-chief of the army. This, of course, would have been breaking their oath of obedience to the Fuhrer, but the sophists in Berlin pretended not to see that. They explained at any event that the real purpose of the scheme was to create confusion, in the midst of which Beck, with the help of detachments of the Home Army in Berlin, would seize power, depose Hitler, and outlaw National Socialism. The Home Army, however, was scarcely a military force, but more a motley collection of recruits doing a little basic training before being shipped as replacements to the front. Some top generals in Russia or in the occupation zones who had seasoned troops at their command would have to be won over if the venture were really to succeed. One of them, who had been in on the Halder plot to arrest Hitler at the time of Munich, seemed a natural choice. This was Field Marshal von Witzleben, who was now commander-in-chief in the West. To initiate him and also General Alexander von Falkenhausen, the military commander in Belgium, into the new scheme of things, Hassel was sent by the conspirators in mid-January 1942 to confer with the two generals. Already under surveillance by the Gestapo, the former ambassador used the cover of a lecture tour, addressing groups of German officers and occupation officials on the subject of living space and imperialism. In between lectures, he conferred privately with Falkenhausen in Brussels and Witzleben in Paris, receiving a favorable impression of both of them, especially of the latter. Shunted to the sidelines in France while his fellow field marshals were fighting great battles in Russia, Witzleben was thirsting for action. He told Hassel that the idea of isolated action was utopian. Direct action to overthrow Hitler was the only solution, and he was willing to play a leading part. Probably the best time to strike would be during the summer of 1942 when the German offensive in Russia was resumed. To prepare for the day, he intended to be in top physical trim and would have a minor operation to put him in shape. Unfortunately for the field marshal and his co-conspirators, this decision had disastrous consequences. Like Frederick the Great, and many others, Witzleben was troubled by hemorrhoids. The Prussian king often complained about this malady, which he found hampered his mental facilities as well as his physical activities. The operation to correct this painful and annoying condition was a routine case of surgery, to be sure. But when Witzleben took a brief sick leave in the spring to have it done, Hitler took advantage of the situation to retire the field marshal from active service, replacing him with Rundstedt, who had no stomach for conspiring against the leader who had so recently treated him so shabbily. 
Thus the plotters found their chief hope in the army to be a field marshal without any troops at his command. Without soldiers, no new regime could be established. The leaders of the conspiracy were greatly disheartened. They kept meeting clandestinely and plotting, but they could not overcome their discouragement. It seems at the moment, Hassel noted at the end of February 1942, after one of the innumerable meetings, that nothing can be done about Hitler. A great deal could be done, however, about straightening out their ideas concerning the kind of government they wanted for Germany after Hitler finally was deposed, and about strengthening their helter-skelter and so far quite ineffectual organization so that it could take over that government when the time came. Most of the resistance leaders, being conservative and well on in years, wanted, for one thing, a restoration of the Hohenzollern monarchy. But for a long time they could not agree on which Hohenzollern prince to hoist on the throne. Popitz, one of the leading civilians in the ring, wanted the crown prince, who was anathema to most of the others. Schacht favored the oldest son of the crown prince, Prince Wilhelm, and Gerdeler, the youngest surviving son of Wilhelm II, Prince Oskar of Prussia. All were in accord that the Kaiser's fourth son, Prince August Wilhelm, or Aui as he was nicknamed, was out of the question since he was a fanatical Nazi and a Gruppenführer in the SS. By the summer of 1941, however, there was more or less agreement that the most suitable candidate for the throne was Louis Ferdinand the second and oldest surviving son of the crown prince. Prince Wilhelm, the oldest son, had died of battle wounds in France on May 26, 1940. Then just thirty-three, a veteran of five years in the Ford factory at Dearborn, a working employee of the Lufthansa Airlines and in contact and in sympathy with the plotters, this personable young man had finally emerged as the most desirable of the Hohenzollerns. He understood the twentieth century, was democratic and intelligent. Moreover, he had an attractive, sensible, and courageous wife in Princess Kira, a former Russian Grand Duchess, and, an important point for the conspirators at this stage, he was a personal friend of President Roosevelt, who had invited the couple to stay in the White House during their American honeymoon in 1938. Hassel and some of his friends were not absolutely convinced that Louis Ferdinand was an ideal choice. He lacks many qualities he cannot get along without, Hassel commented wryly in his diary at Christmas time, 1941, but he went along with the others. Hassel's chief interest was in the form and nature of the future German government, and early the year before he had drawn up, after consultation with General Beck, Girdler, and Popitz, a program for its interim stage, which he refined in a further draft at the end of 1941. It restored individual freedom and, pending the adoption of a permanent constitution, provided for the supreme power to rest in the hands of a regent, who, as head of state, would appoint a government and a council of state. It was all rather authoritarian, and Girdler and the few trade union representatives among the conspirators didn't like it, proposing instead an immediate plebiscite so that the interim regime would have popular backing and give proof of its democratic character. But for the lack of something better, Hassel's plan was generally accepted, at least as a statement of principles, until it was superseded by a liberal and enlightened program drawn up in 1943 under pressure from the Kreisau Circle, led by Count Helmut von Moltke. Finally, that spring of 1942, the conspirators formally adopted a leader. They had all acknowledged General Beck as such, not only because of his intelligence and character, but also because of his prestige among the generals, his good name in the country, and his reputation abroad. However, they had been so lackadaisical in organizing that they had never actually put him in charge. A few, like Hassel, though full of admiration and respect for the former general staff chief, had some doubts about him. The principal difficulty with Beck, Hassel wrote in his diary shortly before Christmas 1941, is that he is very theoretical, as Popitz says, a man of tactics but little willpower. This judgment, as it turned out, was not an ungrounded one, and this quirk in the general's temperament and character, this surprising lack of a will to act, was to prove tragic and disastrous in the end. Nevertheless, in March 1942, after a good many secret meetings, the plotters decided, as Hassel reported, that Beck must hold the strings. And at the end of the month, as the ambassador further noted, Beck was formally adopted as the head of our group. Still, the conspiracy remained nebulous, and the air of unreality which surrounded even the most active members of it from the first 
hangs over their endless talk as one tries to follow it at this stage in the records they have left. Hitler, they knew that spring, was planning to resume the offensive in Russia as soon as the ground was dry. This, they felt, could only plunge Germany farther toward the abyss. And yet, though they talked much, they did nothing. On March 28, 1942, Hassel sat in his country house at Ebenhausen and began his diary. During the last days in Berlin, I had detailed discussions with Jessen, Beck, and Gerdeler. Prospects not very good. How could they be very good, without even any plans to act, now, while there was still time? Jens Peter Jessen, a professor of economics at the University of Berlin, was one of the brains of the circle. He had become an ardent Nazi during the period between 1931 and 1933, and was one of the few genuine intellectuals in the party. He was quickly disillusioned after 1933 and soon became a fanatical anti-Nazi. Arrested for complicity in the July 20, 1944 plot against Hitler, he was executed at the Plötzensee prison in Berlin in November of that year. It was Adolf Hitler who, at this unfolding of spring, the third of the war, had plans and the fierce will to try to carry them out. The Last Great German Offensives of the War Although the Führer's folly in refusing to allow the German armies in Russia to retreat in time had led to heavy losses in men and arms, to the demoralization of many commands, and to a situation which for a few weeks in January and February 1942 threatened to end in utter catastrophe, there is little doubt that Hitler's fanatical determination to hold on and to stand and fight also helped to stem the Soviet tide. The traditional courage and endurance of the German soldiers did the rest. By February 20th, the Russian offensive from the Baltic to the Black Sea had run out of steam, and at the end of March, the season of deep mud set in, bringing a relative quiet to the long and bloody front. Both sides were exhausted. A German army report of March 30th, 1942, revealed what a terrible toll had been paid in the winter fighting. Of a total of 162 combat divisions in the east, only eight were ready for offensive missions. The 16 armored divisions had between them only 140 serviceable tanks, less than the normal number for one division. While the troops were resting and refitting, indeed long before that, while they were still retreating in the midwinter snows, Hitler, who was now commander-in-chief of the army as well as supreme commander of the armed forces, had been busy with plans for the coming summer's offensive. They were not as ambitious as those of the previous year. By now he had sense enough to see that he could not destroy all of the Red Armies in a single campaign. This summer he would concentrate the bulk of his forces in the south, conquer the Caucasus oil fields, the Donetsk industrial basin, and the wheat fields of the Kuban, and take Stalingrad on the Volga. This would accomplish several prime objectives. It would deprive the Soviets of the oil and much of the food and industry they desperately needed to carry on the war, while giving the Germans the oil and the food resources they were almost as badly in need of. If I do not get the oil of Maikop and Grozny, Hitler told General Paulus, the commander of the ill-fated Sixth Army, just before the summer offensive began, then I must end this war. Stalin could have said almost the same thing. He, too, had to have the oil of the Caucasus to stay in the war. That was where the significance of Stalingrad came in. German possession of it would block the last main route via the Caspian Sea and the Volga River, over which the oil, as long as the Russians held the wells, could reach central Russia. Besides oil to propel his planes and tanks and trucks, Hitler needed men to fill out his thinned ranks. Total casualties at the end of the winter fighting were 1,167,835, exclusive of the sick, and there were not enough replacements available to make up for such losses. The high command turned to Germany's allies, or rather satellites, for additional troops. During the winter, General Keitel had scurried off to Budapest and Bucharest to drum up Hungarian and Romanian soldiers, whole divisions of them, for the coming summer. Goering and finally Hitler himself appealed to Mussolini for Italian formations. Goering arrived in Rome at the end of January 1942 to line up Italian reinforcements for Russia, assuring Mussolini that the Soviet Union would be defeated in 1942, and that Great Britain would lay down her arms in 1943. Chano found the fat, bemedaled Reich Marshal insufferable. 
As usual, he is bloated and overbearing, the Italian foreign minister noted in his diary on February 2nd. Two days later, Goering leaves Rome. We had dinner at the Excelsior Hotel, and during the dinner Goering talked of little else but the jewels he owned. In fact, he had some beautiful rings on his fingers. On the way to the station he wore a great sable coat, something between what automobile drivers wore in 1906 and what a high-grade prostitute wears to the opera. The corruption and corrosion of the number two man in the Third Reich was making steady progress. Mussolini promised Goering to send two Italian divisions to Russia in March if the Germans would give them artillery, but his concern about his allies' defeats on the Eastern Front grew to such proportions that Hitler decided it was time for another meeting to explain how strong Germany still was. This took place on April 29th and 30th at Salzburg, where the Duce and Ciano and their party were put up in the Baroque Palace of Klesheim, once the seat of the Prince Bishops and now redecorated with hangings, furniture, and carpets from France, for which the Italian foreign minister suspected the Germans did not pay too much. Ciano found the Fuhrer looking tired. The winter months in Russia have borne heavily upon him, he noted in his diary. I see for the first time that he has many gray hairs. Goebbels had seen Hitler a month before at headquarters and expressed shock in his diary at his ailing. I noted that he has already become quite gray. He told me he has to fight off severe attacks of giddiness. The Fuhrer this time truly worries me. He had, Goebbels added, a physical revulsion against frost and snow. What worries and torments the Fuhrer most is that the country is still covered with snow. The Goebbels Diaries, pages 131 to 137. There followed the usual German recital sizing up the general situation, with Ribbentrop and Hitler assuring their Italian guests that all was well, in Russia, in North Africa, in the West, and on the high seas. The coming offensive in the East, they confided, would be directed against the Caucasus oil fields. When Russia's sources of oil are exhausted, Ribbentrop said, she will be brought to her knees. Then the British will bow in order to save what remains of the mauled empire. America is a big bluff. Chano, listening more or less patiently to his opposite number, got the impression, however, that in regard to what the United States might eventually do, it was the Germans who were bluffing, and that in reality, when they thought of it, they feel shivers running down their spines. It was the Fuhrer who, as always, did most of the talking. Hitler talks, 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 Chano wrote in his diary. Mussolini suffers. He who is in the habit of talking himself, and who, instead, practically has to keep quiet. On the second day after lunch, when everything had been said, Hitler talked uninterruptedly for an hour and forty minutes. He omitted absolutely no argument, war and peace, religion and philosophy, art and history. Mussolini automatically looked at his wristwatch. The Germans, poor people, have to take it every day, and I am certain there isn't a gesture, a word, or a pause which they don't know by heart. General Yodel, after an epic struggle, finally went to sleep on the divan. Keitel was reeling, but he succeeded in keeping his head up. He was too close to Hitler to let himself go. Despite the avalanche of talk, or perhaps because of it, Hitler got the promise of more Italian cannon fodder for the Russian front. So successful were he and Keitel with all the satellites that the German high command calculated it would have 52 Allied divisions available for the summer's task. Twenty-seven Romanian, thirteen Hungarian, nine Italian, two Slovak, and one Spanish. This was one quarter of the combined Axis force in the east. Of the forty-one fresh divisions which were to reinforce the southern part of the front, where the main German blow would fall, one half, or twenty-one divisions, were Hungarian, ten, Italian, six, and Romanian, five. Halder and most of the other generals did not like to stake so much on so many foreign divisions whose fighting qualities, in their opinion, were, to put it mildly, questionable. But because of their own shortage of manpower, they reluctantly accepted this aid, and this decision was shortly to contribute to the disaster which ensued. At first, that summer of 1942, the fortunes of the Axis prospered. Even before the jump-off toward the Caucasus and Stalingrad, a sensational victory was scored in North Africa. On May 27, 1942, General Rommel had resumed his offensive in the desert. In a savage series of battles with the British in November and December 1941, Rommel's forces had been driven back clear across Cyrenaica, 
to the El Aguila line at its western borders. But bounding back with his customary resilience in January 1942, Rommel recaptured half of the ground lost in a swift 17-day campaign which brought him back to El Ghazala, from where the new drive of the end of May 1942 began. Striking swiftly with his famed Africa Corps, two armored divisions and a motorized infantry division, and eight Italian divisions, of which one was armored, he soon had the British Desert Army reeling back toward the Egyptian frontier. On June 21st he captured Tobruk, the key to the British defenses, which in 1941 had held out for nine months until relieved, and two days later he entered Egypt. By the end of June he was at El Alamein, sixty-five miles from Alexandria and the delta of the Nile. It seemed to many a startled Allied statesman, poring over a map, that nothing could now prevent Rommel from delivering a fatal blow to the British by conquering Egypt, and then, if he were reinforced, sweeping on northeast to capture the great oil fields of the Middle East, and then to the Caucasus to meet the German armies in Russia, which already were beginning their advance toward that region from the north. It was one of the darkest moments of the war for the Allies, and correspondingly one of the brightest for the Axis. But Hitler, as we have seen, had never understood global warfare. He did not know how to exploit Rommel's surprising African success. He awarded the daring leader of the Africa Corps a field marshal's baton, but he did not send him supplies or reinforcements. Hitler's naming Rommel a field marshal the day after the capture of Tobruk caused Mussolini much pain, because, as Chano noted, it accentuated the German character of the battle. The Duce left immediately for Libya to grab some honors for himself, believing that he could enter Alexandria, Chano says, in fifteen days. On July 2nd, he contacted Hitler by wire about the question of the future political government of Egypt, proposing Rommel as the military commander and an Italian as civilian delegate. Hitler replied that he did not consider the matter urgent. Chano Diaries, pages 502 to 504. Mussolini was waiting impatiently in Derna, behind the front, General Fritz Beierlein, chief of staff to Rommel, later recalled, for the day when he might take the salute at a parade of Axis tanks beneath the shadow of the pyramids. The Fatal Decisions, edited by Frieden and Richardson, page 103. Under the nagging of Admiral Raider and the urging of Rommel, the Fuhrer had only reluctantly agreed to send the Africa Corps and a small German air force to Libya in the first place. But he had done this only to prevent an Italian collapse in North Africa, not because he foresaw the importance of conquering Egypt. The key to that conquest, actually, was the small island of Malta, lying in the Mediterranean between Sicily and the Axis bases in Libya. It was from this British bastion that bombers, submarines, and surface craft wrought havoc on German and Italian vessels carrying supplies and men to North Africa. In August 1941, some 35% of Rommel's supplies and reinforcements were sunk. In October, 63%. By November 9th, Chano was writing sadly in his diary, Since September 19th, we had given up trying to get convoys through to Libya. Every attempt had been paid for at a high price. Tonight we tried it again. A convoy of seven ships left, accompanied by two 10,000-ton cruisers and ten destroyers. All, I mean all, our ships were sunk. The British returned to their ports at Malta after having slaughtered us. Belatedly, the Germans diverted several U-boats from the Battle of the Atlantic to the Mediterranean, and Kesselring was given additional squadrons of planes for the bases in Sicily. It was decided to neutralize Malta and destroy, if possible, the British fleet in the eastern Mediterranean. Success was immediate. By the end of 1941, the British had lost three battleships, an aircraft carrier, two cruisers, and several destroyers and submarines. And what was left of their fleet was driven to Egyptian bases. Malta had been battered by German bombers day and night for weeks. As a result, Axis supplies got through. In January, not a ton of shipping was lost, and Rommel was able to build up his forces for the big push into Egypt. In March, Admiral Raider talked Hitler into approving plans not only for Rommel's offensive toward the Nile, Operation Naida, but for the capture of Malta by parachute troops, Operation Hercules. The drive from Libya was to begin at the end of May, and Malta was to be assaulted in mid-July. 
But on June 15th, while Rommel was in the midst of his initial successes, Hitler postponed the attack on Malta. He could spare neither troops nor planes from the Russian front, he explained to Raider. A few weeks later, he postponed Hercules again, saying it could wait until after the summer offensive in the east had been completed and Rommel had conquered Egypt. Malta could be kept quiet in the meantime, he advised, by continued bombing. But it was not kept quiet, and for this failure, either to neutralize it or to capture it, the Germans would shortly pay a high price. A large British convoy got through to the besieged island on June 16th, and though several warships and freighters were lost, this put Malta back in business. Spitfires were flown to the island from the U.S. aircraft carrier Wasp and soon drove the attacking Luftwaffe bombers from the skies. Rommel felt the effect. Three-quarters of his supply ships thereafter were sunk. He had reached El Alamein with just thirteen operational tanks. According to General Beierlein's post-war testimony, he probably exaggerated his losses. Allied intelligence gave Rommel 125 tanks. Our strength, he wrote in his diary on July 3rd, has faded away, and at a moment when the pyramids were almost in sight and beyond, the great prize of Egypt and Suez. This was another opportunity lost, and one of the last which Hitler would be afforded by providence and the fortunes of war. The German Summer Offensive in Russia, 1942 by the end of the summer of 1942, Adolf Hitler seemed to be once more on top of the world. German U-boats were sinking 700,000 tons of British-American shipping a month in the Atlantic, more than could be replaced in the booming shipyards of the United States, Canada, and Scotland. Though the Fuhrer had denuded his forces in the west of most of their troops and tanks and planes in order to finish with Russia, there was no sign that summer that the British and Americans were strong enough to make even a small landing from across the Channel. They had not even risked trying to occupy French-held Northwest Africa, though the weakened French of divided loyalties had nothing much with which to stop them even if they attempted to, and the Germans nothing at all except a few submarines and a handful of planes based in Italy and Tripoli. The British Navy and Air Force had been unable to prevent Germany's two battle cruisers, Scharnhorst and Gneisenau, and the heavy cruiser Prince Eugen from dashing up the English Channel in full daylight and making their way safely home from Brest. This had taken place on February 11th to 12th, 1942, and had caught the British by surprise. Only weak naval and aircraft forces were rounded up in time to attack the German fleet, and they inflicted little damage. Vice Admiral Siliax, who led the dash, commented the Times of London, has succeeded where the Duke of Medina Sidonia failed. Nothing more mortifying to the pride of sea power has happened in home waters since the 17th century. Hitler had feared that the British and Americans would certainly try to occupy northern Norway. That was why he had insisted on the dash from Brest so that the three heavy ships there could be used for the defense of Norwegian waters. Norway, he told Raider at the end of January 1942, is the zone of destiny. It had to be defended at all costs. As it turned out, there was no need. The Anglo-Americans had other plans for their limited forces in the West. On the map, the sum of Hitler's conquests by September 1942 looked staggering. The Mediterranean had become practically an Axis lake, with Germany and Italy holding most of the northern shore from Spain to Turkey, and the southern shore from Tunisia to within sixty miles of the Nile. In fact, German troops now stood guard from the Norwegian North Cape on the Arctic Ocean to Egypt, from the Atlantic at Brest to the southern reaches of the Volga River on the border of Central Asia. German troops of the Sixth Army had reached the Volga just north of Stalingrad on August 23rd. Two days before, the swastika had been hoisted on Mount Elbrus, the highest peak, 18,481 feet, in the Caucasus Mountains. The Mykop oil fields, producing annually two and a half million tons of oil, had been captured on August 8th, though the Germans found them almost completely destroyed, and by the 25th, Kleist's tanks had arrived at Mozdok, only 50 miles from the main Soviet oil center around Grozny, and a bare hundred miles from the Caspian Sea. On the 31st, Hitler was urging Field Marshal List, commander of the armies in the Caucasus, to scrape up all available forces for the final push to Grozny so that he could get his hands on the oil fields. 
On that last day of August, too, Rommel launched his offensive at El Alamein with every hope of breaking through to the Nile. Although Hitler was never satisfied with the performance of his generals, he had sacked Field Marshal von Bock, who commanded the whole southern offensive on July 13th, and, as Halder's diary reveals, had constantly nagged and cursed most of the other commanders, as well as the general staff, for not advancing fast enough, he now believed that the decisive victory was in his grasp. He ordered the 6th Army and the 4th Panzer Army to swing north along the Volga, after Stalingrad was taken, in a vast encircling movement, which would enable him eventually to advance on central Russia and Moscow from the east, as well as from the west. He believed the Russians were finished, and Halder tells of him at this moment talking of pushing with part of his forces through Iran to the Persian Gulf. Soon he would link up with the Japanese in the Indian Ocean. He had no doubt of the accuracy of a German intelligence report on September 9th that the Russians had used up all their reserves on the entire front. In a conference with Admiral Raider at the end of August, his thoughts were already turning from Russia, which he said he now regarded as a blockade-proof Lebensraum, to the British and Americans, who would soon, he was sure, be brought to the point of discussing peace terms. And yet, as General Kurt Zeitzler later recalled, appearances even then, rosy as they were, were deceptive. Almost all the generals in the field, as well as those on the general staff, saw flaws in the pretty picture. They could be summed up. The Germans simply didn't have the resources, the men or the guns or the tanks or the planes or the means of transportation, to reach the objectives Hitler had insisted on setting. When Rommel tried to tell this to the warlord in respect to Egypt, Hitler ordered him to go on sick leave in the mountains of the Zemmering. When Halder and Field Marshal List attempted to do the same in regard to the Russian front, they were cashiered. Even the rankest amateur strategist could see the growing danger to the German armies in southern Russia, as Soviet resistance stiffened in the Caucasus and at Stalingrad, and the season of the autumn rains approached. The long northern flank of the Sixth Army was dangerously exposed along the line of the Upper Don for 350 miles from Stalingrad to Voronezh. Here Hitler had stationed three satellite armies, the Hungarian Second, south of Voronezh, the Italian Eighth, farther southeast, and the Romanian Third, on the right at the bend of the Don just west of Stalingrad. Because of the bitter hostility of Romanians and Hungarians to each other, their armies had to be separated by the Italians. In the steppes south of Stalingrad there was a fourth satellite army, the Romanian Fourth. Aside from their doubtful fighting qualities, all these armies were inadequately equipped, lacking armored power, heavy artillery, and mobility. Furthermore, they were spread out very thinly. The Romanian Third Army held a front of 105 miles with only 69 battalions. But these Allied armies were all Hitler had. There were not enough German units to fill the gap, and since he believed, as he told Holder, that the Russians were finished, he did not unduly worry about this exposed and lengthy Don flank. Yet it was the key to maintaining both the 6th Army and the 4th Panzer Army at Stalingrad and Army Group A in the Caucasus. Should the Don flank collapse, not only would the German forces at Stalingrad be threatened with encirclement, but those in the Caucasus would be cut off. Once more, the Nazi warlord had gambled. It was not his first gamble of the summer's campaign. On July 23rd, at the height of the offensive, he made another. The Russians were in full retreat between the Donets and Upper Don rivers, falling rapidly back toward Stalingrad to the east and toward the Lower Don to the south. A decision had to be made. Should the German forces concentrate on taking Stalingrad and blocking the Volga River, or should they deliver their main blow in the Caucasus in quest of Russian oil? Earlier in the month, Hitler had pondered this crucial question, but had been unable to make up his mind. At first, the smell of oil had tempted him most, and on July 13th, he had detached the 4th Panzer Army from Army Group B, which had been driving down the Don toward the River's Bend and Stalingrad just beyond, and sent it south to help Kleist's 1st Panzer Army get over the Lower Don near Rostov and on into the Caucasus toward the oil fields. At that moment, the 4th Panzer Army probably could have raced on to Stalingrad, which was then largely undefended, and easily captured it. By the time Hitler realized his mistake, it was too late, and then he compounded his error. When the 4th Panzer Army was shifted back toward Stalingrad a fortnight later, the Russians had recovered sufficiently to be able to check it, 
and its departure from the Caucasus front left Kleist too weak to complete his drive to the Grozny oil fields. Kleist confirmed this to Little Hart. The 4th Panzer Army could have taken Stalingrad without a fight at the end of July, but was diverted south to help me in crossing the Don. I did not need its aid, and it merely congested the roads I was using. When it turned north again a fortnight later, the Russians had gathered just sufficient forces at Stalingrad to check it. By that time, Kleist needed the additional tank force. We could have reached our goal, the Grozny Oil, if my forces had not been drawn away to help the attack on Stalingrad, he added. Little Heart, The German General's Talk, pages 169 to 171. The shifting of this powerful armored unit back to the drive on Stalingrad was one result of the fatal decision which Hitler made on July 23rd, his fanatical determination to take both Stalingrad and the Caucasus at the same time, against the advice of Holder and the field commanders, who did not believe it could be done, was embodied in Directive No. 45, which became famous in the annals of the German army. It was one of the most fateful of Hitler's moves in the war, for in the end, and in a very short time, it resulted in his failing to achieve either objective and led to the most humiliating defeat in the history of German arms making certain that he could never win the war and that the days of the thousand-year Third Reich were numbered. General Halder was appalled, and there was a stormy scene at Werewolf headquarters in the Ukraine near Venitsa, to which Hitler had moved on July 16th in order to be nearer the front. The chief of the general staff urged that the main forces be concentrated on the taking of Stalingrad, and tried to explain that the German army simply did not possess the strength to carry out two powerful offensives in two different directions. When Hitler retorted that the Russians were finished, Holder attempted to convince him that, according to the army's own intelligence, this was far from the case. The continual underestimation of enemy possibilities, Holder noted sadly in his diary that evening, takes on grotesque forms and is becoming dangerous. Serious work has become impossible here pathological reaction to momentary impressions and a complete lack of capacity to assess the situation and its possibilities give this so-called leadership a most peculiar character. Later, the chief of the general staff, whose own days at his post were now numbered, would come back to this scene and write, Hitler's decisions had ceased to have anything in common with the principles of strategy and operations, as they have been recognized for generations past. They were the product of a violent nature following its momentary impulses, which recognized no limits to possibility, and which made its wish dreams the father of its acts. As to what he called the Supreme Commander's pathological overestimation of his own strength and criminal underestimation of the enemies, Holder later told the story. Once, when a quite objective report was read to him showing that still in 1942 Stalin would be able to muster from one to one and a quarter million fresh troops in the region north of Stalingrad and west of the Volga, not to mention half a million men in the Caucasus, and which provided proof that Russian output of front-line tanks amounted to at least 1,200 a month, Hitler flew at the man who was reading with clenched fists and foam in the corners of his mouth and forbade him to read any more of such idiotic twaddle. You didn't have to have the gift of a prophet, says Holder, to foresee what would happen when Stalin unleashed those million-and-a-half troops against Stalingrad and the Don flank. I pointed this out to Hitler very clearly. The result was the dismissal of the chief of the army general staff. Holder relates that, quite by accident, he came across in the Ukraine about that time a book about Stalin's defeat of General Denikin between the Don Bend and Stalingrad during the Russian Civil War. He says the situation then was very similar to that of 1942, and that Stalin exploited masterfully Denikin's weak defenses along the Don. Hence, he adds, came the changing of the name of the city from Tsaritsyn to Stalingrad. This took place on September 24th. Already on the 9th, upon being told by Keitel that Field Marshal List, who had the overall command of the armies in the Caucasus, had been sacked, Halder learned that he would be the next to go. The Fuhrer, he was told, had become convinced that he was no longer equal to the psychic demands of his position. Hitler explained this in greater detail to his general staff chief at their farewell meeting on the 24th. You and I have been suffering from nerves. Half of my nervous exhaustion is due to you. It is not worth it to go on. We need national socialist ardor now, not professional ability. I cannot expect this of an officer of the old school such as you. 
So spoke, Halder commented later, not a responsible warlord, but a political fanatic. And so departed Franz Halder. He was not without his faults, which were similar to those of his predecessor, General Beck, in that his mind was often confused and his will to action paralyzed. And though he had often stood up to Hitler, however ineffectually, he had also, like all of the other army officers who enjoyed high rank during World War II, gone along with him, and for a long time abetted his outrageous aggressions and his conquests. Yet he had retained some of the virtues of more civilized times. He was the last of the old-school general staff chiefs that the Army of the Third Reich would have. He was replaced by General Kurt Zeitzler, a younger officer of a different stripe who was serving as chief of staff to Rundstedt in the West, and who endured in the post, which once, especially in the First World War, had been the highest and most powerful in the German army, as little more than the Führer's office boy until the attempt against the dictator's life in July 1944. The sacking of Halder was a loss not only to the army, but to historians of the Third Reich, for his invaluable diary ends on September 24, 1942. He was eventually arrested, placed in the concentration camp at Dachau along with such illustrious prisoners as Schuschnigg and Schacht, and liberated by U.S. forces at Niederdorf, South Tyrol, on April 28, 1945. Since then, up to the time of writing, he has collaborated with the U.S. Army in a number of military historical studies of World War II. His generosity to this writer in answering queries and pointing out sources has already been noted. The faithful and fanatically loyal General Jodl, chief of operations at OKW, also was in Hitler's doghouse at this time. He had opposed the sacking of Field Marshal List and General Halder, and his defense of them sent Hitler into such a rage that for months he refused to shake hands with Jodl or dine with him or any other staff officer. Hitler was on the point of firing Jodl at the end of January 1943 and replacing him with General Paulus, but it was too late. Paulus, as we shall shortly see, was no longer available. A change in general staff chiefs did not change the situation of the German army whose twin drives on Stalingrad and the Caucasus had now been halted by stiffening Soviet resistance. All through October, bitter street fighting continued in Stalingrad itself. The Germans made some progress, from building to building, but with staggering losses, for the rubble of a great city, as everyone who has experienced modern warfare knows, gives many opportunities for stubborn and prolonged defense, and the Russians, disputing desperately every foot of the debris, made the most of them. Though Halder and then his successor warned Hitler that the troops in Stalingrad were becoming exhausted, the Supreme Commander insisted that they push on. Fresh divisions were thrown in and were soon ground to pieces in the inferno. Instead of a means to an end, the end had already been achieved when German formations reached the western banks of the Volga north and south of the city and cut off the river's traffic, Stalingrad had become an end in itself. To Hitler, its capture was now a question of personal prestige. Even when Zeitzler got up enough nerve to suggest to the Fuhrer that in view of the danger to the long northern flank along the Don, the Sixth Army should be withdrawn from Stalingrad to the elbow of the Don, Hitler flew into a fury. Where the German soldier sets foot, there he remains, he stormed. Despite the hard going and the severe losses, General Paulus, commander of the Sixth Army, informed Hitler by radio on October 25th that he expected to complete the capture of Stalingrad at the latest by November 10th. Cheered up by this assurance, Hitler issued orders the next day that the Sixth Army and the Fourth Panzer Army, which was fighting south of the city, should prepare to push north and south along the Volga as soon as Stalingrad had fallen. It was not that Hitler was ignorant of the threat to the Don flank. The OKW diaries make clear that it caused him considerable worry. The point is that he did not take it seriously enough, and that, as a consequence, he did nothing to avert it. Indeed, so confident was he that the situation was well in hand, that on the last day of October, he, the staff of OKW, and the Army General Staff abandoned their headquarters at Venice in the Ukraine and returned to Volshansa at Rostenburg. The Führer had practically convinced himself that if there were to be any Soviet winter offensive at all, it would come on the central and northern fronts. He could handle that better from his quarters in East Prussia. Hardly had he returned there when bad news reached him from another and more distant front. Field Marshal Rommel's Afrika Corps was in trouble.
The First Blow, El Alamein and the Anglo-American Landings The Desert Fox, as he was called on both sides of the front, had resumed his offensive at El Alamein on August 31st with the intention of rolling up the British Eighth Army and driving on to Alexandria and the Nile. There was a violent battle in the scorching heat on the forty-mile desert front between the sea and the Katara Depression, but Rommel could not quite make it, and on September 3rd he broke off the fighting and went over to the defensive. At long last the British Army in Egypt had received strong reinforcements in men, guns, tanks, and planes, many of the last two from America. It had also received on August 15th two new commanders, an eccentric but gifted general named Sir Bernard Law Montgomery, who took over the Eighth Army, and General Sir Harold Alexander, who was to prove to be a skillful strategist and a brilliant administrator, and who now assumed the post of commander-in-chief in the Middle East. Shortly after his setback, Rommel had gone on sick leave on the Zemmering in the mountains below Vienna to receive a cure for an infected nose and a swollen liver and it was there that on the afternoon of October 24th he received a telephone call from Hitler. Rommel, the news from Africa sounds bad. The situation seems somewhat obscure. Nobody appears to know what has happened to General Stummer. Do you feel capable of returning to Africa and taking over there again? Stummer, who was acting commander in the absence of Rommel, had died of a heart attack the first night of the British offensive while fleeing on foot over the desert from a British patrol that had almost captured him. Though a sick man, Rommel agreed to return immediately. By the time he got back to headquarters west of El Alamein on the following evening, the battle, which Montgomery had launched at 9.40 p.m. on October 23rd, was already lost. The Eighth Army had too many guns, tanks, and planes, and though the Italian-German lines still held and Rommel made desperate efforts to shift his battered divisions to stem the various attacks and even to counterattack, he realized that his situation was hopeless. He had no reserves, of men or tanks or oil. The RAF, for once, had complete command of the skies and was pounding his troops and armor and remaining supply dumps mercilessly. On November 2nd, Montgomery's infantry and armor broke through on the southern sector of the front and began to overrun the Italian divisions there. That evening Rommel radioed Hitler's headquarters in East Prussia 2,000 miles away that he could no longer hold out and that he intended to withdraw, while there was still the opportunity, to the Fuca position forty miles to the west. He had already commenced to do so when a long message came over the air the next day from the Supreme Warlord. To Field Marshal Rommel, I and the German people are watching the heroic defensive battle waged in Egypt with faithful trust in your powers of leadership and in the bravery of the German-Italian troops under your command. In the situation in which you now find yourself, there can be no other consideration save that of holding fast, of not retreating one step, of throwing every gun and every man into the battle. You can show your troops no other way than that which leads to victory or to death. Adolf Hitler This idiotic order meant, if obeyed, that the Italo-German armies were condemned to swift annihilation. And for the first time in Africa, Beyerlein says, Rommel did not know what to do. After a brief struggle with his conscience, he decided, over the protests of General Ritter von Thoma, the actual commander of the German Africa Corps, who said he was withdrawing in any case, to obey his supreme commander. The next day, November 4th, after telling Beyerlein, Hitler's order is a piece of unparalleled madness, I can't go along with this any longer, General Fantoma donned a clean uniform with the insignia of his rank and his decorations, stood by his burning tank until a British unit arrived, surrendered, and in the evening dined with Montgomery at his headquarters mess. I finally compelled myself to take this decision, Rommel wrote later in his diary, because I myself have always demanded unconditional obedience from my soldiers, and I therefore wish to accept this principle for myself. Later, as a subsequent diary entry declares, he learned better. Reluctantly, Rommel gave the order to halt the withdrawal, and at the same time sent off a courier by plane to Hitler to try to explain to him that unless he were permitted to fall back immediately, all would be lost. But events were already making that trip unnecessary. On the evening of November 4th, at the risk of being court-martialed for disobedience, Rommel decided to save what was left of his forces and retreat to Fuca. Only the remnants of the armored and motorized units could be extricated. The foot soldiers, mostly Italian, 
were left behind to surrender, as indeed the bulk of them already had done. Rommel's losses at El Alamein were 59,000 killed, wounded, and captured, of whom 34,000 were Germans, out of a total force of 96,000 men. On November 5th came a curt message from the Fuhrer. I agree to the withdrawal of your army into the Fuca position. But that position already had been overrun by Montgomery's tanks. Within fifteen days Rommel had fallen back seven hundred miles to beyond Benghazi with the remnants of his African army, some twenty-five thousand Italians, ten thousand Germans, and sixty tanks. And there was no opportunity to stop even there. This was the beginning of the end for Adolf Hitler, the most decisive battle of the war yet won by his enemies, though a second and even more decisive one was just about to begin on the snowy steppes of southern Russia. But before it did, the Fuhrer was to hear further bad news from North Africa, which spelled the doom of the Axis in that part of the world. Already on November 3rd, when the first reports had come in of Rommel's disaster, the Fuhrer's headquarters had received word that an Allied armada had been sighted assembling at Gibraltar. No one at OKW could make out what it might be up to. Hitler was inclined to think it was merely another heavily guarded convoy from Malta. This is interesting, because more than a fortnight earlier, on October 15th, the OKW staff chiefs had discussed several reports about an imminent Anglo-Saxon landing in West Africa. The intelligence apparently came from Rome, for Chano a week before, on October 9th, noted in his diary after a talk with the chief of the military secret service that the Anglo-Saxons are preparing to land in force in North Africa. The news depressed Chano, he foresaw, correctly as it turned out, that this would lead inevitably to a direct Allied assault on Italy. Hitler, preoccupied as he was with the failure of the Russians to cease their infernal resistance, did not take this first intelligence very seriously. At a meeting of OKW on October 15th, Yodel suggested that Vichy France be permitted to send reinforcements to North Africa so that the French could repel any Anglo-American landings. The Fuhrer, according to the OKW diary, turned the suggestion down because it might ruffle the Italians, who were jealous of any move to strengthen France. At the Supreme Commander's headquarters, the matter appears to have been forgotten until November 3rd. But on that day, although German agents on the Spanish side of Gibraltar had reported seeing a great Anglo-American fleet gathering there, Hitler was too busy rallying Rommel at Al Alamein to bother with what appeared to him to be merely another convoy from Malta. On November 5th, OKW was informed that one British naval force had sailed out of Gibraltar headed east, but it was not until the morning of November 7th, twelve hours before American and British troops began landing in North Africa, that Hitler gave the latest intelligence from Gibraltar some thought. The forenoon reports received at his headquarters in East Prussia were that British naval forces in Gibraltar and a vast fleet of transports and warships from the Atlantic had joined up and were steaming east into the Mediterranean. There was a long discussion among the staff officers and the Fuhrer. What did it all mean? What was the objective of such a large naval force? Hitler was now inclined to believe, he said, that the Western Allies might be attempting a major landing with some four or five divisions at Tripoli or Benghazi in order to catch Rommel in the rear. Admiral Kranke, the naval liaison officer at OKW, declared that there could not be more than two enemy divisions at the most. Even so, something had to be done. Hitler asked that the Luftwaffe in the Mediterranean be immediately reinforced, but was told that this was impossible for the moment. Judging by the OKW diary, all that Hitler did that morning was to notify Rundstedt, commander-in-chief in the West, to be ready to carry out Anton. This was the code word for the occupation of the rest of France. Whereupon the Supreme Commander, heedless of this ominous news or of the plight of Rommel, who would be trapped if the Anglo-Americans landed behind him, or of the latest intelligence warning of an imminent Russian counteroffensive on the Don in the rear of the Sixth Army at Stalingrad, entrained after lunch on November 7th for Munich, where on the next evening he was scheduled to deliver his annual speech to his old party cronies gathered to celebrate the anniversary of the Beer Hall Putsch. I learned from Hitler's captured daily calendar book that the celebration had been moved from the old Burger Breu Keller, where the Putsch had taken place, to a more elegant beer hall in Munich, the Löwenbräu Keller. The Burgerbräu Keller, it will be remembered, had been wrecked by a time bomb, which had just missed killing the Fuhrer on the night of November 8, 1939. 
The politician in him, as Halder noted, had got the upper hand of the soldier at a critical moment in the war. Supreme headquarters in East Prussia was left in charge of a colonel, one Freiherr Treutsch von Butler Brandenfels. Generals Keitel and Yodel, the chief officers of OKW, went along to participate in the beer house festivities. There is something weird and batty about such goings on that take the Supreme Warlord, who by now was insisting on directing the war on far flung fronts down to the divisional or regimental or even battalion level, thousands of miles from the battlefields on an unimportant political errand at a moment when the house is beginning to fall in. A change in the man, a corrosion, a deterioration has set in, as it already had with Goering, who, though his once all powerful Luftwaffe had been steadily declining, was becoming more and more attached to his jewels and his toy trains, with little time to spare for the ugly realities of a prolonged and increasingly bitter war. Anglo-American troops under General Eisenhower hit the beaches of Morocco and Algeria at 1.30 a.m. on November 8, 1942, and at 5.30 Ribbentrop was on the phone from Munich to Chano in Rome to give him the news. He was rather nervous, Chano wrote in his diary and wanted to know what we intended to do. I must confess that having been caught unawares, I was too sleepy to give a very satisfactory answer. The Italian foreign minister learned from the German embassy that the officials there were literally terrified by the blow. Hitler's special train from East Prussia did not arrive in Munich until 3.40 that afternoon, and the first reports he got about the Allied landings in northwest Africa were optimistic. Everywhere the French, he was told, were putting up stubborn resistance, and at Algiers and Oran they had repulsed the landing attempts. In Algeria, Germany's friend, Admiral Darlon, was organizing the defense with the approval of the Vichy regime. Hitler's first reactions were confused. He ordered the garrison at Crete, which was quite outside the new theater of war, immediately strengthened, explaining that such a step was as important as sending reinforcements to Africa. He instructed the Gestapo to bring Generals Vagon and Giraud to Vichy and to keep them under surveillance. General Giraud at that moment was arriving in Algiers. He had escaped from a German POW camp and settled in the south of France, where he was taken off by a British submarine on November 5th and brought to Gibraltar to confer with Eisenhower just before the landings. He asked Field Marshal von Rundstedt to set in action Anton, but not to cross the line of demarcation in France until he had further orders. And he requested Chano and Pierre Laval, who was now Premier of Vichy France, to meet him in Munich the next day. During the night, Chano wrote in his diary on November 9th, Ribbentrop telephoned, Either the Duce or I must go to Munich as soon as possible. Laval will also be there. I wake up the Duce. He is not very anxious to leave especially since he is not feeling very well. I shall go. For about twenty-four hours Hitler toyed with the idea of trying to make an alliance with France in order to bring her into the war against Britain and America, and at the moment to strengthen the resolve of the Pétain government to oppose the Allied landings in North Africa. He probably was encouraged in this by the action of Pétain in breaking off diplomatic relations with the United States on the morning of Sunday, November 8th and by the aged French Marshal's statement to the U.S. Chargé d'Affaires that his forces would resist the Anglo-American invasion. The OKW diary for that Sunday emphasizes that Hitler was preoccupied with working out a far-reaching collaboration with the French. That evening, the German representative in Vichy, Krug von Nieder, submitted a proposal to Pétain for a close alliance between Germany and France. By the next day, following his speech to the party veterans, in which he proclaimed that Stalingrad was firmly in German hands, the Fuhrer had changed his mind. He told Chano he had no illusions about the French desire to fight, and that he had decided on the total occupation of France, a landing in Corsica, a bridgehead in Tunisia. This decision, though not the timing, was communicated to Laval when he arrived in Munich by car on November 10th. This traitorous Frenchman promptly promised to urge Pétain to accede to the Fuhrer's wishes, but suggested that the Germans go ahead with their plans without waiting for the senile old marshal's approval, which Hitler fully intended to do. Chano has left a description of the Vichy premier, who was executed for treason after the war. Laval, with his white tie and middle-class French peasant attire, is very much out of place in the great salon among so many uniforms. He tries to speak in a familiar tone about his trip and his long sleep in the car, 
but his words go unheeded. Hitler treats him with frigid courtesy. The poor man could not even imagine the fait accompli that the Germans were to place before him. Not a word was said to Laval about the impending action, that the orders to occupy France were being given while he was smoking his cigarette and conversing with various people in the next room. Von Ribbentrop told me that Laval would be informed only the next morning at eight o'clock that on account of information received during the night, Hitler had been obliged to proceed to the total occupation of the country. The orders for the seizure of unoccupied France, in clear violation of the armistice agreement, were given by Hitler at 8.30 p.m. on November 10th and carried out the next morning without any other incident than a futile protest by Pétain. The Italians occupied Corsica, and German planes began flying in troops to seize French-held Tunisia before Eisenhower's forces could get there. There was one further and typical piece of Hitlerian deceit. On November 13th, the Führer assured Pétain that neither the Germans nor the Italians would occupy the naval base at Toulon, where the French fleet had been tied up since the armistice. On November 25th, the OKW diary recorded that Hitler had decided to carry out Lila as soon as possible. It is only fair to point out that Hitler strongly suspected, not without reason, that the French fleet might try to sail for Algeria and join the Allies. Despite his treacherous dealings with the Germans and his violent hatred of the British, Admiral Darlan, who happened to be visiting an ailing son at Algiers, had been pressed into service by Eisenhower as French commander in North Africa, not only because he seemed to be the only officer who could get the French army and navy to cease resisting the Anglo-American landings, but also in the hope that he could get the admiral commanding in Tunisia to oppose the German landings there, and also induce the French fleet in Toulon to make a dash for North Africa. The hopes proved vain, although Darlan tried. To his message ordering Admiral de la Borde to bring the fleet over from Toulon, he received an answer in one expressive, if indelicate, word. Merde. See the Process du Monsieur Pétain. Lila was the code word for the occupation of Toulon and the capture of the French fleet. On the morning of the 27th, German troops attacked the naval port, but French sailors held them up long enough to allow the crews, on the orders of Admiral de la Borde, to scuttle the ships. The French fleet was thus lost to the Axis, which badly needed its warships in the Mediterranean, but it was denied also to the Allies, to whom it would have been a most valuable addition. Hitler won the race against Eisenhower to seize Tunisia, but it was a doubtful victory. At his insistence, nearly a quarter of a million German and Italian troops were poured in to hold this bridgehead. If the Führer had sent one-fifth as many troops and tanks to Rommel a few months before, the Desert Fox most probably would have been beyond the Nile by now, the Anglo-American landing in northwest Africa could not have taken place, and the Mediterranean would have been irretrievably lost to the Allies, thus securing the soft undercover of the Axis belly. As it was, every soldier and tank and gun rushed by Hitler to Tunisia that winter, as well as the remnants of the Africa Corps, would be lost by the end of the spring. Some 125,000 Germans, according to General Eisenhower, out of a total of 240,000 Axis troops, the rest being Italian. This number includes only those who surrendered during the last week of the campaign, May 5th to 12th, 1943, Crusade in Europe, page 156 and more German troops would be marched into prisoner-of-war cages than at Stalingrad, to which we must now return. Disaster at Stalingrad Hitler and the principal generals of OKW were lingering on in the pleasant alpine surroundings of Berchtesgaden, when the first news of the Russian counteroffensive on the Don reached them a few hours after it had been launched in a blizzard at dawn on November 19th. Though a Soviet attack in this region had been expected, it was not believed at OKW that it would amount to enough to warrant Hitler and his chief military advisers, Keitel and Yodel, hurrying back to headquarters in East Prussia after the Fuhrer's ringing beer-house speech to the old party comrades in Munich on the evening of November 8th. So they had puttered about on the Obersalzberg, taking in the mountain air. Their peace and quiet was abruptly broken by an urgent telephone call from General Zeitzler the new chief of the Army General Staff, who had remained behind at Rostenburg. He had what the OKW diary recorded as alarming news. 
In the very first hours of the attack, an overwhelming Russian armored force had broken clean through the Romanian Third Army between Serafimovich and Kletskaya on the Don, just northwest of Stalingrad. South of the besieged city, other powerful Soviet forces were attacking strongly against the German Fourth Panzer Army and the Romanian Fourth Army, and threatening to pierce their fronts. The Russian objective was obvious to anyone who looked at a map, and especially obvious to Zeitzler, who, from army intelligence, knew that the enemy had massed thirteen armies with thousands of tanks in the south to achieve it. The Russians were clearly driving in great strength from the north and the south to cut off Stalingrad and to force the German Sixth Army there to either beat a hasty retreat to the west or see itself surrounded. Zeitzler later contended that as soon as he saw what was happening, he urged Hitler to permit the Sixth Army to withdraw from Stalingrad to the Don Bend, where the broken front could be restored. The mere suggestion threw the Fuhrer into a tantrum. I won't leave the Volga! I won't go back from the Volga! he shouted. And that was that. This decision, taken in such a fit of frenzy, led promptly to disaster. The Fuhrer personally ordered the Sixth Army to stand fast around Stalingrad. Hitler and his staff returned to headquarters on November 22nd. By this time, the fourth day of the attack, the news was catastrophic. The two Soviet forces from the north and south had met at Kalach, forty miles west of Stalingrad on the Don Bend. In the evening, a wireless message arrived from General Paulus, commander of the Sixth Army, confirming that his troops were now surrounded. Hitler promptly radioed back, telling Paulus to move his headquarters into the city and form a hedgehog defense. The Sixth Army would be supplied by air until it could be relieved. But this was futile talk. There were now twenty German and two Romanian divisions cut off at Stalingrad. Paulus radioed that they would need a minimum of 750 tons of supplies a day flown in. This was far beyond the capacity of the Luftwaffe, which lacked the required number of transport planes. Even if they had been available, not all of them could have got through in the blizzardy weather and over an area where the Russians had now established fighter superiority. Nevertheless, Goering assured Hitler that the Air Force could do the job. It never began to. The relief of the Sixth Army was a more practical and encouraging possibility. On November 25th, Hitler had recalled Field Marshal von Manstein, the most gifted of his field commanders, from the Leningrad front and put him in charge of a newly created formation, Army Group Don. His assignment was to push through from the southwest and relieve the Sixth Army at Stalingrad. But now the Fuhrer imposed impossible conditions on his new commander. Manstein tried to explain to him that the only chance of success lay in the Sixth Army's breaking out of Stalingrad to the west, while his own forces, led by the Fourth Panzer Army, pressed northeast against the Russian armies which lay between the two German forces. But once again Hitler refused to draw back from the Volga. The Sixth Army must remain in Stalingrad, and Manstein must fight his way to it there. This, as Manstein tried to argue with the Supreme Warlord, could not be done. The Russians were too strong. Nevertheless, with a heavy heart, Manstein launched his attack on December 12th. It was called, appropriately, Operation Winter Gale, for the full fury of the Russian winter had now hit the southern steppes, piling up the snow in drifts and dropping the temperature below zero. At first the offensive made good progress, the 4th Panzer Army under General Hoth driving northeast up both sides of the railroad from Kotanikovsky toward Stalingrad, some 75 miles away. By December 19th it had advanced to within some 40 miles of the southern perimeter of the city. By the 21st it was within 30 miles, and across the snowy steppes the besieged troops of the 6th Army could see at night the signal flares of their rescuers. At this moment, according to the later testimony of the German generals, a breakout from Stalingrad of the Sixth Army toward the advancing lines of the Fourth Panzer Army would almost certainly have succeeded. But once again Hitler forbade it. On December 21st, Zeitzler had wrung permission from the leader for the troops of Paulus to break out, provided they also held on to Stalingrad. This piece of foolishness, the general staff chief says, nearly drove him insane. On the following evening, Zeitzler related later, I begged Hitler to authorize the breakout. I pointed out that this was absolutely our last chance to save the 200,000 men of Paulus's army. Hitler would not give way. In vain, I described to him conditions inside the so-called fortress. 
the despair of the starving soldiers, their loss of confidence in the supreme command, the wounded expiring for lack of proper attention while thousands froze to death. He remained as impervious to arguments of this sort as to those others which I had advanced. In the face of increasing Russian resistance in front of him and on his flanks, General Hote lacked the strength to negotiate that last thirty miles to Stalingrad. He believed that if the Sixth Army broke out, he could still make a junction with it, and then both forces could withdraw to Kotelnikovsky. This at least would save a couple of hundred thousand German lives. In his post-war memoirs, Field Marshal von Manstein says that on December 19th, in disobedience to Hitler's orders, he actually directed the Sixth Army to begin to break out of Stalingrad to the southwest and make a junction with the Fourth Panzer Army. He publishes the text of the directive, but it contained certain reservations, and Paulus, who was still under orders from Hitler not to break out, must have been greatly confused by it. This, declares Manstein, was our one and only chance of saving the Sixth Army. Manstein lost victories, pages 336 to 341 and 562 to 563. Probably for a day or two, between December 21st and 23rd, this could have been done but by the latter date it had become impossible. For unknown to Hoth, the Red Army had struck farther north and was now endangering the left flank of Manstein's whole army grouped on. On the night of December 22nd, Manstein telephoned Hoth to prepare himself for drastic new orders. The next day they came. Hoth was to abandon his drive on Stalingrad, dispatch one of his three panzer divisions to the Don front on the north, and defend himself where he was and with what he had left as well as he could. The attempt to relieve Stalingrad had failed. Manstein's drastic new orders had come as the result of alarming news that reached him on December 17th. On the morning of that day, a Soviet army had broken through the Italian Eighth Army farther up the Don at Boguchar, and by evening opened a gap twenty-seven miles deep. Within three days the hole was ninety miles wide. The Italians were fleeing in panic, and the Romanian Third Army to the south, which already had been badly pummeled on the opening day of the Russian offensive on November 19th, was also disintegrating. No wonder Manstein had had to take part of Hoth's armored forces to help stem the gap. A chain reaction followed. Not only the Don armies fell back, but also Hoth's forces, which had come so close to Stalingrad. These retreats in turn endangered the German army in the Caucasus, which would be cut off if the Russians reached Rostov on the Sea of Azov. A day or two after Christmas, Zeitzler pointed out to Hitler, Unless you order a withdrawal from the Caucasus now, we shall soon have a second Stalingrad on our hands. Reluctantly, the Supreme Commander issued the necessary instructions on December 29th to Kleist's Army Group A, which comprised the 1st Panzer and 17th Armies, and which had failed in its mission to grab the rich oil fields of Grozny. It, too, began a long retreat after having been within sight of its goal. The reverses of the Germans in Russia and of the Italo-German armies in North Africa stirred Mussolini to thought. Hitler had invited him to come to Salzburg for a talk around the middle of December, and the ailing Duce, now on a strict diet for stomach disorders, had accepted, though, as he told Chano, he would go on one condition only, that he take his meals alone because he does not want a lot of ravenous Germans to notice that he is compelled to live on rice and milk. The time had come, Mussolini decided, to tell Hitler to cut his losses in the East, make some sort of deal with Stalin, and concentrate Axis strength on defending the rest of North Africa, the Balkans, and Western Europe. 1943 will be the year of the Anglo-American effort, he told Chano. Hitler was unable to leave his eastern headquarters in order to meet Mussolini, so Chano made the long journey to Rostenburg on December 18th on his behalf, repeating to the Nazi leader the Duce's proposals. Hitler scorned them and assured the Italian foreign minister that without at all weakening the Russian front, he could send additional forces to North Africa, which must, he said, be held. Chano found German spirits at a low ebb at headquarters, despite Hitler's confident assurances. The atmosphere is heavy. To the bad news there should perhaps be added the sadness of that humid forest, and the boredom of collective living in the barracks. No one tries to conceal from me the unhappiness over the news of the breakthrough on the Russian front. There were open attempts to put the blame on us. At that very moment the survivors of the Italian Eighth Army on the Don were scurrying for their lives, 
and when one member of Chano's party asked an OKW officer whether the Italians had suffered heavy losses, he was told, No losses at all, they are running. The German troops in the Caucasus and on the Don, if not running, were getting out as quickly as they could to avoid being cut off. Each day, as the year 1943 began, they withdrew a little farther from Stalingrad. The time had now come for the Russians to finish off the Germans there. But first, they gave the doomed soldiers of the Sixth Army an opportunity to save their lives. On the morning of January 8, 1943, three young Red Army officers bearing a white flag entered the German lines on the northern perimeter of Stalingrad and presented General Paulus with an ultimatum from General Rokossovsky, commander of the Soviet forces on the Don Front. After reminding him that his army was cut off and could not be relieved or kept supplied from the air, the note said, The situation of your troops is desperate. They are suffering from hunger, sickness, and cold. The cruel Russian winter has scarcely yet begun. Hard frosts, cold winds, and blizzards still lie ahead. Your soldiers are unprovided with winter clothing and are living in appalling sanitary conditions. Your situation is hopeless and any further resistance senseless. In view of this, and in order to avoid unnecessary bloodshed, we propose that you accept the following terms of surrender. They were honorable terms. All prisoners would be given normal rations. The wounded, sick, and frostbitten would receive medical treatment. All prisoners could retain their badges of rank, decorations, and personal belongings. Paulus was given twenty-four hours to reply. He immediately radioed the text of the ultimatum to Hitler and asked for freedom of action. His request was curtly dismissed by the Supreme Warlord. Twenty-four hours after the expiration of the time limit on the demand for surrender, on the morning of January 10th, the Russians opened the last phase of the Battle of Stalingrad with an artillery bombardment from 5,000 guns. The fighting was bitter and bloody. Both sides fought with incredible bravery and recklessness over the frozen wasteland of the city's rubble, but not for long. Within six days, the German pocket had been reduced by half to an area fifteen miles long and nine miles deep at its widest. By January 24th it had been split in two, and the last small emergency airstrip lost. The planes which had brought in some supplies, especially medicines for the sick and wounded, and which had flown out 29,000 hospital cases, could no longer land. Once more the Russians gave their courageous enemy a chance to surrender. Soviet emissaries arrived at the German lines on January 24th with a new offer. Again Paulus, torn between his duty to obey the mad Fuhrer and his obligation to save his own surviving troops from annihilation, appealed to Hitler. Troops without ammunition, he radioed on the 24th, or food. Effective command no longer possible. Eighteen thousand wounded without any supplies or dressings or drugs. Further defense senseless. Collapse inevitable. Army requests immediate permission to surrender in order to save lives of remaining troops. Hitler's answer has been preserved. Surrender is forbidden. Sixth Army will hold their positions to the last man and the last round and by their heroic endurance will make an unforgettable contribution toward the establishment of a defensive front and the salvation of the Western world. The Western world. It was a bitter pill for the men of the Sixth Army who had fought against that world in France and Flanders but a short time ago. Further resistance was not only senseless and futile, but impossible. And as the month of January 1943 approached its end, the epic battle wore itself out, expiring like the flame of an expended candle which sputters and dies. By January 28th what was left of a once great army was split into three small pockets, in the southern one of which General Paulus had his headquarters in the cellar of the ruins of the once thriving Univermag department store. According to one eyewitness, the commander-in-chief sat on his camp bed in a darkened corner in a state of near collapse. He was scarcely in the mood, nor were his soldiers, to appreciate the flood of congratulatory radiograms that now began to pour in. Goering, who had whiled away a good part of the winter in sunny Italy, strutting about in his great fur coat and fingering his jewels, sent a radio message on January 28th. The fight put up by the Sixth Army will go down in history, and future generations will speak proudly of a Langemark of daredeviltry, an Alcazar of tenacity, an Arvik of courage, and a Stalingrad of self-sacrifice.
nor were they cheered when on the last evening, January 30th, 1943, the 10th anniversary of the Nazis coming to power, they listened to the fat Reich Marshal's bombastic broadcast. A thousand years hence, Germans will speak of this battle, of Stalingrad, with reverence and awe, and will remember that in spite of everything, Germany's ultimate victory was decided there. In years to come, it will be said of the heroic battle on the Volga, when you come to Germany, say that you have seen us lying at Stalingrad, as our honor and our leaders ordained that we should, for the greater glory of Germany. The glory and the horrible agony of the Sixth Army had now come to an end. On January 30th, Paulus radioed Hitler, Final collapse cannot be delayed more than twenty-four hours. This signal prompted the Supreme Commander to shower a series of promotions on the doomed officers in Stalingrad, apparently in the hope that such honors would strengthen their resolve to die gloriously at their bloody posts. There is no record in military history of a German field marshal being taken prisoner, Hitler remarked to Yodel, and thereupon conferred on Paulus by radio the coveted marshal's baton. Some 117 other officers were jumped up a grade. It was a macabre gesture. The end itself was anticlimactic. Late on the last day of January, Paulus got off his final message to headquarters. The Sixth Army, true to their oath and conscious of the lofty importance of their mission, have held their position to the last man and the last round, for Fuhrer and Fatherland, unto the end. At 7.45 p.m., the radio operator at Sixth Army Headquarters sent a last message on his own. The Russians are at the door of our bunker. We are destroying our equipment. He added the letters CL, the international wireless code signifying, this station will no longer transmit. There was no last-minute fighting at Headquarters. Paulus and his staff did not hold out to the last man. A squad of Russians led by a junior officer peered into the commander-in-chief's darkened hole in the cellar. The Russians demanded surrender, and the Sixth Army's chief of staff, General Schmidt, accepted. Paulus sat dejected on his camp bed. When Schmidt addressed him, May I ask the field marshal if there is anything more to be said? Paulus was too weary to answer. Farther north, a small German pocket containing all that was left of two panzer and four infantry divisions still held out in the ruins of a tractor factory. On the night of February 1st, it received a message from Hitler's headquarters. The German people expect you to do your duty exactly as did the troops holding the southern fortress. Every day and every hour that you continue to fight facilitates the building of a new front. Just before noon on February 2nd, this group surrendered after a last message to the Supreme Commander. Have fought to the last man against vastly superior forces. Long live Germany. Silence at last settled on the snow-covered, blood-spattered shambles of the battlefield. At 2.46 p.m. on February 2nd, the German reconnaissance plane flew high over the city and radioed back, no sign of any fighting at Stalingrad. By that time, 91,000 German soldiers, including 24 generals, half-starved, frost-bitten, many of them wounded, all of them dazed and broken, were hobbling over the ice and snow, clutching their blood-caked blankets over their heads against the twenty-four degrees below zero cold, toward the dreary, frozen prisoner of war camps of Siberia. Except for some twenty thousand Romanians and the twenty-nine thousand wounded who had been evacuated by air, they were all that was left of a conquering army that had numbered two hundred eighty-five thousand men two months before. The rest had been slaughtered. And of those 91,000 Germans who began the weary march into captivity that winter day, only 5,000 were destined ever to see the fatherland again. According to the figure given by the Bonn government in 1958, many of the prisoners died during an epidemic of typhus in the following spring. Meanwhile, back in the well-heated headquarters in East Prussia, the Nazi warlord, whose stubbornness and stupidity were responsible for this disaster, berated his generals at Stalingrad for not knowing how and when to die. The records of a conference held by Hitler at OKW with his generals on February 1st survive and shed enlightenment on the nature of the German dictator at this trying period in his life and that of his army and country. They have surrendered there, formally and absolutely. Otherwise they would have closed ranks, formed a hedgehog, and shot themselves with their last bullet. The man, Paulus, 
should have shot himself just as the old commanders who threw themselves on their swords when they saw that the cause was lost. Even Varus gave his slave the order, Now kill me. Hitler's venom toward Paulus for deciding to live became more poisonous as he ranted on. You have to imagine he'll be brought to Moscow, and imagine that rat trap there. There he will sign anything. He'll make confessions, make proclamations, you'll see. They will now walk down the slope of spiritual bankruptcy to its lowest depths. You'll see. It won't be a week before Zeidlitz and Schmidt and even Paulus are talking over the radio. Hitler was correct in his forecast, except for the timing. By July of the following summer, Paulus and Zeidlitz, who became the leaders of the so-called National Committee of Free Germany, did take to the air over the Moscow radio to urge the army to eliminate Hitler. They are going to be put into the Ljublanka, and there the rats will eat them. How can one be so cowardly? I don't understand it. What is life? Life is the nation. The individual must die anyway. Beyond the life of the individual is the nation. But how can anyone be afraid of this moment of death, with which he can free himself from this misery, if his duty doesn't chain him to this veil of tears? Nah. So many people have to die, and then a man like that besmirches the heroism of so many others at the last minute. He could have freed himself from all sorrow and descended into eternity and national immortality, but he prefers to go to Moscow. What hurts me most, personally, is that I still promoted him to field marshal. I wanted to give him this final satisfaction. That's the last field marshal I shall appoint in this war. You mustn't count your chickens before they're hatched. There followed a brief exchange between Hitler and General Zeitzler on how to break the news of the surrender to the German people. On February 3rd, three days after the act, OKW issued a special communique. The Battle of Stalingrad has ended. True to their oath to fight to the last breath, the Sixth Army under the exemplary leadership of Field Marshal Paulus has been overcome by the superiority of the enemy and by the unfavorable circumstances confronting our forces. The reading of the communique over the German radio was preceded by the roll of muffled drums and followed by the playing of the second movement of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Hitler proclaimed four days of national mourning. All theaters, movies, and variety halls were closed until it was over. Stalingrad, wrote Walter Gerlitz, the German historian, in his work on the general staff, was a second Jena, and was certainly the greatest defeat that a German army had ever undergone. But it was more than that. Coupled with El Alamein and the British-American landings in North Africa, it marked the great turning point in World War II. The high tide of Nazi conquest, which had rolled over most of Europe to the frontier of Asia on the Volga and in Africa, almost to the Nile, had now begun to ebb, and it would never flow back again. The time of the great Nazi blitz offensives, with thousands of tanks and planes spreading terror in the ranks of the enemy armies and cutting them to pieces, had come to an end. There would be, to be sure, desperate local thrusts at Kharkov in the spring of 1943, in the Ardennes at Christmas time in 1944, but they formed part of a defensive struggle which the Germans were to carry out with great tenacity and valor during the next two and last years of the war. The initiative had passed from Hitler's hands, never to return. It was his enemies who seized it now and held it and not only on land, but in the air. Already on the night of May 30, 1942, the British had carried out their first 1,000-plane bombing of Cologne, and more followed on other cities during the eventful summer. For the first time, the civilian German people, like the German soldiers at Stalingrad and El Alamein, were to experience the horrors which their armed forces had inflicted on others up to now. And finally, in the snows of Stalingrad and in the burning sands of the North African desert, a great and terrible Nazi dream was destroyed. Not only was the Third Reich doomed by the disasters to Paulus and Rommel, but also the gruesome and grotesque so-called New Order which Hitler and his SS thugs had been busy setting up in the conquered lands. Before we turn to the final chapter, the fall of the Third Reich, it might be well to pause and see what this New Order was like in theory and in barbarous practice, and what this ancient and civilized continent of Europe barely escaped after a brief nightmare of experiencing its first horrors. 
It must necessarily be for this book, as it was for the good Europeans who lived through it, or were massacred before it ended, the darkest chapter of all in the history of the Third Reich. Book Five Beginning of the End Chapter 27 The New Order No comprehensive blueprint for the New Order was ever drawn up, but it is clear from the captured documents and from what took place that Hitler knew very well what he wanted it to be, a Nazi-ruled Europe whose resources would be exploited for the profit of Germany, whose people would be made the slaves of the German master race and whose undesirable elements, above all the Jews, but also many Slavs in the East, especially the intelligentsia among them, would be exterminated. The Jews and the Slavic peoples were the Untermenschen, subhumans. To Hitler they had no right to live, except as some of them, among the Slavs, might be needed to toil in the fields and the mines as slaves of their German masters. Not only were the great cities of the East, Moscow, Leningrad, and Warsaw, to be permanently erased, but the culture of the Russians and Poles and other Slavs was to be stamped out and formal education denied them. As early as September 18, 1941, Hitler had specifically ordered that Leningrad was to be wiped off the face of the earth. After being surrounded, it was to be razed to the ground by bombardment and bombing, and its population, three millions, was to be destroyed with it. Their thriving industries were to be dismantled and shipped to Germany, and the people themselves confined to the pursuits of agriculture so that they could grow food for Germans, being allowed to keep for themselves just enough to subsist on. Europe itself, as the Nazi leaders put it, must be made Jew-free. What happens to a Russian, to a Czech, does not interest me in the slightest, declared Heinrich Himmler on October 4, 1943, in a confidential address to his SS officers at Posen. By this time Himmler, as chief of the SS and the entire police apparatus of the Third Reich, was next to Hitler in importance, holding the power of life and death not only over eighty million Germans, but over twice that many conquered people. What the nations, Himmler continued, can offer in the way of good blood of our type, we will take, if necessary, by kidnapping their children and raising them here with us. Whether nations live in prosperity or starve to death like cattle interests me only insofar as we need them as slaves to our kultur. Otherwise, it is of no interest to me. Whether ten thousand Russian females fall down from exhaustion while digging an anti-tank ditch interests me only insofar as the anti-tank ditch for Germany is finished. Long before Himmler's Posen speech in 1943, to which we shall return for it covers other aspects of the new order, the Nazi chiefs had laid down their thoughts and plans for enslaving the people of the East. By October 15, 1940, Hitler had decided on the future of the Czechs, the first Slavic people he had conquered. One half of them were to be assimilated, mostly by shipping them as slave labor to Germany. The other half, particularly the intellectuals, were simply to be, in the words of a secret report on the subject, eliminated. A fortnight before, on October 2nd, the Fuhrer had clarified his thoughts about the fate of the Poles, the second of the Slavic peoples to be conquered. His faithful secretary, Martin Bormann, has left a long memorandum on the Nazi plans, which Hitler outlined to Hans Frank, the governor-general of Rump, Poland, and to other officials. The Poles, Hitler emphasized, are especially born for low labor. There can be no question of improvement for them. It is necessary to keep the standard of life low in Poland, and it must not be permitted to rise. The Poles are lazy, and it is necessary to use compulsion to make them work. The government general of Poland should be used by us merely as a source of unskilled labor. Every year the laborers needed by the Reich could be procured from there. As for the Polish priests, they will preach what we want them to preach. If any priest acts differently, we shall make short work of him. The task of the priest is to keep the Poles quiet, stupid, and dull-witted. There were two other classes of Poles to be dealt with, and the Nazi dictator did not neglect mention of them. It is indispensable to bear in mind that the Polish gentry must cease to exist. However cruel this may sound, they must be exterminated wherever they are. There should be one master only for the Poles. The German, two masters, side by side, 
cannot and must not exist. Therefore, all representatives of the Polish intelligentsia are to be exterminated. This sounds cruel, but such is the law of life. This obsession of the Germans with the idea that they were the master race and that the Slavic peoples must be their slaves was especially virulent in regard to Russia. Eric Kolk, the roughneck Reich commissar for the Ukraine, expressed it in a speech at Kiev on March 5, 1943. We are the master race and must govern hard but just. I will draw the very last out of this country. I did not come to spread bliss. The population must work, work, and work again. We definitely did not come here to give out manna. We have come here to create the basis for victory. We are a master race which must remember that the lowliest German worker is racially and biologically a thousand times more valuable than the population here. Nearly a year before, on July 23, 1942, when the German armies in Russia were nearing the Volga and the oil fields of the Caucasus, Martin Bormann, Hitler's party secretary and by now right-hand man, wrote a long letter to Rosenberg reiterating the Fuhrer's views on the subject. The letter was summed up by an official in Rosenberg's ministry. The Slavs are to work for us. Insofar as we don't need them, they may die. Therefore, compulsory vaccination and German health services are superfluous. The fertility of the Slavs is undesirable. They may use contraceptives or practice abortion. The more, the better. Education is dangerous. It is enough if they can count up to one hundred. Every educated person is a future enemy. Religion we leave to them as a means of diversion. As for food, they won't get any more than is absolutely necessary. We are the masters. We come first. When the German troops first entered Russia, they were in many places hailed as liberators by a population long ground down and terrorized by Stalin's tyranny. There were, in the beginning, wholesale desertions among the Russian soldiers, especially in the Baltic, which had been under Soviet occupation but a short time, and in the Ukraine, where an incipient independence movement had never been quite stamped out, many were happy to be freed from the Soviet yoke, even by the Germans. There were a few in Berlin who believed that if Hitler played his cards shrewdly, treating the population with consideration and promising relief from Bolshevik practices, by granting religious and economic freedom, and making true cooperatives out of the collectivized farms, and eventual self-government, the Russian people could be won over. They might then not only cooperate with the Germans in the occupied regions, but in the unoccupied ones strive for liberation from Stalin's harsh rule. If this were done, it was argued, the Bolshevik regime itself might collapse and the Red Army disintegrate, as the Tsarist armies had done in 1917. But the savagery of the Nazi occupation and the obvious aims of the German conquerors, often publicly proclaimed, to plunder the Russian lands, enslave their peoples, and colonize the East with Germans, soon destroyed any possibility of such a development. No one summed up this disastrous policy and all the opportunities it destroyed better than a German himself. Dr. Otto Breutigam, a career diplomat and the deputy leader of the political department of Rosenberg's newly created Ministry for the Occupied Eastern Territories. In a bitter confidential report to his superiors on October 25, 1942, Breutigam dared to pinpoint the Nazi mistakes in Russia. In the Soviet Union we found on our arrival a population weary of Bolshevism, which waited longingly for new slogans holding out the prospect of a better future for them. It was Germany's duty to find such slogans, but they remained unuttered. The population greeted us with joy as liberators and placed themselves at our disposal. Actually, there was a slogan, but the Russian people soon saw through it. With the inherent instinct of the Eastern peoples, Freudigam continued, the primitive man soon found out that for Germany the slogan, Liberation from Bolshevism, was only a pretext to enslave the Eastern peoples according to her own methods. The worker and peasant soon perceived that Germany did not regard them as partners of equal rights, but considered them only as the objective of her political and economic aims. With unequaled presumption, we put aside all political knowledge and treat the peoples of the occupied eastern territories as second-class whites, to whom providence is merely assigned at the task of serving as slaves for Germany. There were two other developments, Breutigam declared, which had turned the Russians against the Germans, the barbaric treatment of Soviet prisoners of war and the shanghaiing of Russian men and women for slave labor. 
It is no longer a secret from friend or foe that hundreds of thousands of Russian prisoners of war have died of hunger or cold in our camps. We now experience the grotesque picture of having to recruit millions of laborers from the occupied eastern territories after prisoners of war have died of hunger like flies. In the prevailing limitless abuse of the Slavic humanity, recruiting methods were used which probably had their origin only in the blackest periods of the slave traffic. A regular manhunt was inaugurated. Without consideration of health or age, the people were shipped to Germany. Neither the extermination of masses of Soviet prisoners of war nor the exploitation of Russian slave labor was a secret to the Kremlin. As early as November 1941, Molotov had made a formal diplomatic protest against the extermination of Russian POWs, and in April of the following year he made another protest against the German slave labor program. German policy and practice in Russia had brought about the enormous resistance of the Eastern peoples, this official concluded. Our policy has forced both Bolshevists and Russian nationalists into a common front against us. The Russian fights today with exceptional bravery and self-sacrifice for nothing more or less than recognition of his human dignity. Closing his thirteen-page memorandum on a positive note, Dr. Breutigam asked for a complete change of policy. The Russian people, he argued, must be told something concrete about their future. But this was a voice in the Nazi wilderness. Hitler, as we have seen, already had laid down, before the attack began, his directives on what would be done with Russia and the Russians, and he was not a man who could be persuaded by any living German to change them by one iota. On July 16, 1941, less than a month after the commencement of the Russian campaign, but when it was already evident from the initial German successes that a large slice of the Soviet Union would soon be within grasp, Hitler convoked Goering, Keitel, Rosenberg, Bormann, and Lammers, the last head of the Reich Chancellery, to his headquarters in East Prussia to remind them of his aims in the newly conquered land. At last his goal, so clearly stated in Mein Kampf, of securing a vast German Lebensraum in Russia, was in sight, and it is clear from the confidential memorandum of the meeting drawn up by Bormann, which showed up at Nuremberg, that he wanted his chief lieutenants to understand well what he intended to do with it. His intentions, he admonished, must, however, not be publicized. There is no need for that, Hitler said, but the main thing is that we ourselves know what we want. Nobody must be able to recognize that it initiates a final settlement. This need not prevent our taking all necessary measures, shooting, resettling, etc., and we shall take them. In principle, Hitler continued, we now have to face the task of cutting up the cake according to our needs in order to be able first to dominate it, second to administer it, third to exploit it. He did not mind, he said, that the Russians had ordered partisan warfare behind the German lines. It enables us to eradicate everyone who opposes us. In general, Hitler explained, Germany would dominate the Russian territory up to the Urals. None but Germans would be permitted to carry weapons in that vast space. Then Hitler went over specifically what would be done with various slices of the Russian cake. The entire Baltic country will have to be incorporated into Germany. The Crimea has to be evacuated by all foreigners and settled by Germans only, becoming Reich territory. The Kola Peninsula will be taken by Germany because of the large nickel mines there. The annexation of Finland as a federated state should be prepared with caution. The Fuhrer will raise Leningrad to the ground and then hand it over to the Finns. The Baku oil fields, Hitler ordered, would become a German concession and the German colonies on the Volga would be annexed outright. When it came to a discussion as to which Nazi leaders would administer the new territory, a violent quarrel broke out. Rosenberg states he intends to use Captain von Petersdorf, owing to his special merits, general consternation, general rejections. The Fuhrer and the Reich Marshal, Goering, both emphasized that there was no doubt that von Petersdorf was insane. There was also an argument on the best methods of policing the conquered Russian people. Hitler suggested the German police be equipped with armored cars. Goering doubted that they would be necessary. His planes could drop bombs in case of riots, he said. Naturally, Goering added, this giant area would have to be pacified as quickly as possible. The best solution would be to shoot anybody who looked sideways. 
A year before, it will be remembered, Goering had told Chano that this year between twenty and thirty million persons will die of hunger in Russia, and that perhaps it is well that it should be so. Already, he said, Russian prisoners of war had begun to eat each other. Goering, as head of the four-year plan, was also put in charge of the economic exploitation of Russia. In a directive of Goering's economic staff, East, on May 23, 1941, the destruction of the Russian industrial areas was ordered. The workers and their families in these regions were to be left to starve. Any attempt to save the population there, the directive stated, from death by starvation by importing food surpluses from the black soil zone of Russia was prohibited. Plunder would be a better word, as Goering made clear in a speech to the Nazi commissioners for the occupied territories on August 6, 1942. It used to be called plundering, he said, but today things have become more humane. In spite of that, I intend to plunder and to do it thoroughly. On this, at least, he was as good as his word, not only in Russia, but throughout Nazi-conquered Europe. It was all part of the new order. The Nazi Plunder of Europe the total amount of loot will never be known. It has proved beyond man's capacity to accurately compute. But some figures are available, many of them from the Germans themselves. They show with what Germanic thoroughness the instructions which Goering once gave to his subordinates were carried out. Whenever you come across anything that may be needed by the German people, you must be after it like a bloodhound. It must be taken out and brought to Germany. A great deal was taken out, not only in goods and services, but in banknotes and gold. Whenever Hitler occupied a country, his financial agents seized the gold and foreign holdings of its national bank. That was a mere beginning. Staggering occupation costs were immediately assessed. By the end of February 1944, Count Schweren von Krusig, the Nazi minister of finance, put the total take from such payments at some 48 billion marks roughly twelve billion dollars, of which France, which was milked heavier than any other conquered country, furnished more than half. By the end of the war, receipts from occupation assessments amounted to an estimated sixty billion marks, fifteen billion dollars. France was forced to pay thirty-one point five billions of this total, its annual contributions of more than seven billions coming to over four times the yearly sums which Germany had paid in reparations under the Dawes and Young plans after the First War a tribute which had seemed such a heinous crime to Hitler. In addition, You've the Bank of France mail. was forced to grant credits to Germany, totaling 4.5 billion marks, and the French government to pay a further half a billion in fines. At Nuremberg, it was estimated that the Germans extracted in occupation costs and credits two-thirds of Belgium's national income and a similar percentage from the Netherlands. Altogether, according to a study by the U.S. Strategic Bombing Survey, Germany extracted in tribute from the conquered nations a total of 104 billion marks, 26 billion dollars. At the official rate of exchange, 2.5 Reichsmarks to the dollar, this would amount to 40 billion dollars, but I have used the unofficial rate of 4 Reichsmarks to the dollar. In terms of purchasing power, it is more accurate. But the goods seized and transported to the Reich without even the formality of payment can never possibly be estimated. Figures kept pouring in at Nuremberg until they overwhelmed one, but no expert, so far as I know, was ever able to straighten them out and compute totals. In France, for example, it was estimated that the Germans carted off, as levies in kind, nine million tons of cereals, seventy-five percent of the total production of oats, eighty percent of oil, seventy-four percent of steel, and so on, for a grand total of 184.5 billion francs. Russia, devastated by warfare and German savagery, proved harder to milk. Nazi documents are full of reports of Soviet deliveries. In 1943, for example, nine million tons of cereals, two million tons of fodder, three million tons of potatoes, 662,000 tons of meat were listed by the Germans among the deliveries to which the Soviet Committee of Investigation added, for the duration of the occupation, nine million cattle, twelve million pigs, 13 million sheep, to mention a few items. But Russian deliveries proved much less than expected. The Germans calculated them as worth a net of only some 4 billion marks, 1 billion dollars. According to Alexander Dahlin in his exhaustive study of German rule in Russia, 
Germany could have obtained more from Russia in normal trade. See Dahlen, German Rule in Russia. Everything possible was squeezed out of Poland by the greedy Nazi conquerors. I shall endeavor, said Dr. Frank, the Governor General, to squeeze out of this province everything that is still possible to squeeze out. This was at the end of 1942, and in the three years since the occupation he had already squeezed out, as he continually boasted, a great deal, especially in foodstuffs for hungry Germans in the Reich. He warned, however, that if the new food scheme is carried out in 1943, a half million people in Warsaw and its suburbs alone will be deprived of food. The nature of the new order in Poland had been laid down as soon as the country was conquered. On October 3, 1939, Frank informed the army of Hitler's orders. Poland can only be administered by utilizing the country through means of ruthless exploitation, deportation of all supplies, raw materials, machines, factory installations, etc., which are important for the German war economy, availability of all workers for work within Germany, reduction of the entire Polish economy to absolute minimum necessary for bare existence of the population, closing of all educational institutions, especially technical schools and colleges, in order to prevent the growth of the new Polish intelligentsia. Poland shall be treated as a colony. The Poles shall be the slaves of the greater German Reich. Rudolf Hess, the Nazi deputy Führer, added that Hitler had decided that Warsaw shall not be rebuilt, nor is it the intention of the Führer to rebuild or reconstruct any industry in the government general. By decree of Dr. Frank, all property in Poland belonging not only to Jews but to Poles was subject to confiscation without compensation. Hundreds of thousands of Polish-owned farms were simply grabbed and handed over to German settlers. By May 31, 1943, in the four Polish districts annexed to Germany, West Prussia, Posen, Zikanau, Silesia, some 700,000 estates comprising 15 million acres were seized, and 9,500 estates totaling 6.5 million acres confiscated. The difference between seizure and confiscation is not explained in the elaborate table prepared by the German Central Estate Office, and to the dispossessed Poles it must not have mattered. Even the art treasures in the occupied lands were looted, and, as the captured Nazi documents later revealed, on the express orders of Hitler and Goering, who thereby greatly augmented their private collections. The corpulent Reich Marshal, according to his own estimate, brought his own collection up to a value of fifty million Reichsmarks. Indeed, Goering was the driving force in this particular field of looting. Immediately upon the conquest of Poland, he issued orders for the seizure of art treasures there, and within six months the special commissioner appointed to carry out his command could report that he had taken over almost the entire art treasury of the country. But it was in France where the bulk of the great art treasures of Europe lay, and no sooner was this country added to the Nazi conquests than Hitler and Goering decreed their seizure. To carry out this particular plunder, Hitler appointed Rosenberg, who set up an organization called Einsatzstab Rosenberg, and who was assisted not only by Goering but by General Keitel. Indeed, one order by Keitel to the army in France stated that Rosenberg is entitled to transport to Germany cultural goods which appear valuable to him and to safeguard them there. The Führer has reserved for himself the decision as to their use. An idea of Hitler's decision as to their use is revealed in a secret order issued by Goering on November 5, 1940, specifying the distribution of art objects being collected at the Louvre in Paris. They were to be disposed of in the following way. 1. Those art objects about which the Führer has reserved for himself the decision as to their use. 2. Those which serve the completion of the Reich Marshals, i.e. Goering's, collection. 4. Those that are suited to be sent to German museums. The French government protested the looting of the country's art treasures, declaring that it was a violation of the Hague Convention and when one German art expert on Rosenberg's staff, a Herr Bunyas, dared to call this to the attention of Goering, the fat one replied, My dear Bunyas, let me worry about that. I am the highest jurist in the state. It is my orders which are decisive, and you will act accordingly. And so, according to a report of Bunyas, it is his only appearance in the history of the Third Reich, so far as the documents show, those art objects collected at the Jeu de Pomme, which are to go into the Führer's possession, and those which the Reich Marshal claims for himself, 
will be loaded into two railroad cars which will be attached to the Reich Marshal's special train to Berlin. Many more carloads followed. According to a secret official German report, some 137 freight cars loaded with 4,174 cases of artworks comprising 21,903 objects, including 10,890 paintings, made the journey from the West to Germany up to July 1944. They included works of, among others, Rembrandt, Rubens, Hals, Vermeer, Velázquez, Murillo, Goya, Vecchio, Watteau, Fragonar, Reynolds, and Gainsborough. As early as January 1941, Rosenberg estimated the art loot from France alone as worth a billion marks. The plunder of raw materials, manufactured goods, and food, though it reduced the occupied peoples to impoverishment, hunger, and sometimes starvation, and violated the Hague Convention on the Conduct of War, might have been excused, if not justified, by the Germans as necessitated by the harsh exigencies of total war. But the stealing of art treasures did not help Hitler's war machine. It was a case merely of avarice, of the personal greed of Hitler and Goering. All this plunder and spoliation the conquered populations could have endured, wars and enemy occupation had always brought privation in their wake. But this was only a part of the new order, the mildest part. It was in the plunder not of material goods, but of human lives, that the mercifully short-lived new order will be longest remembered. Here Nazi degradation sank to a level seldom experienced by man in all his time on earth. Millions of decent, innocent men and women were driven into forced labor, millions more tortured and tormented in the concentration camps, and millions more still, of whom there were four and a half million Jews alone, were massacred in cold blood or deliberately starved to death, and their remains, in order to remove the traces, burned. This incredible story of horror would be unbelievable were it not fully documented and testified to by the perpetrators themselves. What follows here, a mere summary which must, because of limitations of space, leave out a thousand shocking details, is based on that incontrovertible evidence, with occasional corroboration from the eyewitness accounts of the few survivors. Slave Labor in the New Order by the end of September 1944, some seven and a half million civilian foreigners were toiling for the Third Reich. Nearly all of them had been rounded up by force, deported to Germany in boxcars, usually without food or water or any sanitary facilities, and there put to work in the factories, fields, and mines. They were not only put to work, but degraded, beaten, and starved, and often left to die for lack of food, clothing, and shelter. In addition, two million prisoners of war were added to the foreign labor force, at least a half a million of whom were made to work in the armaments and munitions industries in flagrant violation of the Hague and Geneva Conventions, which stipulated that no war prisoners could be employed in such tasks. Albert Speer, Minister for Armament and War Production, admitted at Nuremberg that 40% of all prisoners of war were employed in 1944 in the production of weapons and munitions, and in subsidiary industries. This figure did not include the hundreds of thousands of other POWs who were impressed into the building of fortifications, and in carrying ammunition to the front lines, and even in manning anti-aircraft guns, in further disregard of the international conventions which Germany had signed. A captured record shows Field Marshal Milk of the Air Force in 1943 demanding 50,000 more Russian war prisoners to be added to the 30,000 already manning anti-aircraft artillery. It is amusing, Milk laughed, that Russians must work the guns. In the massive deportations of slave labor to the Reich, wives were torn away from their husbands and children from their parents and assigned to widely separated parts of Germany. The young, if they were old enough to work at all, were not spared. Even top generals of the army cooperated in the kidnapping of children, who were carted off to the homeland to perform slave labor. A memorandum from Rosenberg's files of June 12, 1944, reveals this practice in occupied Russia. Army Group Center intends to apprehend 40 to 50,000 youths from the age of 10 to 14 and transport them to the Reich. The measure was originally proposed by the Ninth Army. It is intended to allot these juveniles primarily to the German trades as apprentices. 
This action is being greatly welcomed by the German trade since it represents a decisive measure for the alleviation of the shortage of apprentices. This action is not only aimed at preventing a direct reinforcement of the enemy's strength, but also as a reduction of his biological potentialities. The kidnapping operation had a code name, Hay Action. It was also being carried out, the memorandum added, by Field Marshal Modul's Army Group Ukraine North. Increasing terrorization was used to round up the victims. At first, comparatively mild methods were used. Persons coming out of church or the movies were nabbed. In the West, especially, SS units merely blocked off a section of a town and seized all able-bodied men and women. Villages were surrounded and searched for the same purposes. In the East, when there was resistance to the forced labor order, villages were simply burned down and their inhabitants carted off. Rosenberg's captured files are replete with German reports of such happenings. In Poland, at least one German official thought things were going a little too far. The wild and ruthless manhunt, he wrote to Governor Frank, as exercised everywhere in towns and countries, in streets, squares, stations, even in churches, at night in homes, has badly shaken the feeling of security of the inhabitants. Everybody is exposed to the danger of being seized anywhere and at any time by the police, suddenly and unexpectedly, and of being sent to an assembly camp. None of his relatives knows what has happened to him. But rounding up the slave workers was only the first step. The entire slave labor program was put in charge of Fritz Zaukel, who was given the title of Plenipotentiary General for the Allocation of Labor. A second-string Nazi, he had been Gauleiter and governor of Thuringia. A pig-eyed little man, rude and tough, he was, as Goebbels mentioned in his diary, one of the dullest of the dull. In the dock at Nuremberg, he struck this writer as being a complete non-entity, the sort of German who in other times might have been a butcher in a small-town meat market. One of his first directives laid it down that the foreign workers were to be treated in such a way as to exploit them to the highest possible extent, at the lowest conceivable degree of expenditure. He admitted at Nuremberg that, of all the millions of foreign workers, not even two hundred thousand came voluntarily. However, at the trial he denied all responsibility for their ill-treatment. He was found guilty, sentenced to death, and hanged in the Nuremberg jail on the night of October 15th to 16th, 1946. The condition of their transport to Germany left something to be desired, a certain Dr. Gutkelk described one instance in a report to Rosenberg's ministry on September 30, 1942. Recounting how a train packed with returning worked-out Eastern laborers met a train at a siding near Brest-Litovsk full of newly recruited Russian workers bound for Germany, he wrote, Because of the corpses in the trainload of returning laborers, a catastrophe might have occurred. In this train, women gave birth to babies who were thrown out of the windows during the journey. Persons having tuberculosis and venereal diseases rode in the same car. Dying people lay in freight cars without straw, and one of the dead was thrown on the railway embankment. The same must have occurred in other returning transports. This was not a very promising introduction to the Third Reich for the Osterbeiter, but at least it prepared them somewhat for the ordeal that lay ahead. Hunger lay ahead, and beatings and disease and exposure to the cold, in unheated quarters and in their thin rags. Long hours of labor lay ahead that were limited only by their ability to stand on their feet. The great Krupp Works, makers of Germany's guns and tanks and ammunition, was a typical place of employment. Krupp employed a large number of slave laborers, including Russian prisoners of war. At one point during the war, 600 Jewish women from the Buchenwald concentration camp were brought into work at Krupp's, being housed, in a bombed-out work camp from which the previous inmates, Italian POWs, had been removed. Dr. Wilhelm Jaeger, the senior doctor for Krupp's slaves, described in an affidavit at Nuremberg what he found there when he took over. Upon my first visit I found these females suffering from open festering wounds and other diseases. I was the first doctor they had seen for at least a fortnight. There were no medical supplies. They had no shoes and went about in their bare feet. The sole clothing of each consisted of a sack with holes for their arms and head. Their hair was shorn. The camp was surrounded by barbed wire and closely guarded by SS guards. The amount of food in the camp was extremely meager and of very poor quality. 
One could not enter the barracks without being attacked by fleas. I got large boils on my arms and the rest of my body from them. Dr. Jaeger reported the situation to the directors of Krupp, and even to the personal physician of Gustav Krupp von Bolen und Halbach, the owner, but in vain. Nor did his reports on other Krupp slave labor camps bring any alleviation. He recalled in his affidavit some of these reports of conditions in eight camps inhabited by Russian and Polish workers. Overcrowding that bred disease, lack of enough food to keep a man alive, lack of water, lack of toilets. The clothing of the Eastern workers was likewise completely inadequate. They worked and slept in the same clothing in which they had arrived from the East. Virtually all of them had no overcoats and were compelled to use their blankets as coats in cold and rainy weather. In view of the shortage of shoes, many workers were forced to go to work in their bare feet, even in winter. Sanitary conditions were atrocious. At Kramerplatz, only ten children's toilets were available for twelve hundred inhabitants. Excretion contaminated the entire floors of these lavatories. The Tartars and Kyrgyz suffered most. They collapsed like flies from bad housing, the poor quality and insufficient quantity of food, overwork and insufficient rest. These workers were likewise afflicted with spotted fever. Lice, the carrier of the disease, together with countless fleas, bugs, and other vermin, tortured the inhabitants of these camps. At times the water supply at the camps was shut off for periods of from eight to fourteen days. On the whole, western slave workers fared better than those from the east, the latter being considered by the Germans as mere scum. But the difference was only relative, as Dr. Jaeger found at one of Krupp's work camps occupied by French prisoners of war in Nogaretstrasse at Essen. Its inhabitants were kept for nearly half a year in dog kennels, urinals, and in old baking houses. The dog kennels were three feet high, nine feet long, six feet wide. Five men slept in each of them. The prisoners had to crawl into these kennels on all fours. There was no water in the camp. Besides obtaining thousands of slave laborers, both civilians and prisoners of war for its factories in Germany, the Krupp firm also built a large fuse factory at the extermination camp at Auschwitz, where Jews were worked to exhaustion and then gassed to death. Baron Gustav Krupp von Bolen und Halbach, the chairman of the board, was indicted as a major war criminal at Nuremberg, along with Göring et al., but because of his physical and mental condition, he had had a stroke and had faded into senility, he was not tried. He died on January 16, 1950. An effort was made by the prosecution to try in his stead his son, Alfred, who had acquired sole ownership of the company in 1943, but the tribunal denied this. Alfred Krupp von Polen und Halbach was subsequently tried before a Nuremberg military tribunal, a purely American court, along with nine directors of the firm, in the United States v. Alfred Krupp et al. case. On July 31, 1948, he was sentenced to twelve years' imprisonment and confiscation of all his property. He was released from Landsberg Prison, where Hitler had served his sentence in 1924, on February 4, 1951, in a general amnesty issued by John J. McCloy, the U.S. High Commissioner. Not only was the confiscation of his corporate property annulled, but his personal fortune of some ten million dollars was returned to him. The Allied governments had ordered the breakup of the vast Krupp empire, but Alfred Krupp, who took over the active management of the firm after his release from prison, evaded the order, and at the time of writing, 1959, announced with the approval of the Bonn government that not only would the company not be broken up, but that it was acquiring new industries. Some two and a half million slave laborers, mostly Slavs and Italians, were assigned to farm work in Germany, and though their life from the very force of circumstances was better than that of those in the city factories, it was far from ideal, or even humane. A captured directive on the treatment of foreign farm workers of Polish nationality gives an inkling of their treatment. And though applied to Poles, it is dated March 6, 1941, before Russians became available, it was later used as guidance for those of other nationalities. Farm workers of Polish nationality no longer have the right to complain, and thus no complaints will be accepted by any official agency. The visit of churches is strictly prohibited. Visits to theaters, motion pictures, or other cultural entertainment are strictly prohibited. Sexual intercourse with women and girls is strictly prohibited. 
If it was with German females, it was, according to an edict of Himmler in 1942, punishable by death. Himmler's directive of February 20, 1942, was directed especially against Russian slave workers. It ordered special treatment also for severe violations against discipline, including work refusal or loafing at work. In such cases, special treatment is requested. Special treatment is hanging. It should not take place in the immediate vicinity of the camp. A certain number, however, should attend the special treatment. The term special treatment was a common one in Himmler's files and in Nazi parlance during the war. It meant just what Himmler in this directive said it meant. The use of railroads, buses, or other public conveyances was prohibited for slave farm workers. This apparently was ordained so that they would not escape from the farms to which they were bound. Arbitrary change of employment, the directive stated, is strictly prohibited. The farm workers have to labor as long as is demanded by the employer. There are no time limits to the working time. Every employer has the right to give corporal punishment to his farm workers. They should, if possible, be removed from the community of the home, and they can be quartered in stables, etc. No remorse whatever should restrict such action. Even the Slav women seized and shipped to Germany for domestic service were treated as slaves. As early as 1942, Hitler had commanded Zalkel to procure a half million of them in order to relieve the German housewife. The slave labor commissar laid down the conditions of work in the German households. There is no claim to free time. Female domestic workers from the East may leave the household only to take care of domestic tasks. It is prohibited for them to enter restaurants, movies, theaters, and similar establishments. Attending church is also prohibited. Women, it is obvious, were almost as necessary as men in the Nazi slave labor program. Of some three million Russian civilians pressed into service by the Germans, more than one-half were women. Most of them were assigned to do heavy farm work and to labor in the factories. The enslavement of millions of men and women of the conquered lands as lowly toilers for the Third Reich was not just a wartime measure. From the statements of Hitler, Goering, Himmler, and the others already cited, and they are only a tiny sampling, it is clear that if Nazi Germany had endured, the new order would have meant the rule of the German master race over a vast slave empire, stretching from the Atlantic to the Ural Mountains. To be sure, the Slavs in the East would have fared the worst. As Hitler emphasized in July 1941, scarcely a month after he had attacked the Soviet Union, his plans for its occupation constituted a final settlement. A year later, at the high tide of his Russian conquests, he admonished his aides, As for the ridiculous hundred million Slavs, we will mold the best of them to the shape that suits us, and we will isolate the rest of them in their own pigsties, and anyone who talks about cherishing the local inhabitant and civilizing him Go straight off to a concentration camp. The Prisoners of War Though it was a flagrant violation of the Hague and Geneva Conventions to use prisoners of war in armament factories or in any labor connected with the fighting at the front, such employment, massive as it was, constituted the least of worries for the millions of soldiers captured by the Third Reich. Their overwhelming concern was to survive the war. If they were Russian, the odds were greatly against them. There were more Soviet war prisoners than all others put together, some five and three-quarter million of them. Of these, barely one million were found alive when Allied troops liberated the inmates of the POW camps in 1945. About a million had either been released during the war or allowed to serve in the collaborator units set up by the German army. Two million Russian prisoners of war died in German captivity from starvation, exposure, and disease. The remaining million have never been accounted for, and at Nuremberg a good case was made that most of them either had died from the above causes or had been exterminated by the SD, SS Security Service. According to the German records, 67,000 were executed, but this is most certainly a partial figure. The bulk of the Russian war prisoners, some 3,800,000 of them, were taken by the Germans in the first phase of the Russian campaign, in the great battles of encirclement which were fought from June 21st to December 6, 1941. Admittedly, it was difficult for an army in the midst of combat and rapid advance to care adequately for such a large number of captives. But the Germans made no effort to. Indeed, the Nazi records show, as we have seen, 
that the Soviet prisoners were deliberately starved and left out in the open without shelter to die in the terrible sub-zero snowbound winter of 1941-42. The more of these prisoners who die, the better it is for us, was the attitude of many Nazi officials, according to no less an authority than Rosenberg. The clumsy minister for the occupied eastern territories was not a humane Nazi, particularly in regard to the Russians, with whom, as we have seen, he had grown up. But even he was moved to protest the treatment of Russian prisoners in a long letter to General Keitel, the chief of OKW, dated February 28, 1942. This was the moment when the Soviet counteroffensive, which had hurled the Germans back before Moscow and Rostov, had reached its farthest penetrations that winter, and when the Germans had realized at last that their gamble of destroying Russia in one short campaign, or perhaps ever, had failed. And that just possibly, now that the USA had been added to Russia and Britain as their enemies, they might not win the war, in which case they would be held accountable for their war crimes. The fate of the Soviet prisoners of war in Germany, Rosenberg wrote Keitel, is a tragedy of the greatest extent. Of the 3,600,000 of them, only several hundred thousand are still able to work fully. A large part of them have starved or died because of the hazards of the weather. This could have been avoided, Rosenberg continued. There was food enough in Russia to provide them. However, in the majority of cases, the camp commanders have forbidden food to be put at the disposal of the prisoners. They have rather let them starve to death. Even on the march to the camps, the civilian population was not allowed to give the prisoners food. In many cases, when the prisoners could no longer keep up on the march because of hunger and exhaustion, they were shot before the eyes of the horrified civilian population and the corpses were left. In numerous camps, no shelter for the prisoners was provided at all. They lay under the open sky during rain or snow. Finally, the shooting of prisoners of war must be mentioned. These ignore all political understanding. For instance, in various camps, all the Asiatics were shot. Not only Asiatics. Shortly after the beginning of the Russian campaign, an agreement was reached between OKW and the SS Security Service for the latter to screen Russian prisoners. The objective was disclosed in an affidavit by Otto Ohlendorf, one of the SD's great killers, and like so many of the men around Himmler, a displaced intellectual, for he had university degrees both in the law and in economics, and had been a professor at the Institute for Applied Economic Science. All Jews and communist functionaries, Ohlendorf testified, were to be removed from the prisoner of war camps and were to be executed. To my knowledge, this action was carried out throughout the entire Russian campaign. But not without difficulties. Sometimes the Russian captives were so exhausted that they could not even walk to their execution. This brought a protest from Heinrich Müller, the chief of the Gestapo, a dapper-looking fellow but also a cold, dispassionate killer. Müller was never apprehended after the war. He was last seen in Hitler's bunker in Berlin on April 29, 1945. Some of his surviving colleagues believe he is now in the service of the Soviet secret police, of which he was a great admirer. The commanders of the concentration camps are complaining that five to ten percent of the Soviet Russians destined for execution are arriving in the camps dead or half-dead. It was particularly noted that when marching, for example, from the railroad station to the camp, a rather large number of prisoners collapsed on the way from exhaustion, either dead or half-dead, and had to be picked up by a truck following the convoy. It cannot be prevented that the German people take notice of these occurrences. The Gestapo didn't care a rap about the Russian captives falling dead from starvation and exhaustion, except that it robbed the executioners of their prey. But they didn't want the German people to see the spectacle. Gestapo Müller, as he was known in Germany, therefore ordered that, effective from today, November 9, 1941, Soviet Russians obviously marked by death and who therefore are not able to withstand the exertions of even a short march, shall in the future be excluded from the transport into the concentration camps for execution. Dead prisoners or even starved and exhausted ones could not perform work, and in 1942, when it became obvious to the Germans that the war was going to last considerably longer than they had expected, and that the captive Soviet soldiers constituted a badly needed labor reservoir, the Nazis abandoned their policy of exterminating them in favor of working them. Himmler explained the change in his speech to the SS at Posen in 1943. At that time, 1941, 
We did not value the mass of humanity as we value it today, as raw material, as labor. What, after all, thinking in terms of generations, is not to be regretted but is now deplorable by reason of the loss of labor, is that the prisoners died in tens and hundreds of thousands of exhaustion and hunger. They were now to be fed enough to enable them to work. By December 1944, three-quarters of a million of them, including many officers, were toiling in the armament factories, the mines, where 200,000 were assigned, and on the farms. Their treatment was harsh, but at least they were allowed to live. Even the branding of the Russian war captives, which General Keitel had proposed, was abandoned. On July 20, 1942, Keitel had drafted the order. 1. Soviet prisoners of war are to be branded with a special and durable mark. 2. The brand is to consist of an acute angle of about 45 degrees with a one centimeter length of side, pointing downward on the left buttock at about a hand's width from the rectum. The treatment of Western prisoners of war, especially of the British and Americans, was comparatively milder than that meted out by the Germans to the Russians. There were occasional instances of the murder and massacre of them, but this was due usually to the excessive sadism and cruelty of individual commanders. Such a case was the slaughter in cold blood of 71 American prisoners of war in a field near Malmedy, Belgium, on December 17, 1944, during the Battle of the Bulge. There were other occasions when Hitler himself ordered the murder of Western prisoners, as he did in the case of 50 British flyers who were caught in the spring of 1944 after escaping from a camp at Zagen. At Nuremberg, Goering said he considered it the most serious incident of the whole war. General Yodel called it sheer murder. Actually, it seemed to be part of a deliberate German policy, adopted after Anglo-American bombing of Germany became so extensive from 1943 on, to encourage the killing of Allied airmen who had bailed out over Germany. Civilians were encouraged to lynch the flyers as soon as they had parachuted to the ground, and a number of these Germans were tried after the war for having done so. In 1944, when the Anglo-American bombings were reaching their peak, Ribbentrop urged that airmen shot down be summarily executed, but Hitler took a somewhat milder view. On May 21, 1944, in agreement with Goering, he merely ordered that captured flyers who had machine-gunned passenger trains or civilians or German planes, which had made emergency landings, be shot without court-martial. Sometimes captured flyers were simply turned over to the SD for special treatment. Thus some forty-seven American, British, and Dutch flyers, all officers, were brutally murdered at Mauthausen concentration camp in September 1944. An eyewitness, Maurice Lamp, a French inmate at the camp, described at Nuremberg how it was done. The forty-seven officers were led barefooted to the quarry. At the bottom of the steps, the guards loaded stones on the backs of these poor men, and they had to carry them to the top. The first journey was made with stones weighing about sixty pounds and accompanied by blows. The second journey, the stones were still heavier, and whenever the poor wretches sank under their burden, they were kicked and hit with a bludgeon. In the evening, twenty-one bodies were strewn along the road. The twenty-six others died the following morning. This was a familiar form of execution at Mauthausen and was used on, among others, a good many Russian prisoners of war. From 1942 on, that is, when the tide of war began to surge against him, Hitler ordered the extermination of captured Allied commandos, especially in the West. Captured Soviet partisans were summarily shot, as a matter of course. The Fuhrer's top-secret commando order of October 18, 1942, is among the Nazi documents. From now on, all enemies on so-called commando missions in Europe or Africa challenged by German troops, even if they are in uniform, whether armed or unarmed, in battle or in flight, are to be slaughtered to the last man. In a supplementary directive issued the same day, Hitler explained to his commanders the reason for his order. Because of the success of the Allied commandos, he said, I have been compelled to issue strict orders for the destruction of enemy sabotage troops and to declare non-compliance with these orders severely punishable. It must be made clear to the enemy that all sabotage troops will be exterminated, without exception, to the last man. This means that their chance of escaping with their lives is nil. Under no circumstances can they expect to be treated according to the rules of the Geneva Convention. If it should become necessary for reasons of interrogation to initially spare one man or two, then they are to be shot immediately after interrogation. 
This particular crime was to be kept strictly secret. General Yodel appended instructions to Hitler's directive, underlining his words. This order is intended for commanders only, and must not under any circumstances fall into enemy hands. They were directed to destroy all copies of it after they had duly taken note. It must have remained imprinted on their minds, for they proceeded to carry it out. A couple of instances of many may be given. On the night of March 22, 1944, two officers and thirteen men of the 267th Special Reconnaissance Battalion of the U.S. Army landed from a naval craft far behind the German lines in Italy to demolish a railroad tunnel between La Spezia and Genoa. They were all in uniform and carried no civilian clothes. Captured two days later, they were executed by a firing squad on March 26, without trial, on the direct orders of General Anton Dostler commander of the 75th German Army Corps. Tried by a U.S. military tribunal shortly after the war, General Dostler justified his action by contending that he was merely obeying Hitler's commando order. He argued that he himself would have been court-martialed by the Fuhrer if he had not obeyed. General Dostler was condemned to death by the U.S. military tribunal in Rome on October 12, 1945. Some fifteen members of an Anglo-American military mission, including a war correspondent of the Associated Press and all in uniform, which had parachuted into Slovakia in January 1945, were executed at Mauthausen concentration camp on the orders of Dr. Ernst Kaltenbrunner, the successor of Heydrich as head of the SD, and one of the defendants at Nuremberg. Kaltenbrunner was hanged at Nuremberg jail on the night of October 15th to 16th, 1946. Had it not been for the testimony of a camp adjutant who witnessed their execution, their murder might have remained unknown, for most of the files of the mass executions at this camp were destroyed. Nazi Terror in the Conquered Lands On October 22, 1941, the French newspaper Le Phare published the following notice. Cowardly criminals in the pay of England and Moscow killed the Feldkommandant of Nantes, on the morning of October 20th. Up to now the assassins have not been arrested. As expiation for this crime, I have ordered that fifty hostages be shot, to begin with. Fifty more hostages will be shot in case the guilty should not be arrested between now and October 23rd by midnight. This became a familiar notice in the pages of the newspapers or on red posters edged with black in France, Belgium, Holland, Norway, Poland, and Russia. The proportion, publicly proclaimed by the Germans, was invariably one hundred to one, a hundred hostages shot for every German killed. Though the taking of hostages was an ancient custom, much indulged in, for instance, by the Romans, it had not been generally practiced in modern times except by the Germans in the First World War and by the British in India and in South Africa during the Boer War. Under Hitler, however, the German army carried it out on a large scale during the Second War. Dozens of secret orders, signed by General Keitel and lesser commanders, were produced at Nuremberg, ordering the taking and shooting of hostages. It is important, Keitel decreed on October 1, 1941, that these should include well-known leading personalities or members of their families. And General von Stutnagel, the German commander in France, a year later stressed that the better known the hostages to be shot, the greater will be the deterrent effect on the perpetrators. In all, 29,660 French hostages were executed by the Germans during the war, and this figure did not include the 40,000 who died in French prisons. The figure for Poland was 8,000, and for Holland, some 2,000. In Denmark, what became known as a system of clearing murders was substituted for the publicly proclaimed shooting of hostages. On Hitler's express orders, reprisals for the killing of Germans in Denmark were to be carried out in secret, on the proportion of five to one. Thus, the great Danish pastor-poet-playwright Kai Munk, one of the most beloved men in Scandinavia, was brutally murdered by the Germans, his body left on the road with a sign pinned to it. Swine, you worked for Germany just the same. Of all the war crimes which he claimed he had to commit on the orders of Hitler, the worst of all, General Keitel said on the stand at Nuremberg, stemmed from the Nacht und Nebel Erlass, Night and Fog Decree. This grotesque order, reserved for the unfortunate inhabitants of the conquered territories in the West, was issued by Hitler himself on December 7, 1941. 
Its purpose, as the weird title indicates, was to seize persons endangering German security, who were not to be immediately executed, and make them vanish without a trace into the night and fog of the unknown in Germany. No information was to be given their families as to their fate, even when, as invariably occurred, it was merely a question of the place of burial in the Reich. On December 12, 1941, Keitel issued a directive explaining the Führer's orders. In principle, he said, the punishment for offenses committed against the German state is the death penalty. But, if these offenses are punished with imprisonment, even with hard labor for life, this will be looked upon as a sign of weakness. Efficient intimidation can only be achieved either by capital punishment or by measures by which the relatives of the criminal and the population do not know his fate. The following February, Keitel enlarged on the Night and Fog Decree. In cases where the death penalty was not meted out within eight days of a person's arrest, the prisoners are to be transported to Germany secretly. These measures will have a deterrent effect because a. the prisoners will vanish without leaving a trace, b. no information may be given as to their whereabouts or their fate. The SD was given charge of this macabre task, and its captured files are full of various orders pertaining to NN for Nacht und Nebel, especially in regard to keeping the burial places of the victims strictly secret. How many Western Europeans disappeared into night and fog was never established at Nuremberg, but it appeared that few emerged from it alive. Some enlightening figures, however, were obtainable from the SD records concerning the number of victims of another terror operation in conquered territory which was applied to Russia. This particular exercise was carried out by what was known in Germany as the Einsatzgruppen, special action groups, or what might better be termed, in view of their performance, extermination squads. The first round figure of their achievement came out as if by accident at Nuremberg. One day, some time before the trial began, a young American naval officer, Lieutenant Commander Whitney R. Harris of the American Prosecution Staff, was interrogating Otto Ohlendorf on his wartime activities. It was known that this attractive-looking German intellectual of youthful appearance, he was thirty-eight, had been head of Amt III of Himmler's Central Security Office, RSHA, but during the last years of the war had spent most of his time as a foreign trade expert in the Ministry of Economics. He told his interrogator that apart from one year he had spent the war period on official duty in Berlin. Asked what he had done during the year away, he replied, I was chief of Einsatzgruppe D. Harris, a lawyer by training and by this time something of an intelligence authority on German affairs, knew quite a bit about the Einsatzgruppes. So he asked promptly, During the year you were chief of Einsatzgruppe D, how many men, women, and children did your group kill? Ohlendorf, Harris later remembered, shrugged his shoulders and with only the slightest hesitation answered, Ninety thousand. The Einsatzgruppes had first been organized by Himmler and Heydrich to follow the German armies into Poland in 1939, and there round up the Jews and place them in ghettos. It was not until the beginning of the Russian campaign nearly two years later that, in agreement with the German army, they were ordered to follow the combat troops and to carry out one phase of the final solution. Four Einsatzgruppen were formed for this purpose, groups A, B, C, D. It was the last one which Ohlendorf commanded between June 1941 and June 1942, and it was assigned the southernmost sector in the Ukraine and attached to the 11th Army. Asked on the stand by Colonel John Harlan Amon what instructions it received, Ohlendorf answered, The instructions were that the Jews and the Soviet political commissars were to be liquidated. And when you say liquidated, do you mean killed? Amon asked. Yes, I mean killed, Ohlendorf answered explaining that this took in the women and children as well as the men. For what reason were the children massacred, the Russian judge, General I.T. Nikichenko, broke in to ask. Ohlendorf. The order was that the Jewish population should be totally exterminated. The judge. Including the children? Ohlendorf. Yes. The judge. Were all the Jewish children murdered? Ohlendorf. Yes. In response to further questioning by Amon and in his affidavit, Ohlendorf described how a typical killing took place. The Einsatz unit would enter a village or town and order the prominent Jewish citizens to call together all Jews for the purpose of resettlement, i.e., they were told they were being resettled elsewhere. 
They were requested to hand over their valuables and shortly before execution to surrender their outer clothing. They were transported to the place of executions, usually an anti-tank ditch, in trucks, always only as many as could be executed immediately. In this way it was attempted to keep the span of time from the moment in which the victims knew what was about to happen to them until the time of their actual execution, as short as possible. Then they were shot, kneeling or standing, by firing squads in a military manner, and the corpses thrown into the ditch. I never permitted the shooting by individuals, but ordered that several of the men should shoot at the same time in order to avoid direct personal responsibility. Other group leaders demanded that the victims lie down flat on the ground to be shot through the nape of the neck. I did not approve of these methods. Why? asked Damon. Because, replied Ollendorf, both for the victims and for those who carried out the executions, it was psychologically an immense burden to bear. In the spring of 1942, Ollendorf then recounted, an order came from Himmler to change the method of execution of the women and children. There was a special reason for this. Henceforth they were to be dispatched in gas vans, specially constructed for the purpose by two Berlin firms. The SD officer described to the tribunal how these remarkable vehicles worked. The actual purpose of these vans could not be seen from the outside. They looked like closed trucks and were so constructed that at the start of the motor, the gas, exhaust, was conducted into the van causing death in ten to fifteen minutes. How were the victims induced to enter the vans, Colonel Amon wanted to know. They were told they were to be transported to another locality, Ollendorf replied. Ollendorf was tried at Nuremberg by a U.S. military tribunal, along with twenty-one others in the Einsatzgruppen case. Fourteen of them were condemned to death. Only four, Ollendorf and three other group commanders, were executed on June 8, 1951, at Landsberg Prison, some three and a half years after being sentenced. The death penalties for the others were commuted. The burial of the victims of the gas vans, he went on to complain, was a great ordeal for the members of the Einsatzgruppen. This was confirmed by a certain Dr. Becker, whom Ollendorf identified as the constructor of the vans, in a document produced at Nuremberg. In a letter to headquarters, Dr. Becker objected to German SD men having to unload the corpses of the gassed women and children, calling attention to the immense psychological injuries and damage to their health which that work can have for these men. They complained to me about headaches which appeared after each unloading. Dr. Becker also pointed out to his superiors that the application of gas usually is not undertaken correctly. In order to come to an end as fast as possible, the driver presses the accelerator to the fullest extent. The persons to be executed suffer death from suffocation, and not death by dozing off, as was planned. Dr. Becker was quite a humanitarian, in his own mind, and ordered a change in technique. My directions now have proved that by correct adjustment of the levers, death comes faster and the prisoners fall asleep peacefully. Distorted faces and excretions, such as could be seen before, are no longer noticed. But the gas vans, as Ollendorf testified, could dispatch only from fifteen to twenty-five persons at a time and this was entirely inadequate for the massacres on the scale which Hitler and Himmler had ordered. Inadequate, for example, for the job that was done at Kiev, the capital of the Ukraine, in just two days, September 29th and 30th, 1941, when, according to an official Einsatz report, 33,771 persons, mostly Jews, were executed. An eyewitness report by a German of how a comparatively minor mass execution was carried out in the Ukraine brought a hush of horror over the Nuremberg courtroom when it was read by the chief British prosecutor, Sir Hartley Shawcross. It was a sworn affidavit by Hermann Greba, the manager and engineer of a branch office in the Ukraine of a German construction firm. On October 5, 1942, he witnessed the Einsatz commandos, supported by Ukrainian militia, in action at the execution pits at Dubno in the Ukraine. It was a matter, he reported, of liquidating the town's 5,000 Jews. My foreman and I went directly to the pits. I heard rifle shots in quick succession from behind one of the earth mounds. The people who had got off the trucks, men, women, and children of all ages, had to undress upon the order of an SS man who carried a riding or dog whip. They had to put down their clothes in fixed places, sorted according to shoes, top clothing, and underclothing. 
I saw a heap of shoes of about eight hundred to one thousand pairs, great piles of underlinen and clothing. Without screaming or weeping, these people undressed, stood around in family groups, kissed each other, said farewells, and waited for a sign from another SS man who stood near the pit, also with a whip in his hand. During the fifteen minutes that I stood near the pit, I heard no complaint or plea for mercy. An old woman with snow-white hair was holding a one-year-old child in her arms and singing to it and tickling it. The child was cooing with delight. The parents were looking on with tears in their eyes. The father was holding the hand of a boy about ten years old and speaking to him softly. The boy was fighting his tears. The father pointed to the sky, stroked his head, and seemed to explain something to him. At that moment the SS man at the pit shouted something to his comrade. The latter counted off about twenty persons and instructed them to go behind the earth mound. I well remember a girl, slim and with black hair, who, as she passed close to me, pointed to herself and said, Twenty-three years old. I walked around the mound and found myself confronted by a tremendous grave. People were closely wedged together and lying on top of each other so that only their heads were visible. Nearly all had blood running over their shoulders from their heads. Some of the people were still moving. Some were lifting their arms and turning their heads to show that they were still alive. The pit was already two-thirds full. I estimated that it contained about a thousand people. I looked for the man who did the shooting. He was an SS man who sat at the edge of the narrow end of the pit, his feet dangling into the pit. He had a tommy gun on his knees and was smoking a cigarette. The people, completely naked, went down some steps and clambered over the heads of the people lying there to the place to which the SS man directed them. They lay down in front of the dead or wounded people. Some caressed those who were still alive and spoke to them in a low voice. Then I heard a series of shots. I looked into the pit and saw that the bodies were twitching, or the heads lying already motionless on top of the bodies that lay beneath them. Blood was running from their necks. The next batch was approaching already. They went down into the pit, lined themselves up against the previous victims, and were shot. And so it went, batch after batch. The next morning the German engineer returned to the site. I saw about thirty naked people lying near the pit. Some of them were still alive. Later the Jews still alive were ordered to throw the corpses into the pit. Then they themselves had to lie down in this to be shot in the neck. I swear before God that this is the absolute truth. How many Jews and Russian Communist Party functionaries, the former vastly outnumber the latter, were massacred by the Einsatzgruppen in Russia before the Red Army drove the Germans out? The exact total could never be computed at Nuremberg, but Himmler's records, uncoordinated as they were, give a rough idea. Ohlendorf's Einsatzgruppen D, with its 90,000 victims, did not do as well as some of the other groups. Group A, for instance, in the north, reported on January 31, 1942, that it had executed 229,052 Jews in the Baltic region and in White Russia. Its commander, Franz Stahlecker, reported to Himmler that he was having difficulty in the latter province because of a late start, after the heavy frost set in, which made mass executions much more difficult. Nevertheless, he reported, Forty-one thousand Jews in White Russia have been shot up to now. Stahlecker, who was disposed of later in the year by Soviet partisans, enclosed with his report a handsome map showing the number of those done to death, symbolized by coffins, in each area under his command. In Lithuania alone, the map showed, 136,421 Jews had been slain. Some 34,000 had been spared for the time being, as they were needed for labor. Estonia, which had relatively few Jews, was declared in this report to be Jew-free. The Einsatzgruppen firing squads, after a let-up during the severe winter, banged away all through the summer of 1942. Some 55,000 more Jews were exterminated in White Russia by July 1st, and in October the remaining 16,200 inhabitants of the Minsk ghetto were dispatched in one day. By November Himmler could report to Hitler the 363,211 Jews had been killed in Russia from August through October, though the figure was probably somewhat exaggerated to please the bloodthirsty Fuhrer. On August 31st, Himmler had ordered an Einsatz detachment to execute a hundred inmates of the Minsk prison, so that he could see how it was done. 
According to Bokzelewski, a high officer in the SS who was present, Himmler almost swooned when he saw the effect of the first volley from the firing squad. A few minutes later, when the shots failed to kill two Jewish women outright, the SS Führer became hysterical. One result of this experience was an order from Himmler that henceforth the women and children should not be shot, but dispatched in the gas vans. All in all, according to Karl Eichmann, the head of the Jewish office of the Gestapo, two million persons, almost all Jews, were liquidated by the Einsatzgruppen in the East. But this is almost certainly an exaggeration. It is strange but true that the SS bigwigs were so proud of their exterminations that they often reported swollen figures to please Himmler and Hitler. Himmler's own statistician, Dr. Richard Korher, reported to his chief on March 23, 1943, that a total of 633,300 Jews in Russia had been resettled, a euphemism for massacre by the Einsatzgruppen. Surprisingly enough, this figure tallies fairly well with exhaustive studies later made by a number of experts. Add another 100,000 slain in the last two years of the war, and the figure is probably as accurate as we will ever have. The number of Soviet Communist Party functionaries slain by the Einsatzgruppen has never been estimated as far as I know. Most ST reports lumped them together with the Jews. In one report of Group A, dated October 15, 1941, some 3,387 communists are listed among the 121,817 executed, the rest being Jews, but the same report often lists the two together. High as it is, it is small compared to the number of Jews who were done to death in Himmler's extermination camps when the final solution came to be carried out. The Final Solution one fine June day of 1946 at Nuremberg, three members of the American prosecution staff were interrogating SS Obergruppenführer Oswald Pohl, who, among other things, had been in charge of work projects for the inmates of the Nazi concentration camps. Pohl, a naval officer before he joined the SS, had gone into hiding after the German collapse and had not been apprehended until a year later, in May 1946, when he was discovered working on a farm disguised as a farmhand. Pohl was condemned to death in the so-called concentration camp case by a U.S. military tribunal on November 3, 1947, and hanged in Landsberg prison on June 8, 1951, along with Ollendorf and others. In answer to one question, Pohl used a term with which the Nuremberg prosecution, busy for months in poring over millions of words from the captured documents, had begun to become familiar. A certain colleague by the name of Hearst had, Pohl said, been employed by Himmler in the final solution of the Jewish question. And what was that? Pohl was asked. The extermination of Jewry, he answered. The expression crept with increasing frequency into the vocabulary and the files of the leading Nazis as the war progressed, its seeming innocence apparently sparing these men the pain of reminding one another what it meant and perhaps, too, they may have thought furnishing a certain cover for their guilt should the incriminating papers ever come to light. Indeed, at the Nuremberg trials, most of the Nazi chiefs denied that they knew what it signified, and Goering contended he had never used the term, but this pretense was soon exploded. In the case against the Fat Reich Marshal, a directive was produced which he had sent Heydrich, the chief of the SD, on July 31, 1941, when the Einsatzgruppen were already falling with gusto to their extermination tasks in Russia. I herewith commission you, Goering instructed Heydrich, to carry out all preparations with regard to a total solution of the Jewish question in those territories of Europe which are under German influence. I furthermore charge you to submit to me as soon as possible a draft showing the measures already taken for the execution of the intended final solution of the Jewish question. A faulty translation of the last line, rendering the German word Endlösung as desired solution instead of final solution in the English copy of the document, led Justice Jackson, who did not know German, to allow Goering under cross-examination to get away with his contention that he never used the sinister term. The first time I learned of these terrible exterminations, Goering exclaimed at one point, was right here in Nuremberg. Heydrich knew very well what Goering meant by the term, for he had used it himself nearly a year before, at a secret meeting after the fall of Poland, in which he had outlined the first step in the final solution, 
which consisted of concentrating all the Jews in the ghettos of the large cities, where it would be easy to dispatch them to their final fate. As it worked out, the final solution was what Adolf Hitler had long had in mind, and what he had publicly proclaimed even before the war started. In his speech to the Reichstag on January 30, 1939, he had said, If the international Jewish financiers should again succeed in plunging the nations into a world war, the result will be the annihilation of the Jewish race throughout Europe. This was a prophecy, he said, and he repeated it five times verbatim in subsequent public utterances. It made no difference that not the international Jewish financiers, but he himself plunged the world into armed conflict. What mattered to Hitler was that there was now a world war, and that it afforded him, after he had conquered vast regions in the East where most of Europe's Jews lived, the opportunity to carry out their annihilation. By the time the invasion of Russia began, he had given the necessary orders. What became known in high Nazi circles as the Führer order on the final solution apparently was never committed to paper. At least no copy of it has yet been unearthed in the captured Nazi documents. All the evidence shows that it was most probably given verbally to Goering, Himmler, and Heydrich, who passed it down during the summer and fall of 1941. A number of witnesses testified at Nuremberg that they had heard of it, but none admitted ever seeing it. Thus Hans Lammers, the bull-headed chief of the Reich Chancellery, when pressed on the witness stand, replied, I knew that a Führer order was transmitted by Goering to Heydrich. This order was called Final Solution of the Jewish Problem. But Lammers claimed, as did so many others on the stand, that he did not really know what it was all about until Allied counsel revealed it at Nuremberg. Lammers was sentenced in April 1949 to twenty years' imprisonment by a U.S. military tribunal at Nuremberg, chiefly because of his responsibility in the anti-Jewish decrees. But as in the case of most of the other convicted Nazis whose sentences were greatly reduced by the American authorities, his term was commuted in 1951 to ten years, and he was released from Landsberg prison at the end of that year, after serving a total of six years from the date of his first imprisonment. It might be noted here that most Germans, at least so far as their sentiment was represented in the West German Parliament, did not approve of even the relatively mild sentences meted out to Hitler's accomplices. A number of them handed over by the Allies to German custody were not even prosecuted, even when they were accused of mass murder, and some of them quickly found employment in the Bonn government. By the beginning of 1942 the time had come, as Heydrich said, to clear up the fundamental problems of the final solution, so that it could at last be carried out and concluded. For this purpose, Heydrich convened a meeting of representatives of the various ministries and agencies of the SSSD at the pleasant Berlin suburb of Wannsee, on January 20, 1942, the minutes of which played an important part in some of the later Nuremberg trials. Despite the current setback of the Wehrmacht in Russia, the Nazi officials believed that the war was almost won, that Germany would shortly be ruling all of Europe, including England and Ireland. Therefore, Heydrich told the assembly of some fifteen high officials, in the course of this final solution of the European Jewish problem, approximately eleven million Jews are involved. He then rattled off the figures for each country. There were only 131,800 Jews left in the original Reich territory, out of a quarter of a million in 1939, but in the USSR, he said, there were five million, in the Ukraine, three million, in the general government of Poland, two and a quarter million, in France, three quarters of a million, and in England, a third of a million. The clear implication was that all eleven million must be exterminated. He then explained how this considerable task was to be carried out. The Jews should now, in the course of the final solution, be brought to the East for use as labor. In big labor gangs, with separation of sexes, the Jews capable of work are brought to these areas and employed in road building, in which task undoubtedly a great part will fall through natural diminution. The remnant that finally is able to survive all this, since this is undoubtedly the part with the strongest resistance, must be treated accordingly, since these people, representing a natural selection, are to be regarded as the germ cell of a new Jewish development. In other words, the Jews of Europe were first to be transported to the conquered East, then worked to death, and the few tough ones who survived simply put to death. And the Jews, the millions of them who resided in the East and were already on hand? State Secretary Dr. Josef Bueller, representing the Governor-General of Poland, had a ready suggestion for them. 
There were nearly two and a half million Jews in Poland, he said, who constituted a great danger. They were, he explained, bearers of disease, black market operators, and furthermore unfit for work. There was no transportation problem with these two and a half million souls. They were already there. I have only one request, Dr. Bueller concluded, that the Jewish problem in my territory be solved as quickly as possible. The good state secretary betrayed an impatience which was shared in high Nazi circles right up to Hitler. None of them understood at this time, not in fact until toward the end of 1942 when it was too late, how valuable the millions of Jews might be to the Reich as slave labor. At this point they only understood that working millions of Jews to death on the roads of Russia might take some time. Consequently, long before these unfortunate people could be worked to death, in most cases the attempt was not even begun, Hitler and Himmler decided to dispatch them by quicker means. There were two, principally. One of them, as we have seen, had begun shortly after the invasion of Russia in the summer of 1941. This was the method of mass slaughter of the Polish and Russian Jews by the flying firing squads of the Einsatzgruppen, which accounted for some three-quarters of a million. It was this method of achieving the final solution that Himmler had in mind when he addressed the SS generals at Posen on October 4, 1943. I also want to talk to you quite frankly on a very grave matter. Among ourselves it should be mentioned quite frankly, and yet we will never speak of it publicly. I mean the extermination of the Jewish race. Most of you must know what it means when a hundred corpses are lying side by side, or five hundred, or a thousand. To have stuck it out, and at the same time, apart from exceptions caused by human weakness, to have remained decent fellows. That is what has made us hard. This is a page of glory in our history which has never been written and is never to be written. No doubt the bespectacled S.S. Führer, who had almost fainted at the sight of a hundred Eastern Jews, including women being executed for his own delectation, would have seen in the efficient working by S.S. officers of the gas chambers in the extermination camps an even more glorious page in German history. For it was in these death camps that the final solution achieved its most ghastly success. The Extermination Camps All the thirty-odd principal Nazi concentration camps were death camps, and millions of tortured, starved inmates perished in them. Kogan estimates the number at 7,125,000 out of a total of 7,820,000 inmates, but the figure undoubtedly is too high. Kogan, The Theory and Practice of Hell, page 227. Though the authorities kept records, each camp had its official Totenbuch, death book, they were incomplete and in many cases were destroyed as the victorious allies closed in. Part of one Totenbuch that survived at Mauthausen listed 35,318 deaths from January 1939 to April 1945. The camp commander, Franz Zierreis, put the total number at 65,000. At the end of 1942, when the need of slave labor began to be acute, Himmler ordered that the death rate in the concentration camps must be reduced. Because of the labor shortage, he had been displeased at a report received in his office that of the 136,700 commitments to concentration camps between June and November 1942, some 70,610 had died, and that in addition, 9,267 had been executed and 27,846 transferred, to the gas chamber, that is. This did not leave very many for labor duties. But it was in the extermination camps, the Vernichtungslager, where most progress was made toward the final solution. The greatest and most renowned of these was Auschwitz, whose four huge gas chambers and adjoining crematoria gave it a capacity for death and burial far beyond that of the others. Treblinka, Belsic, Sobibor, and Chelmno, all in Poland. There were other minor extermination camps near Riga, Vilna, Minsk, Kaunas, and Lvov, but they were distinguished from the main ones in that they killed by shooting rather than by gas. For a time there was quite a bit of rivalry among the SS leaders as to which was the most efficient gas to speed the Jews to their death. Speed was an important factor, especially at Auschwitz, where toward the end the camp was setting new records by gassing 6,000 victims a day. One of the camp's commanders for a period was Rudolf Hurst, an ex-convict once found guilty of murder, who 
who deposed at Nuremberg on the superiority of the gas he employed. Born in 1900, the son of a small shopkeeper in Baden-Baden, Hearst was pressured by his pious Catholic father to become a priest. Instead, he joined the Nazi party in 1922. The next year, he was implicated in the murder of a schoolteacher who allegedly had denounced Leo Schlageter, a German saboteur in the Ruhr, who was executed by the French and became a Nazi martyr. Hearst received a life sentence. He was released in a general amnesty in 1928, joined the SS two years later, and in 1934 became a member of the Death's Head Group of the SS, whose principal job was the guarding of the concentration camps. His first job in this unit was at Dachau. Thus he spent almost his entire adult life, first as a prisoner, and then as a jailer. He freely, and even exaggeratedly, testified to his killings both on the stand at Nuremberg and in affidavits for the prosecution. Turned over later to the Poles, he was sentenced to death, and in March 1947 hanged at Auschwitz, the scene of his greatest crimes. The final solution of the Jewish question meant the complete extermination of all Jews in Europe. I was ordered to establish extermination facilities at Auschwitz in June 1941. At that time there were already in the general government of Poland three other extermination camps, Belsic, Treblinka, and Wolczek. I visited Treblinka to find out how they carried out their extermination. The camp commandant at Treblinka told me that he had liquidated 80,000 in the course of half a year. He was principally concerned with liquidating all the Jews from the Warsaw Ghetto a task which, because of the large numbers involved and because of, at the end, armed resistance, could not be completed, as we shall see, until 1943. He used monoxide gas, and I did not think that his methods were very efficient. So when I set up the extermination building at Auschwitz, I used Zyklon B, which was a crystallized prussic acid which we dropped into the death chamber from a small opening. It took from three to fifteen minutes to kill the people in the death chamber, depending upon climatic conditions. We knew when the people were dead because their screaming stopped. We usually waited about a half hour before we opened the doors and removed the bodies. After the bodies were removed, our special commandos took off the rings and extracted the gold from the teeth of the corpses. Another improvement we made over Treblinka was that we built our gas chambers to accommodate 2,000 people at one time, whereas at Treblinka their ten gas chambers only accommodated 200 people each. Hearst then explained how the victims were selected for the gas chambers, since not all the incoming prisoners were done away with, at least not at once, because some of them were needed to labor in the IG Farben Chemical Works and Krupp's factory until they became exhausted and were ready for the final solution. We had two SS doctors on duty at Auschwitz to examine the incoming transports of prisoners. These would be marched by one of the doctors, who would make spot decisions as they walked by. Those who were fit to work were sent into the camp. Others were sent immediately to the extermination plants. Children of tender years were invariably exterminated, since by reason of their youth they were unable to work. Always Herr Hurst kept making improvements in the art of mass killing. Still another improvement we made over Treblinka was that at Treblinka the victims almost always knew that they were to be exterminated, while at Auschwitz we endeavored to fool the victims into thinking that they were to go through a delousing process. Of course, frequently they realized our true intentions, and we sometimes had riots and difficulties. Very frequently women would hide their children under the clothes, but of course when we found them we would send the children in to be exterminated. We were required to carry out these exterminations in secrecy, but of course the foul and nauseating stench from the continuous burning of bodies permeated the entire area, and all of the people living in the surrounding communities knew that exterminations were going on at Auschwitz. Sometimes, Hearst explained, a few special prisoners, apparently Russian prisoners of war, were simply killed by injections of benzene. Our doctors, he added, had orders to write ordinary death certificates and could put down any reason at all for the cause of death. Usually, heart disease was written down. Kogan, himself in Buchenwald for eight years, gives samples. Patient died after prolonged suffering on blank at blank o'clock. Cause of death, cardiac weakness complicated by pneumonia. Kogan, The Theory and Practice of Hell, page 218. Such formalities were dispensed with at Auschwitz when the massive gassings began. Often the day's dead were not even counted. To Hearst's blunt description may be added a brief composite picture of death and disposal at Auschwitz, as testified to by surviving inmates and jailers. 
The selection, which decided which Jews were to be worked and which ones immediately gassed, took place at the railroad siding as soon as the victims had been unloaded from the freight cars in which they had been locked without food or water for as much as a week, for many came from such distant parts as France, Holland, and Greece. Though there were heart-rending scenes as wives were torn away from husbands and children from parents, none of the captives, as Hearst testified and survivors agreed, realized just what was in store for them. In fact, some of them were given pretty picture postcards marked Valdze to be signed and sent back home to their relatives with a printed inscription saying, We are doing very well here. We have work and we are well treated. We await your arrival. The gas chambers themselves and the adjoining crematoria, viewed from a short distance, were not sinister-looking places at all. It was impossible to make them out for what they were. Over them were well-kept lawns with flower borders, the signs at the entrances merely said baths. The unsuspecting Jews thought they were simply being taken to the baths for the delousing which was customary at all camps, and taken to the accompaniment of sweet music. For there was light music, an orchestra of young and pretty girls all dressed in white blouses and navy blue skirts, as one survivor remembered, had been formed from among the inmates. While the selection was being made for the gas chambers, this unique musical ensemble played gay tunes from The Merry Widow and Tales of Hoffman. Nothing solemn and somber from Beethoven. The death marches at Auschwitz were sprightly and merry tunes, straight out of Viennese and Parisian operetta. To such music, recalling as it did happier and more frivolous times, the men, women, and children were led into the bathhouses, where they were told to undress preparatory to taking a shower. Sometimes they were even given towels. Once they were inside the shower room, and perhaps this was the first moment that they may have suspected something was amiss, for as many as two thousand of them were packed into the chamber like sardines, making it difficult to take a bath, the massive door was slid shut, locked, and hermetically sealed. Up above, where the well-groomed lawn and flower beds almost concealed the mushroom-shaped lids of vents that ran up from the Hall of Death, orderlies stood ready to drop into them the amethyst blue crystals of hydrogen cyanide, or Zyklon B, which originally had been commercially manufactured as a strong disinfectant, and for which, as we have seen, Herr Hurst had with so much pride found a new use. Surviving prisoners, watching from blocks nearby, remembered how for a time the signal for the orderlies to pour the crystals down the vents was given by a Sergeant Mole. Na gib imen schon zu fressen. All right, give him something to chew on. He would laugh, and the crystals would be poured through the openings, which were then sealed. Through heavy glass portholes the executioners could watch what happened. The naked prisoners below would be looking up at the showers from which no water spouted, or perhaps at the floor wondering why there were no drains. It took some moments for the gas to have much effect, but soon the inmates became aware that it was issuing from the perforations in the vents. It was then that they usually panicked, crowding away from the pipes and finally stampeding toward the huge metal door where, as Reitlinger puts it, they piled up in one blue, clammy, blood-spattered pyramid, clawing and mauling each other even in death. Twenty or thirty minutes later, when the huge mass of naked flesh had ceased to writhe, pumps drew out the poisonous air, the large door was opened, and the men of the Zonderkommando took over. These were Jewish male inmates who were promised their lives and adequate food in return for performing the most ghastly job of all. They were inevitably and regularly dispatched in the gas chambers and replaced by new teams who continued to meet the same fate. The SS wanted no survivors to tell tales. Protected with gas masks and rubber boots and wielding hoses, they went to work. Reitlinger has described it. Their first task was to remove the blood and defecations before dragging the clawing dead apart with nooses and hooks, the prelude to the ghastly search for gold and the removal of teeth and hair which were regarded by the Germans as strategic materials. Then the journey by lift or rail wagon to the furnaces, the mill that ground the clinker to fine ash, and the truck that scattered the ashes in the stream of the Sola. There was testimony at the Nuremberg trials that the ashes were sometimes sold as fertilizer. One Danzig firm, according to a document offered by the Russian prosecution, constructed an electrically heated tank for making soap out of human fat. Its recipe called for twelve pounds of human fat, ten quarts of water, and eight ounces to a pound of caustic soda, all boiled for two or three hours and then cooled. 
There had been, the records show, some lively competition among German businessmen to procure orders for building these death and disposal contraptions and for furnishing the lethal blue crystals. The firm of I. A. Topfensons of Erfurt, manufacturers of heating equipment, won out in its bid for the crematoria at Auschwitz. The story of its business enterprise was revealed in a voluminous correspondence found in the records of the camp. A letter from the firm dated February 12, 1943, gives the tenor. To the Central Construction Office of the SS and Police, Auschwitz. Subject, Crematoria 2 and 3 for the camp. We acknowledge receipt of your order for five triple furnaces, including two electric elevators for raising the corpses and one emergency elevator. A practical installation for stoking coal was also ordered and one for transporting ashes. The correspondence of two other firms engaged in the crematorium business popped up at the Nuremberg trials. The disposal of the corpses at a number of Nazi camps had attracted commercial competition. One of the oldest German companies in the field offered its drawings for crematoria to be built at a large SS camp in Belgrade. For putting the bodies into the furnace, we suggest simply a metal fork moving on cylinders. Each furnace will have an oven measuring only 24 by 18 inches, as coffins will not be used. For transporting the corpses from the storage points to the furnaces, we suggest using light carts on wheels, and we enclose diagrams of these drawn to scale. Another firm, C. H. Corey, also sought the Belgrade business, emphasizing its great experience in this field since it had already constructed four furnaces for Dachau and five for Lublin, which, it said, had given full satisfaction in practice. Following our verbal discussion regarding the delivery of equipment of simple construction for the burning of bodies, we are submitting plans for our perfected cremation ovens which operate with coal and which have hitherto given full satisfaction. We suggest two crematoria furnaces for the building planned, but we advise you to make further inquiries to make sure that two ovens will be sufficient for your requirements. We guarantee the effectiveness of the cremation ovens as well as their durability, the use of the best material and our faultless workmanship. Awaiting your further word, we will be at your service. Heil Hitler C. H. Corey, G. M. B. H. In the end, even the strenuous efforts of German free enterprise, using the best material and providing faultless workmanship, proved inadequate for burning the corpses. The well-constructed crematoria fell far behind at a number of camps, but especially at Auschwitz in 1944, when as many as 6,000 bodies, Hearst put it at as many as 16,000, had to be burned daily. For instance, in 46 days during the summer of 1944, between 250,000 and 300,000 Hungarian Jews alone were done to death at this camp. Even the gas chambers fell behind, and resort was made to mass shootings in the Einsatzkommando style. The bodies were simply thrown into ditches and burned, many of them only partly, and an earth was bulldozed over them. The camp commanders complained toward the end that the crematoria had proved not only inadequate, but uneconomical. The Zyklon B crystals that killed the victims in the first place were furnished by two German firms which had acquired the patent from I.G. Farben. These were Tesch and Stabenau of Hamburg and Degesch of Dessau, the former supplying two tons of the cyanide crystals a month and the latter three quarters of a ton. The bills of lading for the deliveries showed up at Nuremberg. The directors of both concerns contended that they had sold their product merely for fumigation purposes and were unaware that lethal use had been made of it, but this defense did not hold up. Letters were found from Tesch and Stabenau, offering not only to supply the gas crystals, but also the ventilating and heating equipment for extermination chambers. Besides, the inimitable Hearst, who, once he started to confess, went the limit, testified that the directors of the Tesh Company could not have helped knowing how their product was being used, since they furnished enough to exterminate a couple of million people. A British military court was convinced of this at the trial of the two partners, Bruno Tesh and Karl Weinbacher, who were sentenced to death in 1946 and hanged. The director of the second firm, Dr. Gerhard Peters of Degesch of Dessau, got off more lightly. A German court sentenced him to five years' imprisonment. Before the post-war trials in Germany, it had been generally believed that the mass killings were exclusively the work of a relatively few fanatical SS leaders. But the records of the courts leave no doubt of the complicity of a number of German businessmen, not only the Krups and the directors of the IG Farben Chemical Trust, 
but smaller entrepreneurs who outwardly must have seemed to be the most prosaic and decent of men, pillars, like good businessmen everywhere, of their communities. How many hapless, innocent people, mostly Jews, but including a fairly large number of others, especially Russian prisoners of war, were slaughtered at the one camp of Auschwitz? The exact number will never be known. Hirsch himself in his affidavit gave an estimate of 2,500,000 victims executed and exterminated by gassing and burning, and at least another half million who succumbed to starvation and disease, making a total of about three million. Later at his own trial in Warsaw, he reduced the figure to 1,135,000. The Soviet government, which investigated the camp after it was overrun by the Red Army in January 1945, put the figure at 4 million. Reitlinger, on the basis of his own exhaustive study, doubts that the number gassed at Auschwitz was even as high as three-quarters of a million. He estimates that about 600,000 died in the gas chambers, to which he adds the unknown proportion of some 300,000 or more missing, who were shot or who died of starvation and disease. By any estimate, the figure is considerable. The bodies were burned, but the gold fillings in the teeth remained, and these were retrieved from the ashes if they had not already been yanked out by special squads working over the clammy piles of corpses. Sometimes they were pulled out before the victims were slain. A secret report of the German warden of the prison at Minsk disclosed that after he had commandeered the services of a Jewish dentist, all the Jews had their gold bridgework crowns and fillings pulled or broken out. This happens always one to two hours before the special action. The warden noted that of 516 German and Russian Jews executed at his prison during a six-week period in the spring of 1943, some 336 had the gold yanked from their teeth. The gold was melted down and shipped along with other valuables snatched from the condemned Jews to the Reichsbank, where, under a secret agreement between Himmler and the bank's president, Dr. Walter Funk, it was deposited to the credit of the SS in an account given the cover name of Max Heiliger. This prize booty from the extermination camps included, besides gold from dentures, gold watches, earrings, bracelets, rings, necklaces, and even spectacles frames, for the Jews had been encouraged to bring all their valuables with them for the promised resettlement. There were also great stocks of jewelry, especially diamonds and much silverware and there were great wads of banknotes. The Reichsbank, in fact, was overwhelmed by the Max Heiliger deposits. With its vaults filled to overflowing as early as 1942, the bank's profit-minded directors sought to turn the holdings into cold cash by disposing of them through the municipal pawn shops. One letter from the Reichsbank to the Berlin municipal pawn shop, dated September 15th, speaks of a second shipment, and begins... We submit to you the following valuables and the request for the best possible utilization. The list is long and itemized, and includes 154 gold watches, 1,601 gold earrings, 132 diamond rings, 784 silver pocket watches, and 160 diverse dentures, partly of gold. By the beginning of 1944, the Berlin pawn shop itself was overwhelmed by the flow of these stolen goods and informed the Reichsbank it could accept no more. When the Allies overran Germany, they discovered in some abandoned salt mines, where the Nazis had hidden part of their records and booty, enough left over from the Max Heiliger account to fill three huge vaults in the Frankfurt branch of the Reichsbank. Did the bankers know the sources of these unique deposits? The manager of the Precious Metals Department of the Reichsbank deposed at Nuremberg that he and his associates began to notice that many shipments came from Lublin and Auschwitz. We all knew that these places were the sites of concentration camps. It was in the tenth delivery in November 1943 that dental gold appeared. The quantity of dental gold became unusually great. At Nuremberg, the notorious Oswald Pohl, chief of the economic office of the SS, who handled the transactions for his organization, emphasized that Dr. Funk and the officials and directors of the Reichsbank knew very well the origins of the goods they were trying to pawn. He explained in some detail the business deal between Funk and the SS concerning the delivery of valuables of dead Jews to the Reichsbank. He remembered a conversation with the bank's vice president. 
Dr. Emil Pohl. In this conversation, no doubt remained that the objects to be delivered came from Jews who had been killed in concentration camps. The objects in question were rings, watches, eyeglasses, gold bars, wedding rings, brooches, pins, gold fillings, and other valuables. Once, Paul related, after an inspection tour through the vaults of the Reichsbank where the valuables from the dead Jews were inspected, Dr. Funk tendered the party a pleasant dinner in which the conversation turned around the unique origins of the booty. Dr. Funk was sentenced to life imprisonment at Nuremberg. 